Aaron slides the elevator door open with his free hand. Metal provides considerable resistance. The activators emit a screech as they are buckled by the pressure he exerts. He steps into darkness. Field function scans and infrared imaging reveal the short, empty corridor ahead. He walks along it with the zombie Wirtz marching beside him until they reach the large vault door of metabonded malmetal at the end. Both wall and door are guarded by a strong force field that is powered independently from within. His free hand strokes across the undefended corridor wall until his fingers are resting over the armoured conduit carrying part of the security net's cabling. He presses down. A small disruptor pulse disintegrates the concrete. Dust pours out, and he pushes his hand deeper into the hole. He has to excavate up to his elbow until he reaches the conduit. There is a brief clash of energy fields, and the conduit shatters, exposing the optical cables inside. The fingertips of his hand extrude slender filaments that penetrate the optical cables, immersing themselves in the blaze of coherent light flashing along the interior. His enrichments are interfaced directly into the smart core through an unprotected link. A torrent of destructive software is unleashed by his U-shadow, corroding the smart core's primary routines like acid on skin to hold him upright. On your knees. Wirtz sinks quickly to the shiny floor, presenting a smaller, more stable target. His filaments have penetrated the metal casing of the pedestal and begin to affiliate themselves with the fine mesh of optical strands beneath. A couple of energy dumpers skim toward Aaron. He shoots them with a simple ion shot from an enrichment in his forearm. His force field has to reformat momentarily to allow the ions through. It is a weakness that the guards exploit ruthlessly, concentrating their fire. He feels the kinetic projectiles lance into his shoulder and upper torso. Combat software reports five direct hits. Field scans reveal the nature of the foreign projectiles. Number one is a straight explosive, which is countered by a damping field, turning it to a lump of white hot metal. Two releases a pack of fire wire tangles, which expand through his flesh, ripping it apart at a cellular level, incinerating as they go, wrecking bionic organelles. They can be staved off only by a specific frequency disruptor field that attacks their molecular structure, that has a debilitating effect on the bionics still functional in the area. Three, dispenses a nerve agent in sufficient quantity to exterminate 500 humans. Bionics converge quickly to counteract the deadly toxin. Four is another explosive, neutralized along with one. Five is a cluster of micro-janglers, microbe-sized generators that jam his nervous system, inhibiting bionic and enrichment operations. A secondary function is to induce pain impulses, they require a scrambler field to kill them. Blood pumps out from the cratered flesh and torn suit to be flattened back beneath the reformatted force field. The surrounding fabric of his suit is saturated quickly. Bionics congregate around the edge of the wounds, acting in concert to knit the damage back together, sealing up veins, arteries and capillaries. Inside his body the firewire tangles halt their expansion as the disruptor sabotages their molecular cohesion. It is too slow. They are causing a massive amount of damage, damage that is amplified by the micro-janglers. Aaron flings his head back to scream in agony as the microscopic technology war is fought within his muscles and blood vessels, but still he keeps hold of both Wirtz and of the pedestal. His bionics shut off a whole series of nerves, eliminating the pain and all sensation in his shoulder and arm. A disconcertingly large section of the medical status display in his exovision is flashing red. Nausea plagues him, shivers run along his limbs. The field medic sac in his thigh pushes a dose of suppressants into his bloodstream. Another wave of kinetics pounds him. He is in danger of falling backward. His bionics and enrichments are reaching maximum capacity. Countermeasures drones do their best to confuse the enemy targeting sensors, but the narrow confines of the vault make such systems almost irrelevant. His filaments interface with the registry cube in the pedestal. Send authority certificate. The registry software acknowledges Wirtz's authority, and the U-Shadow runs a search for Inigo's secure store. It locates the memory cell. The physical coordinates are loaded into Aaron's combat routines, a volume of eight cubic centimetres 
to be held inviolate. The rest of the vault structure is now expendable. He lets go of the pedestal and veers. The woman slumps forward, a motion that jolts her unsecured brain. A fresh upwelling of blood bubbles out around the circle of cut bone. The protective swirl of niling sponges deactivates, their black horizons folding in on themselves. Aaron raises his head and smiles an animal snarl through the clear air at the guards. Their barrage has paused as they take stock. Pay back time he growls enthusiastically. The first disruptor pulse smashes out. Half the precious racks rupture in a maelstrom of molten plastic. Both guards stagger backward. Jelly gun shots hammer at their force fields. Energy dumpers zip about, launched by both sides. Black, niling horizons expand and contract like inverse novas. Kinetic projectiles chew into the vault's concrete and marble walls. More racks suffer shattering like antique glass. The plastic catches fire, molten rivulets streaking across the floor, spitting feeble flames from their leading edges. Aaron positions himself between the guards and Inigo's memory cell, shielding it from any possible damage. He manages to puncture the force field of one guard's leg and fires the jelly gun into the gap. The leg instantly transforms to a liquid pulp of ruined cells. The guard screams as he topples over. His force field reconfigures over the stump, allowing the blood and gore to splash across the ground, where it starts to steam softly. Energy dumpers attach themselves to him like predatory rodents. He thrashes about helplessly as his force field diminishes. Now it is just Aaron and the remaining guard. They advance on each other, each trusting in his own weapons enrichments. This is no longer a battle of software or even human wits. It is brute strength only that will prevail now. At the end, they resemble two atomic fireballs colliding. A shockwave of incandescent energy flares out from the impact, vaporizing everything it touches. One fireball is extinguished abruptly. Aaron stands over the clutter of charcoal that seconds before was his opponent. While still staring down, he extends his good arm sideways. An X-ray laser muzzle emerges from his forearm. Its beam slices through the head of the legless guard, curves up to annihilate the man's memory cell. Aaron lets out a long sigh, then winces at the dull pain throbbing deep in his shoulder. When he glances at it, the bloodstain has spread across most of his chest. The hole torn and burned through the suit fabric reveals nothing but a mangled patch of blackened skin seeping blood. His medical monitors report that the firewire tangles have burrowed deep. The damage is extensive. Sharp stabs of pain from his left leg make him gasp. His knee almost gives way. Bionics act in concert to trace and eliminate the micro-janglers that are cruising recklessly through his bloodstream. If they infiltrate his brain, he will be in serious trouble. The medical sac still is pumping drugs into him to counter shock. Blood loss will become a problem very soon unless he can reach a medical facility. However, he remains functional though he will have to undergo decontamination for the nerve agent. His bionics are not satisfied they have located all the toxin. The field scan function fine-tunes itself and scans again. Aaron walks over to the rack containing Inigo's memory cell. Niling sponges flutter through the air and return to his bandolier, snuggling back into their pouches. His feet crunch on a scree of fragments before squelching on blood and plastic magma. Then the memory cell is in his hand and the most difficult stage of the mission is over. Flames are taking hold across Wirtz's uniform as he walks out of the vault. She has not moved from her kneeling position. Aaron shoots her through the head with the X-ray laser, an act of mercy, in case her memory cell is still recording impulses. It is not like him, but he can afford to be magnanimous in the face of success. Three minutes later, Aaron made it out onto the roof of the administration block, he walked over to the edge, drawing breath in short gasps. The numb shoulder wound had started to cold burn, radiating out waves of dizziness that his medical enrichments could barely prevent from overwhelming him. A terrible burst of pain from his legs, stomach and spine drilled into him, blinding him as he convulsed. Unseen in his exovision displays, the Bionics reported progress in their quest to trace and eliminate the remaining elusive micro-janglers still contaminating his blood. 
Slowly, stiffly, he straightened up again, teetering close to a two-story fall. His U-shadow reconnected to the Unisphere as soon as he clambered out of the elevator shaft and reported that the remnant of the smart core was yelling for help on just about every link the clinic had with the Unisphere. Police tactical troops are responding, the U-shadow informed him. Clinic security officers are arming themselves. Perimeter is sealing. We'd better leave, then, Aaron said with bravado. He winced again at a shiver of phantom pain from his collarbone and called Corilin. Let's go. I'm at designated position 1A. Oh, she replied. Are you finished already? For a moment he thought she was joking. What? I didn't realize you'd be that quick. Anger swiftly turned him to ice. The schedule he had given her had been utterly clear-cut. Not even the unexpected guards and subsequent firefight had delayed him more than forty seconds. Where are you? His exovision was showing him a local map with the police cruisers closing on the clinic at Mark 8. Uh, I'm still in the reception area. You know, they have some really nice clothes here. And Ruth Stahl has actually been quite useful with styling. Who'd have thought it? I've already tried on a couple of these lovely wool. Get the fuck into the capsule right fucking now, he screamed. Tactical software assessed the situation, corresponding with his own instinct. The roof was far too exposed. Another involuntary shudder ran up his legs, and he went with it, tumbling over the edge, totally reliant on his combat software. The program formatted his force field to cushion his landing. Even so... The pain seemed to explode directly into his brain as he thudded into the ground. He rolled over and stumbled to his feet, far too slowly. The doors won't open, Corrie Lynn said. I can't get to the capsule. The alarm is going off. Wait, Ruth is telling me not to move. Aaron groaned as he staggered erratically across the band of lawns surrounding the administration block. Not that the trees would provide the slightest cover, not against the kinds of forces heading for him. Seeking darkness was a simple animal instinct. Take the bitch out, he told Corrie Lynn. What? Hit ha. Here's a combat program, he said as his U-shadow shunted the appropriate file at her. Go for a disabling blow. Don't hesitate. I can't do that. Hit ha and call the capsule over. It can smash through the doors for you. Aaron. Can't I just get the capsule to break in? I'm really not comfortable hitting someone without warning. Aaron reached the tree line. His legs gave way, sending him sprawling in the dirt and spiky vines. Pain that had nothing to do with the micro-janglers pulsed from his damaged shoulder. Help! He croaked. Oh, fuck it, Corrie Lynn. Get the capsule here. He started crawling. His exo-images were a blurred scintillation coursing around his constricting vision. Hey, she's grabbed me. Corey Lynn. Cow! I can't make it. He pushed against the damp, sandy soil with his good arm, trying to lever himself back onto his feet. Two police capsules flashed silently overhead. A second later, their hypersonic boom smashed him back down onto the ground, Tree branches splintered from the violence of the sound. Aaron whimpered as he rolled onto his back. Oh, Ozzy, there's blood everywhere. I think I've broken her nose. I didn't hit her hard, really. Get me, he whispered. He sent a single command thought to the nihiling sponges in his bandolier harness. The little spheres soared away into the night, arching away over the waving trees. Violet laser beams sliced through the air, as bright as lightning forks. He grinned weakly. Wrong, he told the unseen police capsules. The Niling sponges sucked down the energy that the capsules pumped into them. Theoretically, the Niling effect could absorb billions of kilowatt hours before reaching the saturation point. Aaron had programmed in a limit. When the police weapons pumped their internal levels to that limit, the absorption effect reversed. Five huge explosions blossomed high over the forest, sending out massive clashing pressure waves. The police capsules could not be damaged by the blast. Their force fields were far too strong for that. But the wave fronts sent them tumbling through the night sky, spinning and flailing out beyond the edge of the forest as the regrav drives fought to counter the force. 
down below. Trees tumbled before the bedlam, as if they were no stronger than paper, crashing into one another to create a domino effect, radiating out from the five blast centres. A blizzard of splinters and gravel snatched Aaron off the ground and sent him twirling five metres to bounce badly. Amazingly, he was still holding the memory cell as he found himself flat on his back, gazing up into a sky beset with an intricate webbing of lambent ion streamers. Cory Lynn, he called desperately. Above him, the pretty sky was dimming to infinite black. There were no stars. Yard used his farsight to examine the revolver in the man's white leather holster. It was remarkably similar to the one that had belonged to Genril's family. The rest of the militiamen were similarly armed. They certainly were not carrying anything like the fast-firing gun of the bandits. Ediard did not know if that was a good thing. If the city did possess such weapons, they probably would not be put out on show with a patrol like this. However, I don't remember you having so many G-wolves before, the captain said. We were in the Rulan province last year. A village was sacked by bandits. Farms suffered losses in raids. You can't be too careful. Damned savages, the captain spit. Probably just two tribes fighting over some whore. I don't know why you venture out there, Barkas. They're all bandits and ne'er-do-wells, if you ask me. Ediard slowly sat up very straight, keeping his gaze fixed on the captain. He strengthened the shield around him. Do nothing, Barkas shot at him in a long talk whisper. Ediard, Salrana hissed quietly. He could sense the rage in her thoughts, barely contained. All around him, the minds of his friends were radiating dismay and sympathy. But profitable, Barkas continued smoothly. We can buy very cheaply indeed out there. The captain laughed, unaware of the emotional storm gathering around him. For which my friends in the city will pay greatly, I suppose. That's the essence of trade, Barkas said. After all, we do travel at considerable risk. Well, good luck to you, Barkas, but I am responsible for the safety of Makathran, so I must request that you keep your beasts on a leash within the city walls. They won't be used to civilization. We don't want any unfortunate accidents. Of course. You might want to get them accustomed to the idea as soon as you reach the plain. I'll see to it. Good. And no trading with the denizens of the Sampalok district, eh? Absolutely not. The captain and his men turned around and rode off down the road, their pack of G-wolves chasing along behind them. Barkas saw the caravan start off again, then urged his G-horse back to Ediard and Salrana. "'I'm sorry you had to hear that,' he said. "'They're not all like that in the city, are they?' Salrana asked anxiously. "'Sweet lady, no. Officers in the militia are usually the younger sons of an old family, little idiots who know nothing of life.' Their birth provides them with a great deal of arrogance, but no money. The militia allows them the illusion of continuing status, while all they actually do is search for a wealthy wife. Thankfully, they can do no real harm patrolling out here. Ediard was almost shocked by the notion. If they need money, why don't they join a guild and develop their psychic talent or begin a new business? To his surprise, Barkas burst out laughing. Oh, Ediard! For all the distance you've travelled with us, you still have so much further to go. A nobleman's son earn a living. He laughed again before ordering his G-horse back to the next wagon. After Clipsham, Ediard wanted to take a horse and gallop across the Iguru until he reached Makathran. Surely it would take no more than a few hours. However, he managed to keep his impatience in check and dutifully plodded alongside the wagons, helping to soothe the G-wolves, which were unused to being leashed. It was warm down on the plain, a gentle constant wind blowing a sea-humid air that Ediard found strangely invigorating. Winter here was a lot shorter than he was used to in the Rulan province, Barkas explained, though those months could see some very sharp frosts and several snow blizzards. By contrast, summer in the city was very hot and lasted for more than five months, most of the grand families kept villas in the Donsori Mountains, where they spent the height of the hot season. The Iguru's farmland reflected the climate, with luxuriant growth covering every field. The road was lined with tall, slender palm trees cloaked in ribbons of cobalt moss 
and sprouting tufts of scarlet and emerald leaves right at the top. Crops were different from those Ediard was used to. There were few cereal fields here, but plenty of citrus groves and fruit plantations, with acre after acre of vines and fruiting bushes. Some cane fields were being burned black, sending black smoke plumes churning high into the clear sky. It was volcanic soil underfoot, which contributed as much to the healthy verdant hue of the vegetation as did the regular rain and sun-soaked sky. Armies of G-chimps bustled about over the land, tending to the plants, with supervisors riding among them on horses. The farmhouses were grand whitewashed buildings with red clay tile roofs, as big as the guild compounds back in Ashwell. Despite all the hours they spent rolling forward that morning, the panorama on both sides of the straight road remained unnervingly similar. Only the volcanic cones offered landmarks by which to measure progress. Ediard could see veins of silver streams running down their slopes, before vanishing into the dense skirts of dark jade trees. But there were no caldera crowns. They rose to simple rounded crests. On many of them, cottages had been built on narrow ledges, compact yet elaborate constructions that his friends explained were little more than pavilions in which the city's wealthy spent languid days enjoying the fabulous view. It was common to install a favoured mistress in one. Traffic began to increase as they neared Macathran. Terrestrial horses were now more common than G-horses, with their riders wearing expensive clothes. Wagons piled high with produce from the farms and estates of the plain lumbered toward the markets and merchant warehouses. Fancy carriages with curtained windows rattled past. Ediard was surprised to find them shielded from casual farsight by a mild variant of his own concealment ability. Their footmen radiated sullen anger, discouraging anyone from prying. The final approach to the city walls was home to an astonishing variety of trees. Ancient black and grey trunks sentried the road on either side, sending gnarled boughs overhead to form twined arches that were centuries old. At first, Ediard thought there had been some kind of earthquake recently. All the trees, no matter their age and size, leaned one way, their branches bowing in the same direction. Then it slowly dawned on him that the constant wind had shaped them, pushing their branches away from the shoreline. For the last quarter of a mile, the ground was simple, flat meadow, home to flocks of sheep. When they left the shelter of the trees... Ediard was awarded his first sight of the city since they had descended from the foothills. The crystal wall faced them, rising sheer out of the grass to a height of thirty yards. Although transparent, it had a gold hue, distorting the silhouettes of the buildings inside and making it impossible to gather a true impression of what lay within. It formed a perfect circle around the city, the same height all the way around except for the port on the eastern side, where it dipped down to allow the sea to wash against the quays. Quarencia's gentle tides had no visible effect on it. The stubborn crystal was as immune to erosion forces as it was to all other forms of assault. Neither bullets nor pickaxes could chip it. Glue did not stick to it. As a defensive barrier, it was nearly perfect. Its only known susceptibility was to telekinesis, which could wear down its strength gradually. That was how Ra had opened the city to his people. A powerful telekinetic, he systematically cut through the crystal, shaping three gateways. Legend said that each one took him two years to carve out. His followers fixed the huge detached segments to giant metal hinges, transforming them into tightly fitting gates. In the two millennia since, they had been shut only eight times. For the last seven hundred years they had remained open. The caravan passed through the north gate. It was seven yards wide at the base, arching up ten yards above Edyard's head, and the passageway into the city was three yards long. The gate was hinged back flat against the wall on the inside. He found it hard to believe that the huge thing could move. The hinges seemed wondrously primitive contraptions, all bulbous iron joints and girders studded with rivets. Yet they had not corroded, and the pivots were kept oiled. Directly inside, to the left of the road, was a broad swath of paddock land named the High Moat, which followed the wall's curve around to the upper tail district next to the port. As horses were prohibited from the main districts, 
Many families maintained stables there, simple wooden buildings that had been added to over the centuries. There were also stockades for cattle and traveller pens, even a couple of cheap markets. On the opposite side of the road, the similar crescent of low moat led around to the main gate. Running around the inner edge of the moats was the North Curve Canal, lined with the same whitish material from which the majority of the city had been fabricated, resembling icy marble, yet stronger than any metal humans could forge on Corentia. Ediard stared enchanted at the gondolas as they slid along the canal. He had seen boats before, thought by water had them in abundance, as did many other towns. Yet those were coarse workaday cousins compared with these elegant black craft. They had shallow keels with tall prows rising out of the water carved into elegant figures. The cushioned benches of the midsection were protected from the hot sun by white awnings, and the gondolier stood on a platform at the stern, manipulating a long punt pole with easy grace. Each gondola was home to at least a couple of G-cats. Ediard smiled happily at the traditional Genistar forms, which were swarming in and out of the salty water. Unlike the bloated creatures he had shaped back in Ashwell, these were streamlined aquatics with webbed feet and long, sinuous tails. The surface of the canal was alive with ripples, as they continually chased after nimble fill rats and chewed on strands of trilonweed to keep the canal clear. Oh, my great lady, Salrana gasped, gawping out at the city. We did the right thing, Ediard said with finality. Yes, we did. Now that he was inside the crystal wall, the true aura of the city was washing against him. He'd never sensed such vitality before, the kind of exhilarating emotional impact that could come only from so many people pursuing their hectic lives in close proximity. Individuality was impossible to distinguish, but the collective sensation was a powerhouse of animation. He felt uplifted simply by drinking in the sights and sounds. The caravan turned off the road. Barkas had a quick conversation with a city travel master who assigned them three pens on a high moat where they could set up to trade. The wagons rumbled along the narrow track to their final destination. Ediard and Salrana walked their G-horses over to Barkas's wagon. It was an act rich with association with that time back in Thorpe by Water when they had come to the caravan master for help. The old man's family had been setting up the awnings on either side of the ancient wagon. They had all been strangers back then, curious and suspicious. Now Ediard knew them all and counted them as friends, which made this so very difficult. Salrana's thoughts were subdued and morose as Barkas turned to face them. The old caravan master eyed the packs they were carrying. You're really going to stay here, then? Yes, sir. He hugged both of them. Salrana had to wipe tears from her eyes. Ediard was fighting to make sure the same thing did not happen to him. Have you got enough money? Yes, sir. We're fine. Ediard patted the pocket inside his trousers. Along the route he had sold enough G-spiders to pay for weeks in a lavishly appointed tavern, and he was dressed respectably again. If it doesn't work out, we'll be here for a week. You're welcome to come with us, both of you. You'll always have a home on the road with us. I will never forget your kindness. Ediard said. Nor I, Salrana added. Go on then, be off with you. Ediard could see in the old man's agitated thoughts that this was just as painful for him. He gripped Barkas's arm and squeezed it tightly before turning away. Salrana threw her hands around the caravan master's neck and kissed him gratefully. The road that had brought them into the city ended just short of the North Curve Canal. They walked beside the waterway for a little while until they found a bridge over it. It was made from a tough, ochre-coloured variety of the ubiquitous city material, a simple low arch to which wooden railings had been added on either side. There were so many people using it, bustling against him, that Ediard had to clutch his shoulder bag tightly. But there were no animals, he realised, not even G-chimps. The bridge took them into the Elongo district, which was made up of small box-like buildings two or three stories high, with vaulting Lierne roofs and walls that often leaned away from perpendicular. Windows followed no pattern, 
There were angled slits, crescents, teardrops, circles, ovals, but never squares. They all had panes of a thick transparent crystal that grew, shaped, and replenished itself in the same slow fashion as the structures themselves. Entrances were simple arched oblongs or ovals, cutting through ground floor walls. Humans had added the wooden doors, fixing hinges into the structure with nails hammered into place with telekinesis. Over the years, the pins would be ejected slowly by the city material as it repaired the puncture holes they had made, necessitating refixing every decade or so. The constant, sedate renewal of the city's fabric made the whole place look fresh, as if it had only just been completed. The gap between the buildings was narrow. Sometimes, beside a canted corner, there was barely a couple of feet left between walls, forcing Ediard to turn sideways to squeeze through. Other passages were broad pavements that allowed several people to walk side by side. They came across little squares and courtyards, all of which were provided with fountains of fresh water bubbling up through the top of a thick pillar. Does nobody work? Salrana asked in puzzlement after they had been thoroughly jostled for ten minutes while negotiating the narrow pavements. The whole city must be walking about. Ediard simply shrugged. The district was a confusing maze. It was also where he discovered that the city material was almost opaque to farsight. He could only sense the murkiest shapes on the other side of the walls, and he certainly could not perceive right through a building. He was not used to having his perception cut so short. It unnerved him slightly. Eventually he summoned his G-Eagle and sent it soaring above the roofs, mapping a way for them. He wanted to get to the Tosella district, where the Egg Shaper Guild had its blue tower. It was the district to the east of Ilongo, separated from it by the Hidden Canal. Despite it being so close, they took forty minutes to negotiate Ilongo before crossing the thin canal on a small wooden bridge. Tosella's buildings were on a much larger scale than the ones they had seen so far. They were long rectangular mansions with tall slit windows stacked on top of one another up to six stories high and topped with concentric ring domes that intersected like waves frozen in mid-swirl. The ground directly outside their walls was fenced off with high slender pillars, separating the public pavement from emblem mosaics of glittering primary colour flecks. The ground floors were arched cloisters, enclosing central quads, where prim gardens grew in long troughs, under the cool, tinted light shining through the roof skylights high above. For the first time in the city, he sensed the minds of Genistars. A ground floor in one of the mansions had been converted into stables for them. He even glimpsed apprentices and journeymen scurrying around the quads, their thoughts anxious and subdued as they tried to keep in their master's good graces. It brought a smile to his face, as he recalled some of Akim's more outrageous stories of an apprentice's life in Makathran. I know everyone asks this, Salrana said as they tarried beside one of the huge mansions, admiring the subtle rainbow shades refracting off its glittering snow-white frontage. But I wonder who built this place. I thought it was the First Lives. Isn't that what the lady said? It doesn't actually say that in any of her teachings. All she says is that the city was left by those who came before. They couldn't have been humans, then. What makes you say that? Oh, we can use it well enough. The concept of shelter is universal, I suppose. But nothing here is quite right for us. For a start, there were no gates until Ra arrived. So the builders sailed in and out via the sea. That certainly ties in with all the canals, she answered with a smile. No, he could not match her light humour. His gaze swept along the length of the mansion. The root of architecture was species-based, from the basic functionality to the aesthetic, and Makathran just did not fit human sensibilities. He felt out of place there. Humans never built this place. We just adapted to it. Aren't you the know-it-all? And we've only been here an hour. Sorry, he grinned. But it is intriguing, you have to admit that. They say Erie District is the really weird one. That's where the Pythia has her church, which is the only building ever formed for humans. 
The city granted it to the lady so her flock would be close to the towers when the Sky Lords finally return. Towers? Yes, that's where the Sky Lords alighted the last time they were here. The day they took Ra's spirit to its rest in Odin's sea. Oh, hey, wait. You mean humans designed the lady's church? She gave a mock sigh. See, if you'd ever bothered to turn up to church, you'd have known that. It's right there in the lady's scriptures. He gave the mansion another suspicious look. That's like shaping genistars, but with buildings. I wonder if the city builders brought the defaults to Corentia. If the Geography Guild turns you down, you could always apply to the History Guild. Cheeky. He took a swipe at her. Salrana danced away laughing and stuck her tongue out. Several passers-by gave her a curious look, unused to seeing a lady's novice behave in such a fashion. She pulled a contrite face and held her hands demurely behind her back, eyes and mind still sparkling with amusement. Come on, he said. The quicker we get to the Blue Tower, the quicker we get you locked up in the novice dormitory where you belong, out of harm's way and not causing any trouble. Remember our promise. I'm going to be Pythia, and you're going to be Mare. Yeah, he grinned. It might take a couple of years, but we'll do it. Her smile faded as her thoughts grew sober. Ediard, you won't forget me, will you? Hey, of course not. I mean it, Ediard. Promise. Promise we'll still talk each day, even if it's just a long talk, hello. He held up a hand, palm toward her. I swear on the lady that I won't forget you. Such a thing is just not possible. Thank you. Her impish smile returned. Do you want to kiss me again before we both get locked up in separate dormitories each night? He groaned in dismay. Maybe I should just leave with the caravan. It was Salrana's turn to take a swipe at him. The Blue Tower was in the middle of the Tosella district, standing at least twice the height of the biggest mansion they had seen so far. For its walls, the city material had shaded down to a dark azure that seemed to soak up the sunlight, as if the façade possessed its own nimbus of shadow. Standing at the base between flying buttresses that resembled ancient tree roots, Ediard felt intimidated by the heartland of his guild. Surely such a structure never had been intended to house a profession that existed to lighten the load of people's lives. It was more like a fortress in which bandits would dwell. Are you sure you want to do this? Salwana asked uncertainly. She was just as daunted by the overpowering structure as he was. Uh, yes, I'm sure. He wished the vacillation in his thoughts wasn't quite so blatant. They walked in through a wide door, whose resemblance to a giant mouth was uncomfortably obvious. Inside, the walls and floor changed to the darkest red, with a surface sheen to match polished wood. Strong beams of sunlight from the high lancet windows cut through the gloom of the broad entrance hall. Ediard did not know where to go. There did not seem to be any kind of official to direct visitors to the appropriate room. His determination was fading fast leaving him stalled in the middle of the wide-open space. I somehow don't think this is where the apprentices have their dormitories, Salrana said from the side of her mouth. There were several groups of men in the hall, all talking quietly together. They wore fine clothes under flowing fur-lined gowns, with the egg in a twisted circle crest of the guild embroidered in gold thread on the collars. Disapproving glances were cast at Salrana and Ediard, followed by a surprising number of people focusing their farsight on the youthful pair. Ediard's farsight alerted him to three guards armed with revolvers marching across the entrance hall. They wore light, dross-silk jackets over their immaculate white cotton tunics. The guild crest was prominent on their helmets. The sergeant glowered at Ediard, but was marginally less hostile to Salrana when he saw she was in her full novice dress. You too, he grunted. What's your business here? So much for the warm welcome to a fellow guild member from far away, Ediard thought dourly. Then he realized he was not at all intimidated by the guard. After bandits, the sergeant and his little squad seemed faintly ludicrous. I am a journeyman of the guild, Ediard said, surprising himself by how level and authoritative his voice was. I've come from Rulan province to complete my training. 
The sergeant looked as if he had bitten into a rotten fruit. You're very young to be calling yourself a journeyman. Where's your badge? It's been a long journey, Ediard said, suddenly not wanting to explain what had happened to his village to someone who would never understand life beyond the city. I lost it. I see. And your letter? Letter. The sergeant spoke slowly, contempt colouring his thoughts. Your letter of introduction to the guild from your master. I have none. Are you trying to take the piss, sonny? Your pardon, miss, he said grudgingly to Salrana. Leave now before we take you to the courts of justice for trespass and theft. I have committed no theft, Ediard protested loudly. My master was Akim. He died before writing a letter of introduction. The only reason to trespass here is to thieve something from us, you little country shit, the sergeant snapped. Now you've gone fucked me off, and that's not good for you. He reached for Ediard, then blinked in surprise, as his hand slithered off an extremely strong telekinetic shield. Oh, you asked for this. His third hand tried to grab. Ediard warded him off easily, then hoisted the guard off the ground. The man yelled in shock as his feet kicked out. Take the little shit down, he cried at his men. Their third hands closed around Ediard to no avail. They went for their pistols, finding their arms moving slowly through impossibly thick air. Ediard! Salrana squeaked. Ediard could not quite comprehend how things had turned so crazy so fast. Enough! a baritone voice commanded. Ediard's far sight showed him an old man walking across the hall toward them. Long robes flowed behind him as he strode forward. He wore ochre trousers, cut high, so that his curving belly did not overhang, and a baggy shirt to continue the discreet disguise. But his weight was obvious, from the pudgy fingers to the rolling neck and heavy jowls. Yet he carried himself with the vitality of a man half his age. Even without sensing his regimented thoughts, he was obviously a man of considerable authority. "'Put him down,' he ordered Ediard. "'Yes, sir,' Ediard said meekly. He knew this was a master equal to Akim. I apologize. I was left little ch Be quiet. The man turned to the sergeant, who was straightening his clothes, not making eye contact with anyone. And you, sergeant, need to keep your temper in check. I am not prepared to have the blue tower guarded by petty-minded paranoia. You will learn a more rational attitude, or you'll see your days out guarding a guild estate on the other side of the Donsori Mountains. Do I make myself clear? Sir, away with you while I determine how big a threat this boy presents. The sergeant led his men away, but not before managing a last look at Ediard that promised dire vengeance. Your name, boy? Ediard, sir. And I am Topar, a master of the Guild Council, and deputy to Grand Master Finiton. That should give you an idea of how deep you just dipped yourself in default crap. My lady's novice, may I inquire your name? Salrana. I see. And I judge that both of you have only recently arrived in Macathran. Correct. Yes, sir, Ediard said. I'm really sorry about... Topar waved an irritated hand. I should be annoyed, but the name Akim hasn't been heard in our august tower for a considerable time. I am intrigued. Did I hear you say he is dead? Yes, sir. I'm afraid he is. For a moment the gasto vanished from Topar's stance. A shame. Yes, a very great shame. Did you know him, sir? Not I, no. But I will take you to someone who did. He will want the details, I'm sure. Follow me. He led them to an archway at the rear of the hall and began to climb the broad stairs beyond. As he ascended, living in a body they could never comprehend fully. Quite a sight, isn't it? Grandmaster Finiton said gently. In many respects, he was the physical opposite of Topar, slim and tall with thick hair down to his shoulder that was just beginning to grey. Yet his age was evident in the lines creasing his face. Despite that, his thoughts were tranquil. He was curious and affable rather than dismissive. Ediard shifted his gaze back to the Grand Master. Yes, sir. Ah, uh, 
I apologize again for what happened downstairs. The Grand Master raised a finger to his lips, and Ediard fell silent. No more of that, Finneton said. You've traveled a long way, yes? From Rulan province, sir. Finneton and Topar exchanged a glance, smiling at some private joke. A long way, Finneton said sagely. Some tea. His mind sent out a fast, long-talk instruction. Ediard turned to see a door open at the base of one of the bookshelf walls. It was too small for a man, barely four feet high. G-chimps scampered out, bringing a pair of chairs and a tray. The chairs were positioned in front of the Grand Master's desk, while the tray with its silver tea service was placed on the desk beside a cradle that held a Genistar egg. "'Sit down, my boy,' Finneton said. "'Now I understand you claim our colleague Akim is dead.' When did this happen? Almost a year ago, sir. Those are some very dark thoughts in your mind, accompanying that memory. Please tell me the story in its entirety. I believe I'm old enough to endure the full truth. Embarrassed that his mind was so transparent, Ediard took a deep breath and began. Both the Grand Master and Topal were silent when he finished. Eventually, Finneton rested his chin on steepled forefingers. Ah... My poor dear Akim, for his life to end like that is an unforgivable tragedy. An entire village slaughtered by bandits. I find that extraordinary. It happened, Ediard said with a flash of anger. I'm not questioning your tale, my boy. I find the whole concept deeply disturbing, that there is some kind of society out in the wilds different from our own, and one which is so implacably hostile. They're animals, Ediard growled. No, that's your instinctive reaction, and a healthy one it is too. But to organize such a raid is quite an accomplishment. He sat back and drank some tea. Could there really be a rival civilization somewhere out there beyond our maps? They have concealment techniques and fanciful weapons. I'd always believed such things were the province of this city alone. You have the repeat fire guns, Ediard asked. In all his travels... No one had ever heard of such a thing. A year of constant dismissal had made him doubt his memories of that terrible night. Finneton and Topar exchanged another glance. No, and that is more worrying than knowing how to conceal yourself. But how lovely that Akim knew the technique which is supposed to be practiced only by guildmasters. He was a master, sir. Of course. I mean those of us who sit on the council. Sadly... Akim never achieved that. It was politics, of course. I'm afraid to say, young Ediard, that you are going to learn life here in the city is all about politics. Yes, sir. Did you know Akim, sir? Finneton smiled. Have you not worked it out yet, my boy? Dear me, I thought you were quicker. We share a bond, you and I. For he was my master when I was a lowly young apprentice here. Oh, which means you present me with a very unpleasant problem. I do, Ediard said anxiously. You have no formal letter of confirmation from your master. Worse than that, with your village gone, we cannot ever confirm that you were taken in by the guild. Ediard smiled uncertainly, but I know how to sculpt an egg. His farsight swept through the egg on the Grand Master's desk, revealing the folded shadows of the embryo inside. You have sculpted a G-dog. I don't recognize some of the traits. You're outside the traditional form, but it is a dog. Two days from hatching, I'd guess. Topar nodded in appreciation. Impressive. Akeem was the best master, Ediard said hotly. Finneton's sigh was heavier than before. You have obviously received guild training, and you clearly have skills as well as strength. And that is the problem. I don't understand, sir. You say Akim made you a journeyman. Yes, sir. I cannot accept you into the guild at that level. I know this seems intolerably harsh, Ediard, but there are formalities which even I have to follow. Ediard was aware that his cheeks were burning. It was not quite anger, but all he could think of was the pettiness of the guildmaster back in Thorpe by Water. Surely the Grand Master the leader of the whole egg-shaper guild, could not be so small-minded. 
What he said was law to the guild. I see. I doubt it, but I do sympathize with the exasperation you must feel. I will be delighted to accept you into the guild here in Macathran, Ediard, but it must be as a junior apprentice. I cannot make exceptions, especially not in your case. What do you mean? To acknowledge your journeyman status without a formal letter from your master will lay me open to a charge of favoritism from others on the guild council. Politics, Topar said. I understand, Ediard whispered. He was frightened that he was going to burst into tears in front of them. To get to Macathran, to be in the presence of the Grand Master, and then to be told that all he had achieved was worthless because he lacked a piece of paper. Pardon me, but that's stupid, sir, he said sullenly. It's much worse than that, but I appreciate your politeness, my boy. Edyard sniffed and wiped his nose. How long would it take me to get back to being a journeyman? Here at the Blue Tower, and assuming you have the appropriate talent, seven years. Appointing you a journeyman at your age was ambitious, even for Akim, but at the same time so very typical of him. Seven years, Edyard repeated numbly. Seven years of repeating every lesson and knowledge gift he'd ever undergone. Seven years of having to hold himself back. Seven years of obedience to journeymen less able than himself. Seven years. I know what you're thinking, and I'm not even using farsight, Finneton said gently. It is a terrible thing to ask you to undergo. I'm not sure I can, Edyard said. I thought when I came here that I wanted nothing more than to be a part of the guild, but now these formalities. Akim always said I would find them difficult. I thought he was teasing. Listen to me, Edyard. Finneton said, for I am about to say something which borders on the sacrilegious. Sir, the hierarchy we have in the guilds, not just ours but all guilds, exists for those who seek to further themselves within our political system. Talent in your chosen field plays a part, but always it is a matter of money and politics. This is the way things are here in the capital. If you were not born into a grand family and have ambition, then you join a guild and fight your way to the top. Now consider that very carefully, because this is a choice that will decide the rest of your life for you. Is the egg shape a guild what you truly want? It's what I wanted, and I have achieved my goal. I am Grand Master, but look at the battles I have to fight on every level. I am surrounded with so many people seeking the same thing, seeking this seat in this office, that I cannot make an exception for someone as gifted as yourself, because a hundred years ago I had a master who went on to teach you. Is that sanity, Ediard? Is that the life you want for yourself? To have a dozen such considerations every day, to be unable to put a foot wrong, to continue a tradition no matter how dry and worthless it is, because that is what supports you. To be unable to change, even though change was the one thing above all that used to drive you? That is what I am, Edyard. That is what Topar is. I despair of myself at times, of how helpless I have become, entrapped in the very system I once wanted to alter and improve. But, sir, if you don't make changes, who can? Nobody can, Edyard. Not now. Not in these times. Our society is mature. Change is instability. That is why every institution we have resists change. To maintain the status quo is our sole objective in life. That's wrong. Yes, it is. But what do you want to do about it? Do you want to spend seven years working your ass off to become a journeyman? To make that first real step toward receiving master status? At which point your talent is irrelevant and the politicking begins in earnest? You build allies and make enemies on every council on which you sit in order to gain greater power and control. But it is only power and control over the councils. Ultimately, it amounts to very little. Are you saying I should go back and join the caravan? No. My offer to admit you to the guild is genuine and remains open while I am Grand Master. Who knows? Maybe you will make a difference if you make it to this office. I should tell you now that nobody under a hundred years old has ever sat here. I don't know, 
Ediard said helplessly. There is one alternative. You already know how to sculpt eggs. By joining the Guild you would be acknowledging that your life is now oriented to a political goal. However, the city constables are always seeking recruits. It is a noble profession. My position on the Upper Council allows me to sponsor you into their ranks. They would delight in accepting someone with such a strong third hand. And this city desperately needs men of good stature to enforce the law. Without that, we will all become nothing. A constable. He was not even sure what a constable was. Even a city as sophisticated as Macathran has crime, Ediard. Decent people, especially those in the poorer districts, live in fear of gangs that roam the streets at night. Merchants suffer thefts and increase their prices accordingly, which injures everyone. You would be helping people directly and immediately. Unlike the other guilds, constable apprentices are not tucked away out of sight toiling to make their master's life easy. The hierarchy of the constables is a lot less complex than that of any normal guild. The prospect for advancement is good. You're smart and strong. I will not delude you that it is an easy life, for it is not. But you've even been in a real life or death fight, which is more than any other recruit has done. You should do well. I'm not sure. Of course not. I didn't expect you to give me an answer immediately. You need time to think about your future. What you decide now determines the rest of your life. Why don't you escort your friend to her church? Then take a good look around. Get a feel for the city before you make up your mind. If you want to give the constables a try, long talk topa here, and we will arrange for your admission. Thank you, sir. You are welcome. And Ediard, sir, I am glad Akim had such a gifted pupil at the end. It wouldn't have been easy for him in Ashwell. You must have helped enrich his life considerably. Thank you. Ediard rose from the seat, knowing his time was up. Sir, why did Akim leave the Blue Tower? Finiton smiled fondly. He was like you, my boy. He wanted to make a difference, to help people. Here he could do very little. Outside our crystal wall, in Ashwell, I suspect he had a profound effect on the lives of the villagers. Yes, sir. He did. What happened in there? Salrana demanded when Ediard reappeared in the anteroom. You don't seem very happy. I'm not, he admitted, and picked up his shoulder bag. Come on. We need to get you to the church before nightfall. I'll tell you what happened on the way. This is the end of the CD. The program continues on the next CD. You can't give up, Salrana said as they crossed a bridge over Grove Canal into the Erie District, her voice pleading, Not after so much. Finiton was right, though. What's the point? I can already shape eggs as well as just about anyone. If I join the Guild, I'll be doing it to climb up the hierarchy, nothing else. And what's there, even if I do become Grand Master? Sitting at the top of a tower, organising the guild, while everyone else on the council waits for me to make a mistake? I'd have a million enemies and no friends, and nothing will change. I won't be helping anyone. Remember Ashwell, what it was like before people accepted that the Genistars could improve their life. Well, Makathran is a thousand years along from that. You can't shape better Genistars. You can't increase the amount in use here. Then when you become Grand Master, you must push Genistars out on people next to the Wildlands. The Egg Shaper Guild can still make a difference to everyone beyond the Iguru Plain. You've seen what life's like in the distant provinces. Make it better for the Mediard. Make their life as easy as it is for everyone here. It's too much, he said. I can't do it, Salrana. Most of all, I can't stand seven years as an apprentice again. I just can't. I've learned the guild teachings. I've been on the road fending for myself for a year. Any position less than journeyman would be a huge step backward for me. I'm sorry. He could see Akim shaking his head in that weary way of his. The guilt was terrible. She stroked his cheek, which brought astonished glances from passers-by. I'm not going to give up on you, and I'm certainly not going to let you give up on your own dream. 
Not after what we've been through. I don't know what I'd do without you. You're welcome, she said spryly. He glanced up at the strangely twisted spires that jutted out of the ground like gigantic stalagmites. Even the smallest was higher than the blue tower. There were no windows or balconies, just a single entrance at ground level, leading to a central spiral stair. Right at the tip, they flared out into broad platforms that looked terribly unstable, as if they would snap off at any second. After the madcap bustle of the other districts they had experienced, Erie was almost deserted by comparison. With night falling, the devout were making their way to the central church of the Empyrean Lady for the evening service of prayer and thanksgiving. Light was beginning to shine out of crevices in the crinkled towers around them, washing the hard ground in a pale tangerine illumination. Ediard regarded it curiously, realizing it was the same glow that had lit his way up the stair of the blue tower. Somehow the city material emitted it without heat. Where will you go tonight? she asked. I don't know. Find a cheap tavern with a room, I suppose. Oh, Ediard, you'll be so lonely there. Why don't you go back to the caravan? Anyone there will be happy to lend you a cot? No, he said firmly. I won't go back. She pressed her teeth together in dismay. Your pride will be the end of you. He smiled. Probably. The Lady Central Church was impressive. A large cloud-white dome with the top third made of the same crystal as the city wall. Three wings radiated out from the middle, lined with balconies. I'm here, Salrana said in wonder. Tears glinted in her eyes, and her mind shone with happiness. The lady herself lived the last years of her life here. Can you feel how sacrosanct this ground is? It's all real, Ediard. The lady's message to the world is real. I know, he said. The main door to the church was wide open, shining a broad fan of rose gold light across the broad plaza outside. Several mothers dressed in splendid white and silver robes stood on the threshold to give a personal welcome to their congregation. Salrana straightened her shoulders and walked up to the first. There followed a long conversation on which Ediard did his best not to eavesdrop. It culminated with the mother embracing Salrana. Another two mothers hurried over at her long talk call. They all began chattering excitedly around the suddenly overwhelmed girl. Salrana turned holding an arm out to Ediard. They'll take me in, she said, her face suffused with delight. That's good, he said softly. Come, child, said the first mother, and put her arm protectively around Salrana. Young man? Yes, mother. We commend you for aiding our lost soul. May the lady bless you for what you have done. He did not know what to say, so he just ducked his head gracelessly. Will you stay for the service? I, um, have to get to my lodgings. Thank you. He backed away and turned, walking quickly across the plaza. Don't forget, Salrana's long talk voice chided him. Talk to me first thing tomorrow. I want to know that you're all right. I will. Even with the cold orange light shining down from the twisted towers, he was unnerved walking through the empty district. The dark upper sections of the towers formed black silhouettes against the glowing night sky. His mind kept firmly focused on the warm aura of human minds on the other side of the Grove Canal. Before he reached any bridge, he came to a decision. His far sight strained to reach the Blue Tower. The sparks of minds were very hard to distinguish through its walls, but he persevered and eventually found one he recognized. Excuse me, sir, he long talked to Topa. There was a small burst of surprise from the man, quickly smothered. Where are you, Ediard? In Erie, sir. And you far-sighted me through the walls of the Blue Tower from there? Uh, yes, sir. Of course you did. So what can I do for you? I know this probably seems sudden to you, sir, but I have thought over what the Grand Master said to me. I'd like to join the constables. There's nothing else for me here. Yes, we did make that promise to you, didn't we? Very well. Report to the main constable station in the Jeevens district. By the time you get there, they will be expecting you. Your letter of sponsorship will be with the captain in the morning. Yes, sir. Please thank the Grand Master for me, sir. I'll not let him down. 
Somehow, Ediard, I don't think you will. One word of advice from a lifelong citizen of Macathran. Sir, don't let your fellow constables realise how strong you are. Not at first. It may attract the wrong kind of interest. Politics, remember? I remember, sir. Get up, you little turds! Ediard groaned, immensely tired, blinking against the orange light flooding into the dormitory. His thoughts were ex was interested in the results. Cansin had a farsight almost as good as his own, while Dinlay probably could long shout halfway across the Yeguru Plain, a capability of which he was inordinately proud. Maxen's shield seemed disproportionately stronger than his third hand. Nothing Che threw at him got through. Boyd was all around unexceptional. It left Eddie out wondering if he was above average or if his squadmates were distinctly below average. Sergeant Che's psychic ability was certainly powerful enough. Che told them to get some breakfast, then report for uniform fitting. If any of you have money, I'd advise you to spend it on your tunic. Those without money will have the cost taken out of their pay for the next six months, and I assure you it won't leave you with much at the end of the week. They trooped along to the station's main hall, a long chamber with an arching ceiling and a big crystal window at the far end. Some of the benches already were occupied. A sergeant told them the bench at the far end would be theirs for the duration of their probationary period. The rest of the constables ignored them. G-monkeys hurried out of the kitchen, bringing crockery. They were adept at receiving orders, Ediard found, when he instructed one to bring tea and scrambled eggs. At least the station provided their food. He wondered if he should try to long-talk Salrana. The sun was just starting to rise outside. I've never seen anyone lift so much, Boyd said. You've got a lot of talent, Edyard. Edyard shrugged. I claim fuss rates to stand behind him when the shit starts flying, Maxon said. And the bullets. You all look like you can handle yourselves if we get pushed into a corner, Edyard said. Don't have a lot of choice, do we? Maxon said. Not enough skill for a guild and not rich enough to buy into the militia. So here we are all of us clinging to the ass-end of life, and we're only just starting out. One big, long fall into the sewage from here on in, my fellow failures. Ignore him, Dinlay said. He's just bitter at the way he got treated by his father's family. Not as bitter as they'll be when I'm through with them, Maxon said with unexpected heat. Plans for revenge? Cansine asked. Don't have to plan. Those arrogant tuds break the law a dozen times a week. One day I'll have the clout to have the whole lot of the bastards locked up and ruined. Now that's what I like to see. Ambition. How come you didn't join a guild, Ed yet? Maxin asked. You have more psychic talent than the rest of us put together. I don't want to be ordered around for the next seven years, he told them simply. Lady bless that, Dinley said. We just have to grit our teeth for six months and we've made it. That's a curious definition of making it. Cansine said in a dismissive voice, as a G-monkey brought her a tray with a bowl of porridge and a tall glass of milk. Being allowed out onto the streets by ourselves, to be shoved around by gangs and get beaten up by trying to stop tavern fights. Then why are you here? Maxon asked. She took a long drink of milk. Do you see me being a proper little wife to some oaf of a tradesman? Not all tradesmen are oafs, Boyd said defensively. Maxen ignored him. Good for ye, he told Cansine. Her head turned ponderously to stare at him. Not interested. Thanks. Ediard grinned while Dinley and Boyd both laughed. Me neither, Maxen insisted, but he had lost the moment and sounded very insincere. So is Che right about buying the uniform? Ediard asked. He was conscious that he probably had more coinage in his pocket than the others, Depends, Dinley said. If you're definitely going to be a constable, then it doesn't matter how you pay. But if you're uncertain, then you're best off having them take it from your wages. That way, when you leave after a couple of weeks, you hand the uniform back and you haven't lost any of your own money. Or face facts, Maxon said. If we're here, it's not because we're uncertain. We're plain desperate. Speak for yourself, Dinley said. This is my family profession. Then I apologise. I don't have the luxury of alternatives. You could have joined the gangs, Cansine said lightly. 
It probably pays better. Maxen showed her a fast hand gesture. How bad are they? Ediard asked. The gangs, I mean. I'd never heard of them before I reached town. Lady, you really are from the countryside, aren't you? Maxen said. When did you get here? Yesterday. Yesterday? He said it in a voice so loud that several constables glanced curiously over at the table. Yesterday, Ediard said firmly. Okay, well, too late now. The gangs are big in some districts and not in others. The majority are based in Sampaloc. If you're rich, they're not much of a problem. If you're poor, then it's more difficult for you. They specialise in protection. Think of them as an alternative tax system to the Grand Council. But with violence, Dinley said, they're murderous scum and they should be wiped out. After first being fairly found guilty in court, Maxon said with a smile, there's a real problem and getting worse, Boyd said. My brother is having to pay them to leave the bakery alone, and he's only ten minutes away from this station, which puts him about as far from Sampaloc as you can be. It used to be safe there. My father never used to have such trouble. Why doesn't he report them to the constables? Ediard said. Maxen gave a disrespectful snort. Take a look around you, Ediard. Would you ask us to protect you from an organised gang that thinks it's funny to throw your children or your mother into the canal with a rock tied to them? Are you going to stand outside a baker's shop for 24 hours a day for 10 years just to save them? Do you think Che would let you? And if he did, what about everyone else in the district? No, they're a fact of life in Macathran now. The best the constables do is maintain an uneasy truce and stop us from falling into complete anarchy. So young, so cynical, Cansin said. Ignore the Mediard. It's nothing like as bad as they say. I hope not, he said in a subdued voice. Maybe he was still suffering from the shock of city life, but he had an uncomfortable feeling that Grand Master Finiton had not been entirely honest with him about life in Macathran. Chapter 5 Investigator Second Level Halron stood in the vault's open... Harlan had encountered enough hires in his time to recognize their slightly smug self-belief. She was on a level far above them, with a composure that rated glacial. Her face was enchanting, a combination of pre-Commonwealth Earth's Filipino and European features, framed by thick raven hair brushed straight and devoid of any modern cosmetics, a beauty he could only describe as old-fashioned. That was fair enough, given the fact that she had not changed her appearance once in the last fourteen hundred years. The whole forensic team had fallen into awed silence, staring at the woman. Harlan stepped forward, hoping he was concealing his nerves. She wore a conservative, cream-coloured toga suit over a figure that was as ideal as any created by St. Mary's specialists. When he attempted to scan her, using the most subtle probes his enrichments could produce, they were deflected perfectly. It was as if nothing were there. The only empirical proof he had that she existed was his own eyesight. Ma'am, I'm Investigator Harlan, in charge of this case. I, er, uh, that is, we, are very flattered you're here. Thank you, said Paula Mayo. Can I ask what your interest is? It's not my interest. I am only ANA Governance's representative. In this universe... Darvel whispered to Angelo. Paula gave him a sweet smile. The old jokes are always the best ones, and they don't come much older. Darval's expression turned sickly. OK, Halron said. So what's ANA Governance's interest? Mr. Telfer. Is he higher? What do you think? His weapons bionics are the most sophisticated we've ever seen on Anagaska. The vault guards were hired purely on the basis of their enrichments, and he took them both out in less than a minute. So if he's not higher, he has access to the best the central worlds have to offer. Very good, Paula complimented him. So, he's probably working for one of your factions. Excellent rationale, investigator. That's exactly why I'm here, to see if that particular conclusion is correct. Now, I'd like first access to all your forensic results, please. Ah. Uh, I'll see you get copies, of course. Your planetary government has granted ANA governance full cooperation on this case. 
I'm sure you appreciate the politics involved. Please feel free to check with your commissioner and even the city's mayor. But that's not copies. I require first and unrestricted access to the raw data. Thank you. Harlan knew when he had lost a battle. Yes, ma'am. First access. I'll set that up right away. Thank you. Now who's analysing the registry? That's me, Darvel said awkwardly. Who do you think Telfer was after? Darvel glanced at Halron, who gave a tiny nod. Easy, actually. One of the secure stores belonged to Winnico. Ah, Paula smiled. She closed her eyes and drew a long breath through her nose. When was the last update? The year 3320. The year he left on his Centurion Station mission, she said. And he didn't return to Anagaska until 3415, correct? Yes, Halron said. Living Dream Central Fane on Anagaska was built in Kumo. He was here to dedicate it. Interesting, Paula mused. You think someone's going to full clone him? Why else would you steal his mind? Paula said. Thank you for your cooperation, investigator. And I'd still like those results as they come in. She turned and started to walk out of the vault. That's it, Halron asked. Paula halted, tipping her head to fix the investigator with a level stare. Unless you have something else to add. What about Telfa? Good luck hunting him down. Are you going to help us? I won't put any obstacles in your way, political or otherwise. She left the vault, leaving Harlan staring at his team in confusion and indignation. Paula walked out of the administration block and glanced at the forest. The air blasts had produced superficial damage. Most of the clinic's buildings were still intact, and while the larger trees had been toppled, there were still enough younger ones to maintain the forest once the dead trunks had been cleared away. A police cordon extended for several hundred yards, with uniformed officers reinforcing the patrol bots. Members of the clinic ground staff were working with contractors and forestry bots to clear the worst of the damage. Little curls of smoke were drifting upward from the blackened ground, where fires had burned for a couple of hours during the night, before being extinguished. She did not pause as her field effect scanned the area, but two of the contractor crew were red-tagged by her U-shadow. Both of them were shielded, utilising sophisticated deflection techniques available only to high-grade bionics. Hers, of course, were even more advanced. They were keeping their distance from the cordon, but her eyes managed to zoom in and snatch a facial image. Her U-shadow produced a cross-reference for both of them in less than a second. Once upon a time, about a thousand years earlier, Paula would have confronted them there and then. These days she liked to think she had mellowed somewhat, although in truth it was more advantageous to let them think she had not spotted them. Paula had been born on Huxley's Haven, a unique world funded by the Human Structure Foundation, which genetically modified all citizens so that they would fit into a simple social structure framed within a low-technology civilization. To the horror and dismay of the rest of the Commonwealth, what they condemned as genetic slavery actually worked, producing a population that was mostly happy with their predetermined lot. The few malcontents were kept in order by police officers who received specific psychoneural profiling. Among other traits was a variant on obsessive-compulsive disorder to ensure that they never gave up the chase. The Foundation had created Paula to be one of them, but she had been stolen from a birthing ward by a group of radical liberals intent on liberating the poor slaves. She had grown up in the Commonwealth at large, first becoming an investigator in the Serious Crimes Directorate, and then, for the last 700 years, acting as an agent for ANA governance. Huxley's Haven still existed, its society chugging quietly along on its ordained course without changing or evolving. The Greater Commonwealth had very little contact with it these days. Paula herself had not been back for over 300 years, and that, essentially, had been nostalgia tourism. There was no need to keep an eye on it. ANA governance was very protective of non-higher cultures. It was a policy that, ironically, gave Paula very little opportunity to return. Her designated task of preventing the ANA factions from pursuing their illegal interference among the external worlds kept her incredibly busy. Her U-shadow established an ultra-secure link to Justine Benelli. 
I'm at the Anagaska Clinic, she said. And? We were right. The raid was organized by a faction. Any clues which one? Well, Marius and the delivery man are hanging around outside, which implies they are as interested as we are. Ergo, they didn't do it. Don't be so sure. I've never known the accelerators and the conservatives to be so blatant before. More likely, one of them did it and the other is trying to expose or counter him. You know what they're like. Whose memory cell were they after? Now that's where it gets interesting. In he goes. Oh my, really, said Justine. I'm surprised Inigo left himself open to that level of exposure. To be exact, Inigo pre-living dream. This is an old store. How does that help anyone? I'm not sure. The Conservatives will benefit if he returns and stops the Cleric Conservators' pilgrimage project. But there's no way of telling if he will. He might just applaud and join the pilgrimage himself. If one of the factions full cloned him, they'd be in possession of a puppet messiah, very useful for endorsing your own agenda. Except this won't be a full clone, Paula said. This is an early version. I have a theory that might fit. Go. A full clone early version would presumably be able to receive dreams from the void, just like the original, which would give its controllers a considerable advantage over their opposition. You mean they'd be able to reach the supposed last dream? More likely, the new Skylord dreams. Ethan still hasn't found the second dreamer, despite a phenomenal amount of effort. Did you know Living Dream is modifying every Gaiafield confluence nest its sponsors? And that's about 80% of the greater Commonwealth. They're getting desperate. The new dreams are increasing. They're not just fragments anymore. Whole sequences are seeping into the Gaiafield. I don't think Living Dream is behind the raid. They'd benefit enormously, Justine said. Yes, but my you shadow has identified the woman assisting Mr. Telfer. It's Living Dream's ex-counselor, Cory Lynn, now persona non grata to Living Dream and wanted for several body loss charges on Elezalin. The Commonwealth warrants are quite extensive. They also list an accomplice called Aaron, who shares the facial features of Mr. Telfer. Now that is interesting. Any idea about Aaron, alias Mr. Telfer? No, but the pair of them transferred to a starship immediately after the clinic raid. There's only one starship unaccounted for on Anagaska right now. The Artful Dodger. What's the history? Standard private yacht. Registered on Sholapur. Own liberal use of travel clean back in those days. All of that gave her a guilty prod that she had not been back to Nick's in ages. She gritted her teeth against stupid sentiment and went into the vestibule as the elevator brought her new clients up from the lobby. Danal and Mareble were dressed strangely. She wore a long skirt of wide weave ginger cotton topped by a suede waistcoat with brass buttons that was worn over a plain white blouse. Sturdy brown boots were just visible below her swirling hem. Her thick raven hair was brushed back, its waves bound in simple elastic cloth bands. He wore leather trousers and boots, similar to hers. A yellow jacket was almost hidden beneath a brown overcoat made of an oiled fabric. Despite their historical appearance, Araminta could not help smiling as the elevator doors opened. There was something irrepressibly enthusiastic about them. Youthful grins and the eager way they glanced around the way they held hands the whole time. Welcome, she said. The golden wood door to the showcase apartment swung open. She had dressed the apartment with a simple two-tone color scheme in each room and had kept the furniture minimalist. The floor of the open-plan living room was an expensive ebony parquet. Artfully positioned tables and the chairs and settee were all reproduction herfal style with sharp curves and metal moiré legs, a popular fad three centuries earlier. The balcony was open, and it was a warm, clear day outside, showing the park off to great effect. Marebel drew a breath as they walked in. It's fabulous, she exclaimed, just what we're looking for. Danal chortled, forgive my wife. She obviously doesn't believe in showing her hand before negotiations. I did the same thing with the original vendor, Araminta confessed, it's easy to become devoted to these apartments very quickly. 
I'm actually thinking about keeping one for myself. Marebel stood in front of the balcony door. Would the one we're considering have the same view? Apartment three is on the corner. Adam intergestured along the balcony. You get one aspect facing the park, as well as a view westward across the city. The suspension bridge is visible that way. How lovely. Can we see it? Denal asked. Not just yet. City health and safety codes won't let me take people into an accredited construction site. And it's a complete shambles, which might put you off. Construction site? Are there structural problems? Absolutely not. The structure is perfectly sound. An independent deep-scan survey file is registered at City Hall, if you'd like to verify it. I'm just refurbishing and remodelling. Unfortunately, the city chooses to class that as construction because I'm replacing the electrics and utility feeds. It's just more file work for me, that's all. Danal gave a sympathetic sigh. That sounds just like a Leslin. Dear lady, the water walker never had to put in requests to the Orchard Palace if he wanted to get things done. Try telling that to our government. Now, darling, Marebel squeezed his hand more tightly. He has a thing about bureaucrats, she explained. We all do, Araminta assured them. Thank you, Denal said. So are you moving here from Elazalin? Araminta asked. Oh, yes, they chorused happily. I'm a confluence nest technician, Danal said. There's a lot of work going on upgrading the whole Gaia field right now. It's especially important on Viosha. Why is that? Araminta asked. The second dreamer is here, Marebel said. We're sure of it. The last few dreams were so much more vivid than those first fragments, don't you think? I don't have Gaia motes, Araminta said, keeping it light as if it were some minor fault in an appliance she was going to get corrected, praying it would not make any difference to the deal. She needed their deposit on apartment three. They had not been as easy to sell as she had envisaged, and her suppliers were submitting payment demands. Marebel and Danal both wore the same compassionate expression, as if they felt sorry for her, a concord that instantly reminded her of Mr. Bovey. The Gaia field is not something I could live without, Marebel said quietly. I can always sense Denal, no matter where we are. Even when we're planets apart, that kind of permanent emotional connection is so satisfying and reassuring. And of course we know Inigo's dreams. Intimately, Denal said. He smiled with the placid bliss only the truly devout could achieve. Araminta tried to replicate that mean of joy. I didn't know you could tell where a dream came from, she said, hoping that would divert them from her tragic defect. There was nothing the devout of any sect or ideology enjoyed more than making the benefits of their belief obvious to outsiders. That's the thing with the Gaia field, Marebel explained earnestly. It's not all clear and precise like the Unisphere. Human thoughts are not digital, they're emotion. I had the feeling with the last few dreams of the Sky Lord. They were close to me. Now that the nests remember them, they've lost that aspect. Not that they aren't still wonderful. We're all hoping that we'll experience the Sky Lord flying to Makathran to collect the water walker's soul. After everything he's done for the people of Quarentia and us, he deserves to rest within Odin's sea. Something about Marebel's evocation made Adam into pause, as if it connected with some old recollection. That was stupid. I see, Araminta said. Her knowledge of the whole Water Walker epic was sketchy at best. She certainly did not know any details. That's why you want to live here. Marebel nodded eagerly. I'm convinced the second dreamer is here. One day soon he'll reveal himself and then pilgrimage can begin. Will you join it? They smiled at each other and clasped hands again. We hope so. Well, at the risk of being crass, you won't find anywhere better to wait than here. I think we can consider putting in an offer, Danal said. An uncomfortable number of our fellow followers are looking for property on Viosha. Living in a hotel is pleasant, but we'll be happy to move into a real home. That I can fully appreciate. We're prepared to offer you the full asking price, but we would need a guarantee that the apartment will be completed on time. I can put my certificates on that file, yes. And the virtual model we accessed... It was nice, but... I want to make some changes, Marable said quickly. 
The technology needs to be de-emphasized, and the decor should be more naturalistic. Naturalistic. Less manufactured products, more wood, as it is on Querencia. We're not against technology, we use it all the time, but it shouldn't be featured. For instance, you can install a proper cooker in the kitchen, one with an oven and hob. I'll check city regulations and get back to you on that one. So you can supply me with a proper cooker, she asked Mr. Bovey that night over dinner. She was at his house, sitting at a small table on the balcony that overlooked the lawn. The river cairns ran along the bottom edge, where the mown grass gave way to shaggy reeds and a lengthy clump of Koran twister trees that dangled chrome blue fronds into the water. Bright lights in the buildings along the opposite bank glinted off the smooth black surface. It was a lovely, relaxing ambience, with a delicious meal, several of hymns had cooked, and three of hymns sitting with her, a pleasant end to an exasperating day. Actually, yes, the handsome blonde one said. You say that with such confidence, because I've already supplied three in the last ten days, the shorter one with a dark complexion told her. Living dream fanatics do like their primitive comforts. They prefer water baths to spore showers, too. Dear Rosie, my cousin was right. They are taking over. I ought to raise the price on the last two apartments. I don't want to throw a damper on the evening, but I actually find that prospect quite disturbing, mainly because it's rapidly becoming true. There are a lot of them here now. Millions. I'd have thought the rush for housing will benefit you as much as me, probably more so. Financially, yes, the blonde said, holding up a kebab of spiced torkal and pork marinated in red honey. But multiples don't fit into the living dream ethos. He bit into the meat and started chewing. We didn't exist in Makathran, the Oriental one explained. Surely they're not against your lifestyle, are they? She had an unpleasant thought of how devoted Marebel and Danal were to their ideology, to the complete exclusion of just about everything else. That did not make them hostile, just unaccepting. Oh, never actively, no, perish the thought. Their precious water-walker wanted everyone to live together and get along without conflict. But tell me this, how did your buyers react when they found out you weren't sharing the glory that exists only within the Gaia field? Surprised, she admitted. Then I think they wanted to convert me. I bet they did. It won't last long, she assured him. As soon as the pilgrimage starts, they'll all flock away to join it. My couple told me that. They're only here because they think this is where the second dreamer is hiding. Which is equally disturbing. Why? she asked, as she poured herself some more of the excellent rosé wine. If you're the next chosen one, why hide? And more than that, why keep releasing the dreams that let everyone know you exist and are in hiding? I don't understand anything about living dream. The whole thing seems stupid to me. The word you're looking for is dangerous, the short one said. Too many impo- Imagine that pleasure you've just experienced. Doubled, quadrupled, increased tenfold. Wouldn't you like that? Wouldn't your life be so much better, so much greater? The thought dwindled away into the vastness, as the solar wind cooled and dimmed. There were only two of hymns asleep on the bed when Araminta woke. She checked the time in her exovision and groaned in dismay. Five past seven already. There was so much to do in the third apartment today. The bots should have spent the night stripping the old tiles in the fifth apartment, but her you shadow revealed that they had stopped work at three in the morning when they had encountered a problem their semi-sentient software could not cope with. She had two prospective buyers for apartment four arriving before noon. Great Aussie, she complained as she heaved herself out of bed. No time for a shower. She grabbed the clothes she had worn the previous night, which really were not everyday garments. Must bring a bag with some decent clothes for morning. Would he object to that? She escaped the bedroom without waking the Mr. Bovies, and scuttled down the stairs, raking fingers through awful strings of tangled hair. The smell of coffee and toast was permeating out of the big kitchen. It was sorely tempting, given her body's chill. I must ease off those booster aerosols. Surely a single minute spent with one cup of tea wouldn't jeopardize the whole day? 
She put her head around the archway to smile into the long open plan kitchen diner. Five of hims were sitting at the breakfast bar, with another three lounging in the big old settee. Hi, the smile faded from her face. A woman was perched on the sixth stool at the breakfast bar, wearing a big fluffy toweling robe. One of hims had his arm around her, his hand lovingly massaging the base of her neck. The woman glanced up from a big mug of steaming coffee and pulled a delinquent face. Oh, hi there. I'm Jocil. I guess I was being worn out by the half of hims you weren't with last night. He's good sex, huh? I managed four. She grinned proudly at her entourage of Mr. Bovies. Araminta managed to freeze her expression before she did anything petty, like glare or pout or start shouting about what a useless pile of shit he was. Right, she said in a croak. Got to go. People I'm honest with are coming to see me. She headed for the front door as fast as she could without actually running, even managed to get outside. Her old carry capsule was resting on the gravel pad fifteen metres away. Just hold on. She turned. It was the body she had had that first dinner date with. He always used that one to talk to her when it was something serious, obviously working the whole age equals wisdom angle with maybe a little trust mixed in. Drop dead, she snapped. All of you. You knew I would date other women. I... She sputtered with indignation. No, actually, no, I didn't. I thought we... Some stubborn little part of her was trying desperately not to cry in front of him. What the point was, with someone who knew her so completely, eluded her. Still, she was not going to give him the satisfaction of seeing how much she cared. Listen to me. He stood in front of her, taking a moment to compose himself. You are a lovely, fantastic person. I haven't met someone I was this attracted to in years. And I think you know that. Well, this is a... Funny way of showing it? No. No. That's a single person's line, not mine. How ridiculous, she shouted. Maybe you've been trying to hide from this. I don't know. Adjusting to multiple life does take time. It isn't easy. And you're upset. I'm not upset, she announced haughtily. I have a great time with you every time, no matter where we go and what we do, and that's the problem. Think on this. You are a wonderful, healthy, strapping girl with a huge sexual appetite. Every man's dream. And I'm always amazed and excited by how many of me's you take on when we go to bed. But not even you can physically satisfy 38 male bodies every night. We've been going out all this time, and there are still some me's you haven't met, let alone had sex with yet. You get me all hot and randy. And every time you do that... The majority of me's are left frustrated. I... Oh, really? It was kind of obvious when he explained it like that. But he was right. It really was not something she wanted to think through. I can only take so much. Josil and the others help release the pressure you create. Others. Again, something she did not want to consider. This whole multiple thing was turning out to be a giant complication. She took a breath and stared at the gravel around her feet. I'm sorry. You're right. I didn't consider that part of it. It's been so good for me. I just assumed it was the same for you. Singles thinking, huh? Yes. He put a hand on her shoulder. It comforted her, that whole wise and sympathetic thing. But I'm hoping, really hoping, we can work through this. She gave the door a guilty glance. I'm not sure I can get around the idea of you having sex with her as well. Were you... No, I don't want to know. He raised an eyebrow and waited patiently. Araminta sighed. Last night, were you having sex with both of us at the same time? Yes. A particularly malicious thought crept out of her mind. And she could only cope with four. Afraid so. Poor girl. Her little spike of humour withered away. I don't know about this. I'm not sure I can cope. There would need to be so many women. That's not part of a long-term relationship. Listen, I said you were special right at the start. And the more I get to know you, the more I know that I don't want to lose you. So what do you do? Get half of you neutered? I really can't. Not thirty-eight. He grinned. 
that's my Araminta, considering it even now. But there's another option, isn't there? What? He did not answer right away. Instead, his hand touched her chin, tipping her head back until she couldn't avoid staring into his eyes. Eventually, she gave a defeated little nod. I get myself some extra bodies, she said in a quiet voice. I'm not going to browbeat. I couldn't do that to you. It would be wrong. The decision has to be yours alone. I just want you to think about it. You've seen all the practical benefits firsthand, and I reminded you about the sexual advantages again last night. She fixed him with a firm stare. Tell me, if I do this, would you stop dating the other women? Would it be just you and me? Yes, emphatically, just you. Yous in my life, yous in my bed, cross my hearts. I want this, Araminta. I want this so much. I wish you had Gaiamote so I could show you just how serious I am. We'll just have to settle for registering it at City Hall instead. Hozzy! A marriage proposal and a lifestyle change in one, and it's not even half past seven yet. Sorry you had to run into it like this. Not your fault. You're right. I should have thought about this. So I'll be a big girl and think about it properly now. Don't expect an answer right away. This is a hell of a lot more than I'm used to dealing with in a day. His arms went around her, hugging tight as if he were the one seeking reassurance. It's momentous, I remember. So take all the time you need. He rode the gigantic horse for hour after hour, his young legs barely stretching over the saddle. In the distance were real mountains, their snow-capped peaks stabbing high into the glorious sapphire sky. He was leaving them behind, riding away from the forests that covered the foothills. It was wild felt beneath the hooves now, lush tropical vegetation split by streams and small rivers. Trees from a dozen planets grew across the low slopes, their contrasting evolutions providing a marvellous clash of colour and shape. Hot air gusted against him, heavy with alien pollen. His friends rode beside him, the six of them shouting encouragement to one another as they wove around the knolls and ridges. None of them were yet adult, but they were finally old enough to be trusted out on their own. It was days like this, full of freedom and joy, that made sense of his life. Then the cry went up, The King Eagles! The King Eagles are here! He scoured the brilliant sky, seeing the black dots above the rumpled horizon. Then he too was yelling in welcome, his heart pounding with excitement. The horse ran faster as the noble lords of this world's sky grew larger and larger. Red lights flashed across the heavens. The King Eagles elongated, black lines curving and twisting to form a grey rectangular shape. His horse had vanished, leaving him lying flat on his back. The red light turned violet-blue and began to retreat as the top of the medical chamber opened. A face slid into view, peering down. He blinked it into focus. It was very pretty and heavily freckled, with a mass of dark red hair tied back. "'You okay?' Corrie Lynn asked. "'Ah,' uh, Aaron told her. "'Here, drink this.' A plastic straw was eased into his mouth. He sucked some welcoming cool liquid down his sore throat. What? he mumbled. What? What happened? You've been in the ship's medical chamber for a couple of days. He winced as he tried to move his arms. His whole left side was stiff, as if the skin had shrunk. A moment, he told her. His U-shadow flipped medical records into his exovision, he skipped the details, concentrating on the major repairs. The damage had been more extensive than he had expected. The projectile entry wounds combined with fire-wire mutilation and toxin contamination meant the medical chamber had had to cut and extract a lot of ruined tissue and bone from his chest. Foreign meat had been inserted, neutral function cells that could have their preactive DNA switched to mould them into whatever organ, bone or muscle function they were replacing. He spotted a supplementary file and opened it. The foreign meat stored in the chamber actually was not so foreign. The DNA was his. It also had full-complement bionic organelles. The repairs had been woven into his body by the chamber 
and his existing bionics. They were still integrating, and that was why he felt so awful. Estimated time for the bionics to complete the binding and the cells to acclimatize to their new function was a further 72 hours. Could have been better. Could have been worse, he decided. I was worried, she said. Your wound was huge. The blood. Her face paled. Even the freckles faded. Aaron slowly shifted his arms back along the chamber padding, propping himself up, at which point he realized he did not have any clothes on. Thank you. She gave him a blank look. I should be thanking you, shouldn't I? What happened? The last thing I remember was you hitting Ruth's stall. That little princess bitch. So, what came next? Aaron swung his feet over the lip of the capsule. His inner ears seemed to take a lot longer than usual to register the movement. Bulkhead spun around him, then twisted back. The starship's cabin was in its lounge mode, with long couches extending out from the bulkhead walls. He hobbled over to the closest one as the medical chamber withdrew into the floor. Sitting down, he tentatively poked his chest with a forefinger. Half of his torso was a nasty salmon pink, covered with a glistening protective membrane. I did what you suggested, Corrie Lynn said. The capsule smashed its way into the reception hall. I just got inside when there was this almighty explosion over the forest. It knocked the capsule around quite a bit, but I was caught by the internal safety field. We zipped over to the administration block. You were a mess, but I managed to pull you inside. Then we rendezvoused with the artful dodger outside the clinic, the way you set it up. The starship put its force field around the capsule while we transferred in. Good job. The police were going apeshit with me. They were shooting every weapon they had at us. There were craters all over the place when we took off. I told the smart corps to get us out of the system, but it followed your preloaded flight plan. We're just sitting in some kind of hyperspace hole a light year out from Anagaska. I can't make a unisphere connection. The smart corps won't obey me. I loaded a few options in, he said. His U-shadow gave the smart core an instruction and a storage locker opened. Do you think you could get me that robe, please? She frowned disapprovingly but pulled the robe out. I was really worried. I thought I was going to be stuck here forever if you died. It was horrible. The medical chamber would rejuvenate me every fifty years, and I'd just sit in the lounge, plugged into the sensory drama library, being drip-fed by the culinary unit. That's not how I want to spend eternity, thank you. He grinned at her drama queen outrage as he slipped on the robe. If the chamber could rejuvenate you, it would certainly re-life me. Oh, in any case, if I die, the smart core allows you full control. Right. But, he caught hold of her hand. She jerked around, suddenly apprehensive. None of this would have happened if you'd been ready to pick me up when I told you. I haven't seen any decent clothes in weeks, she protested. I just lost track of time, that's all. I didn't mean to be late. Besides, I thought you got wounded before the scheduled rendezvous. He closed his eyes in despair. Corrie Lynn, if you're on a combat mission, you don't call a fucking time out to go shopping, understand? You never said combat. A quick raid sneaking into their vault, you said. For future reference, a covert mission in which all sides are armed is a combat situation. She pulled a face. Nothing they have will be a match for my bionics. I never said that. Yes, you did. I... He let out a breath and made an effort to stay calm. Yoga. She always made us do yoga. It was fucking stupid. Corilin was frowning at him. You okay? You need to get back in the chamber. I'm fine. Look, thank you for picking me up. I know this kind of thing is not what your life is about. You're welcome, she said gruffly. Please tell me we still have the memory cell. Corilin produced a mink smile and held up the little plastic cube. We still have the memory cell. Thank Ozzy for that. His U-shadow told the smart core to show him the ship's log. He wanted to check how much effort had been made to try to track them. Since they had left Anagaska in a hurry, several starships had run sophisticated heist radar scans out to several light years, 
but nobody could spot an ultra-drive ship in trans-dimensional suspension. The log also recorded that Corilin had managed to circumvent the lockout he had placed on the culinary unit to prevent it from making alcoholic drinks. This really wasn't the time to make an issue of it. Okay, he told her. I don't think anyone spotted us, though there were some mighty interesting comings and goings just after our raid. Several ships with unusual quantum signatures popped out of hyperspace above Anagaska. The smart core thinks they might be ultra drives in disguise. Who would they be? Don't know and don't intend to hang around to ask. Let's get going. Finally. He held his hand out, carefully maintaining a neutral expression. Corilin gave the cube a sentimental look and took a while to drop it into his palm. I'm not sure I like the idea of you reading Inigo's mind. I'm not going to. Memory assimilation isn't like accessing a sensory drama off the Unisphere or accepting experiences through the Gaia field. A genuine memory takes a long time to absorb. You can compress it down from real time, but still this cube contains nearly 40 years of life. That would take months to shunt into a human brain. It's one of the governing factors in creating real-life clones. If we're going to find him before the pilgrimage, we don't have that much time to spare. So what are you going to do? Take it to someone who can absorb it a lot quicker than I can and ask nicely. You just said human brains can't absorb stored memories that quickly. So I did, which is why we're setting course for the High Angel. Corilin looked shocked. The Rael Starship. Yes. Why would the Rael help you? He smiled at the cube. Let's just say that we now have an excellent bargaining chip. This is the end of the CD. The program continues on the next CD. Corey Lynn did not have the kind of patience for extensive research. Aaron had to fill in the decades and centuries she skipped through when she started to access the files her U shadow trawled up on the Rael. Humans had discovered the High Angel back in 2163, he explained, when a wormhole was opened in its star system to search for any H congruous planets. CST's exploratory division quickly confirmed that there was no world that humans could live on but the astronomers did notice a microwave signal coming from the orbit of the gas giant Ikelanis. What's that got to do with angels? she asked. Were they all religious? Not astronomers, no. When they focused their sensors on the microwave source, they saw a moonlet 63 kilometers long with what looked like wings of hazy pearl light, the wings of an angel. Sounds like they were religious to me if that's the first thing they think of. Aaron groaned. With more sensors urgently brought online, the true nature of the artifact was revealed. A core of rock sprouting twelve stems that supported vast domes, five of which had transparent cupolas. Cities and parkland were visible inside. It was a starship, a living creature or a machine that had evolved into sentience. Origin unknown, and it wasn't telling. Several species lived in the domes. Only the Rael consented to talk to humanity, and they did not say very much. Several of the biggest astro-engineering companies negotiated a lease on three of the domes, and the High Angel became a dormitory town for an archipelago of microgravity factory stations, producing some of the Commonwealth's most advanced and profitable technology. The workforce and their families soon grew large enough to declare autonomy, with High Angel's approval, and qualify for a seat in the Senate. With the outbreak of the Starflyer War, High Angel became the Commonwealth's premier navy base, while the astro-engineering companies turned their industrial stations over to warship production. More domes were grown or extruded or magically manifested into existence to accommodate the navy personnel, even today, nobody understood the High Angel's technology. Do we know more about it now? she asked. Not really. ANA might. The central worlds can duplicate some functions with bionics, but the external worlds haven't managed to produce anything like it. Humans, he told her, had to wait for 200 years after the war before the massive alien starship's history became a little clearer. Wilson Kimes' epic voyage in the Endeavour 
to circumnavigate the galaxy, revealed the existence of the Void to the Commonwealth, complete with Centurion Station and Rael defence systems maintaining the Wall Stars. Other Navy exploration ships discovered more High Angel-class ships. The one species common to all of them was the Rael. Confronted with that evidence, the Rael finally explained that they had created the High Angel class of ships over a million years earlier, while their species had been at its apex. It was a golden age during which the Rael civilization spread across thousands of planets. They mixed with hundreds of other sentients, guided and observed as dozens of species transcended to a post-physical state. They even knew the Sylphon before their mother home dreamed its paths into existence. Then the Void underwent one of its periodic expansion phases. Nothing the Rael could do stopped the barrier from engulfing entire star clusters. Gravity shifted around the galactic core as stars were torn down into the event horizon. The effect on civilizations just outside the wall stars was catastrophic. Stars shifted position as the core gravity field fluctuated. Their planets changed orbits. Thousands of unique biospheres were lost before evolution had any chance to flourish. Whole societies had to be evacuated before storm fronts of ultra-hard radiation that measured thousands of light years across came streaming out into the base of the galaxy's spiral arms. After it was over, after rescue and salvage operations that went on for millennia, the Rael declared that the void no longer could be tolerated. The first lives who had created it while the galaxy was still in its infancy clearly had not recognized the horrendous consequences it would have on those who lived after their era. The Rael created an armada of ships that could function in any quantum state that theoretically might exist within the void, and they invaded. A hundred thousand ships surrounded the terrible barrier and flew inside, ready for anything. None returned. The void remained unbroken. What was left of the once colossal Rael civilization launched a rearguard action. A defense system to reinforce the wall stars was built in the small hope that it might contain the next macro expansion. More ships were created to act as arcs for emergent species, carrying them away from the doomed galaxy across the greater gulf outside where they could re-establish themselves on new worlds in peaceful star clusters. It was the last act of beneficence from a race that had failed its ultimate challenge. If they could not save the galaxy, the Rael swore, they would endure to the bitter end, shepherding entities less capable than themselves to safety. That's not a version of history I can believe in, Corilin said softly, as the file images shrank to the centre of the cabin and vanished. It's very hard for me to accept the void as something hostile when I know the beauty which lies within. She took a sip of her hot chocolate and brandy, curling up tighter on the couch. That version, Aaron queried from the other side of the cabin. Well, it's not as if we can ever verify it, is it? Unless I've got a false memory, you've got nearly 600 years of human observations from Centurion Station to confirm the very unnatural way in which the barrier consumes star systems. And who was it now that took some of them? Oh, yes, that's right. Inigo himself. Yes, but this whole crusading armada claim? Come on. A hundred thousand ships with weapons that can crush entire stars? Where are they? None of Inigo's dreams showed the smallest relic. Dead. Vaporized into component atoms and consumed like every other particle of matter that passes through the barrier. He paused slightly troubled, except for the human ships which got through and landed on Quarentia. Pretty crappy tactics for a species of self-proclaimed masterminds. Didn't they think of sending a scout or two in first? Maybe they did. You can ask when we get to the High Angel. She gave him a pitying look, if they even let us dock. O oh, ye of little faith! The Artful Dodger fell back into space-time 10,000 kilometers from the High Angel. Icalanise was waxing behind the alien starship, a horned crescent of warring topaz and platinum storm bands. Four small black circles were strung out along the equator, the tip of the Umbra cones projected by a conjunction cluster of its 38 moons. 
Several sensor sweeps flashed across the starship. High Angel still hosted a large Commonwealth Navy presence. The base admiral took security seriously. A fresh identity complete with official certification was already loaded into the smart core for examination. Aeron's U-Shadow requested docking permission with the new Glasgow Dome for the Alini. They received almost immediate approach authority. The archipelago of industrial stations glided lazily along a thousand-kilometre orbit, forming a dense loop of silver specks around the High Angel. Service shuttles zipped between them and the human-inhabited domes, collecting advanced technology and materials for forward shipment to the external worlds, where such systems still were prized. How about that? Aaron muttered appreciatively as he accessed the ship's sensor imagery. An angel with a halo. You can take religious analogies too far, Corilin chided. There were seventeen domes rising out of the core's rocky surface now. The six occupied by humans all had crystal cupolas, allowing them to see the cities and parkland inside. Four of the remainder were also transparent to a degree. The spectra of alien suns shone out of them, following their own diurnal cycles. Strange city silhouettes could be seen parked on the landscapes within. At night, they would shine with enticing, colourful light points. One of them belonged to the Rael. The remaining domes were closed to external observation, and neither High Angel nor the Rael would discuss their residence. Following Aaron's instruction, the Starship Smart Corps aimed a communication maser at the Rael Dome. I would like permission to dock at the Rael Dome, please, Aaron said. There is a resident I wish to speak to in a human expedition during the Starflyer War. I had friends, human friends, which is unusual for a Rael then as now. Tell me, do you know of Paula Mayo? Aaron was surprised when his heart did a little jump at the name. Must be the medical treatment. I've heard of her. I liked Paula Mayo, Katux said. She is an ANA governance representative these days. And you are not. Not at her level. Aaron prayed Corilin would not start mouthing off. Why are you here? Katux asked. I have a request. He held up the cube. This is the memory cell of a human. I would like you to receive the memories. There are questions about his personality I need answered. Katux did not respond. Its eyes swiveled from Aaron to Corilin, then back again. Can you do that? Aaron asked. He was aware that something was wrong, but did not know what. His mind kept telling him that Katux was the Rael who was most likely to help in this fashion, so far on this mission, all the intuitive knowledge loaded into his subconscious had been correct. I used to do that, Katux whispered. At one time I was captivated by human emotional states. I married a human. Married, Corilin blurted. A most nice lady by the name of Tiger Pansy. I had never known someone so emotionally reactive. We spent many years together on the planet you named Far Away. I shared her every thought, every feeling. What happened? Aaron asked, knowing it was not going to be good. She died. I'm sorry. She died most horribly. A woman called the Cat prolonged her death for many days, deliberately. I shared that time with my wife. I experienced human death. Shit. Aaron mumbled. I have not known human thought or emotion since. At the end, my wife cured me of this strange weakness. It was her last gift, however unwillingly given. I am Rael again. I now hold high rank among my own kind. We shouldn't have asked you to do this, Corilin said humbly. We didn't know. I'm so sorry. Aaron wanted to use a stun shot on her. It's Inigo he said, holding the cube up again, the human who dreams the lives of humans inside the void. Once again, Katux was perfectly still. This time its eyes remained focused on Aaron alone. Aaron? Corilin hissed through clenched teeth. He could feel the anger powering out of her through the Gaia field and completely ignored it. I'm looking for him, he told the huge, silent alien, staring straight into its multiple eyes. 
He needs to be found before his living dream believers spark another devourment phase with their pilgrimage. Will you help? Inigo, Katux asked. The whisper had softened to near inaudibility. Yes, the cube holds his personality right up until he left for his Centurion station mission, his formative years. Everyone knows his life since he founded Living Dream, even the Rael. Or perhaps especially the Rael. If you combined that knowledge with his formative years, I thought that you might be able to understand his motivations, that you could work out where he has gone for me. The Rael have wanted to know the inside of the void for so long. It is all we exist for now. We are its nemesis, as much as it is ours. For over a million years we were content with the role fate had given us. And then a human comes along and simply dreams what is in there. None of us is capable of that. The strongest of our race fell into that evil place, and no trace remains. Nothing. It's not evil, Cory Lynn said sullenly. I would like to believe that. I cannot. We have known the void from a time before your species achieved sentience. It is the destroyer of life, of hope. Nothing escapes it. Millions of humans live inside the void. They live lives full of hope and love and laughter. They live lives better than any of us out here. To do so, to achieve their greater life you envy so much, they are killing you. They are killing this galaxy. And now you wish to join them, to increase the damage to a level you cannot imagine. Will you stop the pilgrimage? Aaron asked. Not I. Not this ark ship. This is not the purpose of this Rael. We are custodians alone. However, there are other Rael who serve a different purpose. They are the defenders of the galaxy. I do not know what they will do to your pilgrimage. Aaron glanced at Cory Lynn. Her mouth was set in a purposeful line. Can you help us with Inigo's memories? If I can find him, talk to him, there may be a chance he'll stop the pilgrimage. Katux moved toward him. Eight stumpy legs on either side of its underbelly tilting forward to move it in a smooth undulation. Aaron held his ground, though he was aware of Corilin taking a small shuffle backward. Her emotions seeping into the Gaia field were turning from pride to concern. I will do what I can, Katuk said. It extended a medium-sized tentacle. Aaron exhaled in relief and handed over the memory cell. The tentacle tip coiled around it and withdrew, curling backward. Just behind the collar of tentacles, hanging off the equivalent of a rael neck, innumerable small protuberances of flesh dangled, each one crowned by a small heavy bulb that was technological in origin. The cube sank through the dark surface of a bulb, like a pebble falling into water. A long shudder ran along Cuttox's bulk, and the giant alien let out a sigh that seemed close to pain. I will... Tell you, when I have finished, Katux said. Aaron and Corilin were unceremoniously teleported back into the artful dodger. The Mars twins were an unusual turgid red as their upper atmosphere hurricanes swirled and battled along thousand-kilometer fronts, obliterating the dark shadows that occasionally hinted at surface features. Their dour ambience matched cleric conservator Ethan's mood as he strode through the Liliala Hall. Above him the storms rampaging across the visionary ceiling flashed purple lightning and pummeled away at each other like waves assaulting a beach. They swirled together, veiling the two small planets. The silent, vivid battle made for an impressive entrance as he swept through the arching door into the mayor's suite. Rincenzo and Falvin, two of his staunchest supporters on the council, were waiting for him in the first anteroom, their cautious expressions made more sinister by the amber lighting. All they allowed of themselves into the Gaia field was a polite radiance of expectation. Not even Ethan's easily sensed mood could make them waver. He beckoned them to follow as he pushed through into the oval sanctum. Strong sunlight shone in through the high rayonant-style windows, illuminating the grand wooden desk, identical to the one the water walker had sat behind when he had been mayor of Macathran. Five simple chairs were arranged before it. Councillor Phelim stood at the side of one, waiting for Ethan to sit behind his desk. 
he wore the simple everyday blue and green robe of a councillor. It was meant to testify to an open and approachable person who would take time to solve someone's problem. On Phelim, it was off-putting, emphasising his height and severe facial features. So the Sky Lord would seem to be on its way to Corencia, Ethan said as he sat down. Falvin cleared his throat. It is heading for some kind of planet. We have to assume it is Corencia. The prospect of another planet housing humans in the void would open many complications for us. Not so, Rincenzo said. I don't care how many other H. congruous planets there are or who lives on them. We are concerned only with Quarentia and the Water Walker. It is his example we wish to follow. Too many unknowns to pronounce on, Falvin said. Not that many, surely, Ethan said. We cannot doubt the second dreamer is dreaming a Sky Lord. This creature is aware of the souls and minds of living sentient entities. It and its flock are flying toward a solid planet to collect those souls and carry them to Odin Sea. This flight fulfills every teaching of the Lady. I wonder what life in Makathran is like now, Rincenzo mused. So much time has passed. You'll find out soon enough, Ethan said. The hulls of our pilgrimage ships are being fabricated. We will be ready to launch soon. Fail him. We should have the hulls and internal systems finished by September, Phelim said. The cost is colossal, but the free market zone has a considerable manufacturing capacity. Component construction is heavily cybernated. Production is a simple process once the templates are loaded in. And of course, no matter how much criticism we face, external world companies are always eager for our money. September, Rincenzo said. Dear Ozzy, so close. Ethan did not look at Phelim. No one else had been told of the ultra-drive engines Marius had promised to deliver. The physical aspect goes well, he said. That just leaves us with our enigmatic second dreamer to deal with. We still don't know why he hasn't revealed himself. But it is significant that his dreams have become so much more substantial as the ships are built. Why does he not come forward? Falvin said. The Gaiafield revealed the flash of anger in his mind. Curse him. Are we never to find him? He is on Viosha, Phelim said. Are you sure? Yes. The Gaiafield confluence nests on Viosha were the first to receive his last dream. They disseminated it across the greater Commonwealth to look. Then why do we need to incorporate Viosha? What if the second dreamer isn't an adherent of living dream? Ethan asked mildly. But there's a much worse scenario than that. Phelim said, if one of our opponents were to reach him first and use him to sabotage the pilgrimage. They'll be looking, Rincenzo said. Of course they'll be looking, Ethan said, but we have a huge advantage with our command of the Gaia field. Not even ANA's despicable factions can intrude upon that. We must reach him first. And if he refuses to help, Falvin inquired. Change his mind, Phelim told them, in a very literal sense. I suppose that's necessary, Rincenzo said uneasily. I would hope not, Ethan said, but we must be prepared for all eventualities. Yes, I understand. What I would like to do first is make a simple appeal to both the second dreamer and the Sky Lord, Ethan said. Falvin's thoughts rippled with surprise, which he made no effort to hide. A Unisphere declaration? No, a direct intervention into the next dream. How? The second dreamer is issuing his dream into the confluence nests in real time, Phelim said. Right at the end of the last dream, as it fades away, there is an anomaly, a tiny one. It is extremely hard to spot. We believe it has escaped attention among the majority of our followers. But our dream masters have been reviewing those last moments, there is a human emotion intruding into the Skylord's stream of consciousness, a weak sense of pleasure, but one with considerable sexual connotations. In all probability we are witnessing post-coital satisfaction. The second dreamer receives the Skylord's dream when he's having sex, Rincenzo asked incredulously. The human brain is most receptive when relaxed, Ethan said. The period immediately after sex certainly generates that state. Did this happen to Inigo? Falvin was almost indignant. 
Ethan's lips twitched in amusement. Not that I'm aware of. Inigo never issued his dreams in real time, so I don't suppose we'll ever know. But this anomaly is the strongest indicator we have that this is real-time dreaming, in which case we should be able to intervene, to converse with both the second dreamer and the Skylord. If we can successfully perform the latter intervention, we may be able to establish a direct connection without the second dreamer, in which case our problems will be solved. Vyosha becomes an irrelevance, as does our elusive second dreamer, and we will be one step closer to the void. That would be wonderful, Falvin said. Our dream masters are now monitoring Vyosha's confluence nests for the time the second dreamer starts to dream. When it happens, we will make the attempt. And if that fails, then you will bring your proposal to the council. Fourteen hundred years was a long time alive by anyone's standards. However, there were Commonwealth citizens who had remained in their bodies for longer. Paula had even met a few of them. She did not enjoy their company. Mostly they were dynasty members who could not let go of the old times when their family empires used to run the Commonwealth. After Bionics and ANA and higher culture had changed the central worlds forever, they had grabbed what they could of their ancient wealth and re-established themselves on external worlds, where they had set about recreating their personal golden age. They had the money and influence to be bold and build new experimental societies, something different, something exciting. But for all their extraordinarily long life, they'd never experienced another way to live. And the longer they managed to maintain their own little empires around them, the more resistant to change they became. Nothing new was attempted. Instead, they mined history for stability. On one planet in particular, their social engineering had reached its nadir. A ruling Halgarth collective on Yayud had founded and maintained a society that was even less susceptible to change than Huxley's Haven by the simple expedient of prohibiting conception. At the end of a fifty-year life, all the citizens were rejuvenated and their memories wiped, except that the state knew who they were and what job they did best. On emerging fresh from their clinic treatment, they would be appointed to the same profession again and spend the next fifty years working as they had for the last fifty, hundred, three hundred years. It was the ultimate feudalism. Three hundred years before, Paula had led an undercover team of agents there, infiltrating the clinics that performed the rejuvenation treatment and slowly corrupting them. Over the next few years, memory wipes became incomplete, allowing people to remember what had gone before. Thousands of women discovered that their revitalized bodies had a functional uterus again. Underground networks were established, first to help the criminal outcasts who had given birth to children, and then assuming a greater role in offering political resistance to the Halgarth regime. Forty years after Paula and her team had finished their mission to sow dissent on Yayud, a revolution overturned the Halgarth collective using minimal force. It took a further hundred fifty years for the twisted world to regain its equilibrium and claw its way back up the socio-economic index to something approaching the average for an external world. At the time, Paula had worried that she still was not ready for that kind of mission. Change was a long time coming within herself. It was one thing to realize intellectually that she had to adapt mentally to keep up with the ever-shifting cultures of the greater commonwealth. But unlike everyone else, she had to make a conscious decision to alter herself physically in order for that evolution to manifest itself. Her carefully designed DNA hardwired her neurons into specific personality traits. In order to survive any kind of phrenic progression, she first had to destroy what existed, an action that came perilously close to individuality suicide. And in her, as in every human, vanity was not something bound to DNA. She considered her existing personality to be more than adequate. In short, she liked being herself. But in slow increments, every time she needed to undergo rejuvenation, she modified a little more of her psychoneural profiles they otherwise would not have performed. She'd left the St. Mary's Clinic and returned to her ship, the Alexis Denken, 
a sleek ultra-drive vessel that ANA governance had supplied and armed to a degree that would have alarmed any Navy captain. She left the planet and then hung in trans-dimensional suspension 20 AU out from the star. It was a position that allowed her to monitor the FTL traffic within the Anagaska system with astonishing accuracy. Unfortunately, the one thing her ship's sensors could not do was locate a cold trail. There was no trace of Aaron's ship. Given the time between the raid on the clinic and her arrival, she suspected that he had an ultra-drive ship. Marius certainly had one. Her U-shadow monitored him arriving back at the city starport and getting into a private yacht. Alexis Denkin's sensors tracked it slipping into hyperspace. For those in the know, the signature was indicative of an ultra-drive. An hour later, the delivery man took off in his own ship, which had an equally suspicious drive signature. He flew away in almost exactly the opposite direction of Marius. Ten minutes later, another starship dropped out of trans-dimensional suspension where it had been waiting in the system's cometary halo and began to fly along the same course as the delivery man. Good luck, Paula sent to Justine. Thanks. Paula opened an ultra-secure link to ANA governance. It appears your ultra-drive technology is completely compromised, she reported. To be expected... ANA governance replied, It does not require my full capacity to derive the theory behind it. Most factions would have the intellectual resources. Once the equations are available, any higher replicator above level 5 could produce the appropriate hardware. I still think you should exert a little more authority. After all, the factions are all part of you. Factions are how I remain integral. I am plural. The way you say it, makes it sound like you have the electronic version of bipolar disorder. More like multi-billion polar. But that is what I am. All individuals who join me do so by imprinting their personality routines upon me. I am the collective consciousness of all ANA inhabitants. That is the very basis of my authority. Once that essence is bequeathed, they are free to become what they want. I do not take their memories, too. That would be an annexation of individuality. You have to pass through the eye of the needle to live in the playground of the gods. One of Inigo's better quotes, ANA governance said with a cadence of amusement, shame about the rest of that sermon. You don't help make my job any easier. Any and all of my resources are available to you, but there's only one of me, and I feel like I'm battling the Hydra out here. This lack of self-confidence is unlike you. What is the matter? The pilgrimage, of course. Should it be allowed? The humans of Living Dream believe it to be both their right and their destiny. They are billions in number. How can that much belief be wrong? Because they might be endangering trillions. True. This is not a question which has an answer. Not in the absolute terms you are demanding. What if they do trigger the Void's final devourment phase, or at least a bad one? Ah, now, that is the real question. It's also one which I doubt we can have prior knowledge of. Neither I nor any of the post-physicals I have interacted with are aware of what happens inside the Void. Inigo showed you. Inigo showed us the fate of humans in the Void, which, incidentally, isn't too dissimilar to downloading yourself into me— Though the Void has the advantage of quasi-mystical overtones to win over the technophobes among humanity, and you get to remain physical. What he did not show us is the nature of the Void itself. So you're prepared to take the risk. At this moment I am prepared to let the players strut the stage. Yes, that's about as undefinitive as it gets. If I were to forbid the pilgrimage and enforce that decision, it would trigger a split within myself. Pro-pilgrimage factions, such as the Advancers, would likely attempt to create their own version of myself. And kindly remember, I am not a virtual environment. I am fully established within the quantum field intersections around Earth. You're scared of a rival? The human race has never been so unified as it is today. It has taken our entire history to reach this congruity. People... All people lead a good life, filled with as much diversity as they wish to undergo. They migrate inward, 
until they download into me. Within me they are free to transcend in any way imagination and ability can combine. One day as a whole, I will become post-physical. Humans who do not wish to travel along that path will begin afresh. That is the vision of evolution which awaits us. A rival focal point would distort that, possibly even damage or dilute the moment of singularity. There can only be one God, huh? There can be many. I simply wish to avoid engendering hostile ones. No one wants to see a war in heaven. Trust me, it would make a void devourment seem trivial. I thought diversity was our virtue. It's one of them, and as such, flourishes within me. But it is also a danger that can lead to our destruction. Opposing forces have to be balanced. That is my function. And this is one instance where you're going to fail if you're not careful. Undoubtedly. So we have to find other options. As people have sought since civilization began on earth, that, I think, is a greater virtue. Okay, then. Paula took a moment to marshal her thoughts. I'm uncertain who is behind the raid on the clinic. It is puzzling why the advancers and conservatives should both have their representatives there after the fact. Do you think a third faction is involved? Very likely. I do not know which one. Many alliances are being formed and broken. However, you may soon be able to establish the identity. Admiral Casimir is currently receiving a report from the base admiral at the High Angel. He will probably ask you to tackle it. Ah, if you need anything, I'll let you know. The link ended. Paula sat back on the deep, curving chair the starship's cabin had molded for her. Given her own uncertainty about the mission, she was feeling vaguely troubled by the lack of reassurance ANA governance could offer. She supposed she should be grateful it had been so honest with her. Casimir called less than a minute later. How did the Anagaska inquiry go? he asked. Positive result. It was definitely someone with advanced bionics, and possibly an ultra-drive ship. The target was Inigo's old memory cell. Interesting. And I've just had a report that Alini, a private starship, docked at High Angel. How is that relevant? It docked at the Rael Dome. The Navy sensors detected a drive signature, which could indicate an ultra-drive. Paula was suddenly very interested. Did it now? There are very few humans the Rael will allow into their dome. Who does the Alini belong to? Unknown. It's registered to a company on Shalapur. I'm on my way. The delivery man landed at Doroka's main starport, parking his ultra-drive ship, the Jomo, on a pad connected to the third terminal building, which dealt with private yachts. Then he started walking across the field to the nearby hangar zone. Even knowing all about the diversion bug infiltrated into the ground navigation section of the starport smart core did not help him. All the hangars were identical, the rows regimented. It was mildly confusing. Not that he would lose his way, not with all his enrichments and an instinctive sense of direction, but just to be on the safe side. His U-shadow snatched real-time images from a sensor satellite and guided him directly. Eventually, he was standing at the base of a glossy black wall, where the small side door was protected by an excellent security shield. Not even his full field function scan could determine what lay inside. He smiled. This was more like it. His bionics began to modify their field function, pushing a variety of energy patterns against the security shield, introducing small instabilities that quickly began to amplify. His U-shadow reached through the fluctuating gaps and launched a flurry of smart Trojans into the hangar net. The door irised open. Ninety-seven seconds. Not bad. Inside, his field function scanned, looking for possible guard armaments, while his U-shadow rifled through the hangar's electronic systems. Troblem had set up a fairly standard defense network, with concentric shielding around the main section of the hangar. The physicist was clearly more interested in maintaining privacy than in providing physical protection. His scan did not reveal any human presence in the hangar. The first office was clearly just a reception area. 
cover for anyone who did make it past the diversion system. Beyond that was a second office with one of the biggest smart cores the delivery man had ever seen. It was not connected to the hangar network or the Unisphere. His U-Shadow established a link to its peripheral systems and began to probe the available files. The delivery man went into the main hangar. He whistled softly at the vast array of Newman cybernetic modules occupying half the space inside. The machine was powered down, but he was familiar enough with the technology to guess that its sophistication probably put it beyond a level six replicator. That was not something an individual higher citizen normally possessed. No wonder Troblem needed such a large smart core. Nothing else could operate such a rig. Can you access the main memory? He asked his you shadow. Not possible for me. I will need high order assistance. The delivery man cursed and opened an ultra secure link to the conservative faction. There was a small risk. It could be intercepted by another faction, or, more likely, ANA governance itself, but in light of what he had stumbled across, he considered it necessary. I need help to gain access to Troblum's smart core. It should tell us what he's been building with this machine. Very well, the conservative faction replied. With his U-shadow providing a link, the delivery man could almost feel the faction's presence shift into the hangar, it began to infiltrate the smart core. While it was doing that, he began to look through the mundane files in the hangar's net to try to find delivery schedules. The individual components of the machine had to have come from somewhere, and the EMAs to obtain them went far beyond an individual's resources. There was no court the conservatives could use to confront the accelerators with, even if he established a data trail back to their representatives, but if he could find the proxy supplying Troblum with additional EMAs, there was a chance he could find other illicit EMA transfers from the same source. A whole level of accelerator operations would be uncovered. There is only one design stored in the smart core, the conservative faction announced. It would appear to be an FTL engine capable of transporting a planet. The delivery man swung around to stare at the dark machine looming above him, his gaze drawn to the circular extrusion mechanism in the center. A whole planet? Yes. Would it work? The design is an ingenious reworking of exotic matter theory. It could work, if applied correctly. And this built it, he said, still staring at the machine. There have been two attempts at producing the engine. The first was aborted. The second appears to have been successful. Why do they want to fly a planet at FTL speeds? And which planet? We don't know. Please destroy the machine and the smart core. The delivery man put his hands on his hips to give the machine an appalled look. What technology level can I go up to here? Unlimited. Nobody must know it ever existed. Least of all, hires. Okay, your call. The conservative faction ended the link leaving the delivery man feeling unusually alone. Now that he knew the purpose of the machine, the silent hangar had the feel of some ancient murder scene. It was not a pleasant place to be, putting him on edge. He called the Jomo smart cord and told it to fly over. The hangar's main doors would open when it arrived, and it nosed through the security screen to settle on the cradles inside. Its nose almost touched the wall of Newman's cybernetics. The delivery man made sure the hangar's security screen was at its highest rating before he stood underneath the Jomo's open airlock to be drawn up by an inverted gravity effect. Once inside, he used a tri-certificate authorization to activate the Hawking M-Sync stored in one of the forward holds. The little device was contained inside a high-powered regrav sled, which slipped out to hover in front of the Newman cybernetics. With that in place... The delivery man aimed an arrow disruptor effect at the machine, just above the Hawking M-Sync. A half-meter section of equipment vaporized, producing a horizontal fountain of hot, ionized gas. It bent slightly in midair to pour into the Hawking M-Sync, which absorbed every molecule. The delivery man tracked the disruptor effect along the front of the machine, with the Hawking M-Sync following. It took 40 minutes to vaporize the entire machine, when it was over, 
The quantum black hole at the centre of the Hawking M-Sync had absorbed 327 tonnes of matter, putting the regrav sled close to its weightlift limit as it edged back into the starship's hold. The delivery man requested flight clearance from the starport, and the Jomo lifted into Arevalo's warm summer skies. Justine watched it go from the safety of her own ship, which was parked on a pad, eight hangers down the road. Twilight was bathing Hawksbill Bay with a rich gold hue that was so mild that strange constellations could twinkle merrily across the cloudless sky. The only sound around the pavilion's swimming pool came from the waves breaking around the rocks of the headland below. An FTL engine that shifts planets, Nelson said. Got to admire them. They don't think small. They don't think, period, Gore grunted. ANA is embedded in the local quantum fields. You can't just rip it out and fling it across the galaxy on a blind date with the void. They obviously believe it. Troblem's EMA came through one of their front committees. He built the engine for the accelerators. Don't believe it, Gore said, shaking his head. He even made a presentation to the Navy about the Anomine, using something like this to haul the Dyson barrier generators into place. I asked Casimir to fund a fucking search for them, for Christ's sake. Why would Ilanthi allow him to go public with the idea? They'd atomize him before he even put in a call for a meeting with the Navy. No, we haven't got enough information yet. Makes sense if it's a diversion, Nelson said reluctantly. They wouldn't build anything so critical to their plans on a higher world. We don't, and he's taken years to get it built on a fairly pitiful budget. Wrong priority level. We need to find Troblem and ask nicely what he's really been doing for the accelerators. He left Revelo a while back, filed a flight plan to Lutain, never showed up there or any other Commonwealth world, central or external. We need to find him, Gore repeated firmly. That's not going to happen. Either the accelerators have him or he's hiding, or more likely... He's plain and simple dead. Then we find out which one it is. Justine stood in the middle of the weirdly empty hangar and called Paula. There's something seriously wrong here. In what way? Paula asked. I think the delivery man just cleared the whole place out. Justine slowly looked around the big empty space, opening her optical vision to Paula. See that? There was something in here. My field scan shows those power cables were cut by a disruption effect. Same goes for the support girders. Whatever it was, it was sizable and used up a great deal of power. But the Jomo is no bigger than my ship, which only leaves one option for how he did it. I thought the Hawking M-Sync was even more secure than ultra-drive technology. It would seem I'm wrong, which is disturbing. Casimir will have to be told, Justine said, if there are starships flying around the Commonwealth equipped with that kind of weapon, the Navy should know about it. The factions don't use the most principled people as their representatives. I'll leave that to you. Great, thank you. He's still human enough to blame the messenger. He's a professional. You'll be all right. Do you know where the delivery man is heading? His direction indicated Earth when he left my sensor range. I imagine he'll want to dump the mass stored in the Hawking M-Sync first, and he'll do that deep in interstellar space. Expelling it will produce a colossal gamma burst. Leave him alone for now. The focus is shifting back to living dream. Why? Our sources in the movement are reporting an alarming development, Paula said. Living dream is readying all the civil security forces on all the core worlds of the free market zone. Leave has been cancelled and they're undergoing martial law enforcement training. Martial law? Where is that applied in the free market zone? It isn't yet. But if they were to annex Viosha, they would probably need that many police troopers to keep the populace under control. Jesus! Are they planning that? Ethan is becoming desperate to gain control over the second dreamer, whoever that is. He's the one person who could still stop this whole pilgrimage in its tracks. And everyone believes he's on Viosha, Justine said, appalled. Dear heavens, an interstellar invasion. 
In this day and age, it's unthinkable. It's left over from the Starflyer War. Start thinking it. I made a mistake not giving this a higher priority. We really need to offer ANA Governance's protection to the Second Dreamer. That way no one will be able to pressure him into either helping or hindering the pilgrimage. But first we have to find him. How long before you can get your agent working on this? Very soon now. I'm on my way to see him with one slight detour. Justine eyed the hangar's inner office suspiciously. There was an empty space that three communications conduits led into, their ends cut off clean. Whatever they were building here was clearly important, and the delivery man took quite a risk covering it up. I don't think we have a lot of time left. The pilgrimage ships won't be ready to fly until September, and the Arkison Empire fleet will be here in late August, which is less than three months away. I'd like to suggest a lead no one else seems to be following. What's that? Inigo started to dream when he was at Centurion Station. Did anyone else? If they did, we'd know about it. That's the point. Would we? Suppose the contact was a weak one that was never fully established, or the recipient didn't want any part of Inigo's religion. A reluctant person just like the second dreamer has turned out to be. I think I see where you're going with this, or rather, intend to go. I want to check out the confluence nest on Centurion Station, see if it has any memory of void dreams or fragments of them. Maybe the second dreamer started his connection with the Sky Lord when he was there, just like Inigo. You're right. No one else has covered that angle. If I leave now, my ship can get me there in 500 hours. You're going to fly there. Why not use the Navy's relay link? Too much chance of it being intercepted. If you do find anything, it'll take you another 500 hours to get back. It'll probably all be over by then. If I find anything important, I'll use the relay link to send you the name in the heaviest encryption we have. Okay. Good luck. Troblum woke up slumped in the chair he had sat in reviewing various schematics all day. His exovision displays had paused at the point where he had fallen asleep. Colourful profiles of exotic mass density modulators floated like mechanical ghosts around him, each one beleaguered by shoals of blue and green analytical displays. Supposedly, those components would perform their designated function without any trouble. The designer simply had scaled up from existing ultra-drives. Except nobody had ever built them that size before which left Troblum with a mountain of problems when it came to the kind of precise power control they needed. And they hadn't even gotten to the fabrication stage yet. He stretched as best his thick limbs would allow and tried to get out of the chair. After two attempts that made him look like an overturned glagwe struggling to right itself, his U-shadow ordered the station to reduce the local gravity field. Now, when he pushed with his legs and back, he gave his body an impetus that propelled him right out of the clingy cushions. Gravity returned slowly, giving him time to straighten his legs before his feet touched the decking. He let out a wet belch as the falling sensation ended. His stomach still was churning, and his legs felt weak and stiff. He had a headache, too. The medical display in his exovision showed him that his sugar levels were all over the place. There was a load of crap about toxins and blood oxygen levels, too, which he cancelled just as the nutrition and exercise recommendations came up. Stupid anachronism in the age of bionics. He set off to the saloon that the Ultra Drive team used as its social and immobile. His limbs would not move. Thankfully, neither did his mouth, which stopped him from opening his jaw and grunting in shock. He could not breathe either as something like frost ripped down through his lungs. I'd introduce you, Marius said coldly, but of all the people on this station, Troblum, you are the one who doesn't need it now, do you? Really, the cat said and grinned. Why is that? Troblum's very dark fascination kept his muscles locked tight. She was not easy to recognize. She did not have that trademark spiked hair out of all her history files. It was still short and dark, but today she wore it in a smooth swept-back style with a pair of slim copper shades perched above her forehead. She was dressed in a chic modern suit rather than the leather trousers and tight vest she used to favour. 
but that darkish complexion and wide amused grin veering on the crazy, there was no mistake. She was so much smaller than he imagined, it was confusing. She barely came up to his shoulders, yet he'd always visualized her as an Amazon. Treblum has a penchant for history, Maria said. He knows all sorts of odd facts. What's my favorite food? the cat asked. Lemon risotto with asparagus. Troblum stammered. It was the specialty dish at the restaurant you waitressed in when you were fifteen. The cat's grin sharpened. What the fuck is he? She turned to Marius for an explanation. An idiot savant with a fetish about the Starflyer War. He's useful to us. Whatever turns you on. You're in suspension, Troblum said flatly. He couldn't help the words coming out even though he was afraid of her. It was a five-thousand-year sentence. Oh, he's quite sweet, actually, the cat told Marius. She gave Troblum a lewd wink. I'll finish it one day. Promise. If you have a moment, please, Marius said to Neskia. We need to sort a proper ship out for our guest. Of course. She stood up. Oh, yes, Marius added, as though it would have no consequence. Is Troblum behaving himself? Nessia looked from Marius to Troblum. So far, so good. He's been quite helpful. Keep it up, Marius said. He was not smiling. Troblum bowed his head, unable to look at any of them. Too many people, too close, too intrusive, and one of them is the cat. He wasn't prepared for that kind of encounter today, or any day. But she was out of suspension somehow, walking around. She's in this station. His medical display flashed blue symbols down the side of his exovision, telling him his bionics were engaging, reanimating his chest muscles, calming them into a steady rhythm. It hadn't registered with him the way he had started to suck his breath down as if his throat were constricted. A small cocktail of drugs was flushed out of macrocellular glands, bringing down his heart rate. Troblum risked a glance up. His face pulled into a horrendously guilty expression. The three of them were gone, out of sight, out of the saloon. He was gathering an excessive number of curious looks from his colleagues who were still seated. He wanted to tell them to shout, It's not me you should be staring at. Instead, he felt the trembling start deep in his torso. He stood up fast, which made his head spin. Bionix reinforced his leg muscles, allowing him to hurry out of the saloon. In the corridor, his U-shadow diverted a trolleybot for him to sit on. It carried him all the way back to his quarters, where he flopped onto the bed. He loaded a nine-level certificate into the lock, even though he knew how useless that was. The cat. He lay on the bed with the cabin heating up, feeling the shock slowly ebbing. Release from the physical symptoms did nothing to alleviate the dread. Of all the megalomaniacs and psychopaths in history, the accelerators had chosen to bring her back. Troblum lay in the warm darkness for hours, wondering what they were facing that was so terrible that they had no choice but to use her. He'd always been behind the whole accelerator movement because it was such a logical one. They were nurturing an evolutionary lineage that had started with single-cell amoebas and would end with elevation to post-physical status, a necessity that could not be disputed. The other factions were wrong. It was that obvious to him. Accelerator philosophy appealed to his physicist nature. That hurtful, vicious bastard Marius was right. There was very little else in the way of personality. Forget that. It's not relevant. Because anything that has to use the cat to make it work can't be right. It just can't. Inigo's Fifth Dream Thus, because the city is deemed to be a sole entity in its own right, no human can own their residence in the traditional legal sense. However, in the fifteenth year after Ra's arrival, the newly formed Upper Council passed the first act of registry. Essentially, that means that any human can claim a residence within the city wall for their own usage. In order to register... You simply have to find a house or maisonette or room which is unoccupied, stay in it for two days and two nights, 
then register your claim with the Board of Occupancy. This claim, once notarized, will allow you and your descendants to live there until such time as they choose to relinquish it. As there are no new buildings, and can never be, the most desirable and largest homes were claimed within ten years of Ra opening the first gate. These are now the palaces of our most ancient families, the district masters, and as such have up to five generations living in them, all of them first sons, waiting to inherit the estates and seat on the upper council. The remaining available accommodation in the city today is small and badly configured for human occupation, and even this is diminishing rapidly. Thus, while districts such as Erie are basically uninhabitable, Edyard hoped he hadn't just groaned out loud from the terrible boredom. He was now as adept as any Macathran citizen at veiling his emotions from casual farsight, but if Master Solarin from the Guild of Lawyers used the word thus one more time, it was a mystery how the old man could talk so long without a break. Rumour at the station was that Master Solarin was over two hundred fifty years old. Edyard would be surprised if that were true. He certainly didn't look that young. His white hair had receded so far that the top of his skull was completely bald, something Ediard had never seen before, though the remaining strands were long enough to reach down over his shoulders. And his limbs were horribly thin and frail, while his fingers had swollen to the point where he had trouble flexing them. His vocal cords, however, suffered no such malaise. This is the end of the CD. The program continues on the next CD. Along with his fellow probationary constables, Ediard was sitting at a bench in the small hall of the Jeevans station, listening to the weekly lecture on basic Macathran law. In another two months, they'd be facing a batch of exams on the subject, which they had to pass in order to graduate. Like all of them, he found Solarin a sore test of patience. A quick scan showed that Boyd was almost asleep. Maxon's eyes were unfocused as he long-talked the girls in the dressmaker's shop at the end of the street. Cancine appeared to be paying polite attention, but Ediard knew her well enough now to see that she was as bored as he was. Dinley, though, was sitting up with rapt attention and even taking notes. Somehow Ediard could not quite laugh at that. Poor old Dinley had so much to prove to his father and uncles he undoubtedly would pass his exams with high grades. That presented the rest of them with the very real danger that, once they graduated, Dinley would be appointed their squad leader. It would be something he took very seriously. Thus the precedent was set for the lower ancillary court to hear any application to evict when a civil malfeasance is suspected of taking place within the property itself. In practice, a full hearing is unnecessary, and you may request a provisional eviction notice from the duty magistrate who acts as de facto high counsel to the lower court. And that, I'm afraid, brings this session to its successful conclusion. We will deal with the criteria for such application next week. In the meantime, I'd like you all to read Sampsol's Common Law, Volume 3, Chapters 13 through 27, by the time I return. It covers the main parameters of weapons usage within the city wall. I might even enliven our time together with a small test. How exciting that will be, eh? Until then, I thank you for your interest and bid you farewell. Solarin gave them a vague smile and removed his gold-rimmed glasses before shutting the big book he had covered with annotations. His G-monkey placed it carefully in a leather shoulder bag along with the other books the lawyer used for his lecture. Dinley stuck his hand up. Sir? Ah, my dear boy. Sadly, I am in something of a rush today. If you could possibly write your question down and submit it to my senior apprentice at the Guild, I'd be most grateful. Yes, sir. Dinley's hand came down, and his shoulders slumped with disappointment. Ediard remained seated as the lawyer walked slowly out of the hall, assisted by two G-monkeys, wondering what Solarin would actually look like, rushing somewhere. Olivan's eagle tonight. Huh? Edyard shook himself out of his absurd daydream. Maxen was standing over his desk, a smug expression on his face. Clemenza will be going. Avala said she's been asking about you. A lot. Clemenza? The one with the dark hair always tied up in a long tail. Big chest, big legs too, sadly, but he, nobody's perfect. Edyard sighed. 
It was another of the girls from the dressmakers. Maxen spent most of his time sweet-talking them or trying to set them up with his friends. Once he even tried to match Cancine with a carpentry apprentice. He would not be doing that again. No, no, I can't. I am so far behind on my law texts, and you heard what Solarin said. Remind me, there's going to be a test, Ediard said wearily. Oh, right. It's only the exam at the end which counts. Don't worry. Listen, I've got a friend in the lawyer's guild. A couple of gold shillings and he'll gift us the whole samsoles. That's cheating, Dinley said hotly. Maxon put on a suitably wounded expression. In what respect? In all respects. Dinley, he's just putting you on, Cancine said as she got up to leave. I'm being perfectly serious, Maxon said his face as innocent as a newborn's. Ignore him, she said, and gave Dinley's shoulder a gentle shove. Come on, let's find some lunch before we go out. Dinley managed one last scowl before hurrying after Kansin. He started to ask her something about the residency laws. Must be true, love, Maxon warbled cheerfully as they turned out of sight. You're evil, Ediard decided. Pure evil. Only thanks to years of practice and dedication. You know he's going to be our squad leader, don't you? Yes. He'll get his appointment by the day after the Egg Shipper Guild announces it's sculpted a G-pig that can fly. I'm serious. His grades will be way above ours. Plus his father and a whole load of his family are already constables, senior ones at that. Che isn't stupid. He knows that'll never work. Eddiard wanted to believe that Maxen was right. Um, Ediard, are you really not interested in Clemenza? Boyd asked. Oh, this is perfect, Maxon said, rubbing his hands together. Way, do you fancy your chances? Actually, yes, Boyd said with more courage than Ediard had credited him with. Good for ye. She's a lovely girl. As randy as a draken in a blood frenzy, I just happen to know. Boyd frowned. How do you know? Avila told me. Maxon said smoothly. Her last boyfriend was dumped for not having enough stamina. Boyd gave Maxon a suddenly entranced look. I'll come with you tonight, but you have to get Evela to put in a good word for me. Leave it to me, my fine friend. You're as good as shagged senseless already. Ediard rolled his eyes and promised the lady he'd be good forevermore if she'd just stop Maxon from being, well, Maxon. Come on, let's get something to eat before the constables grab it all again. Oh, yes, Boyd said, our helpful and welcoming colleagues. I hate the way they treat us. Only for another two months, that's all, Maxon said. You really think they'll show us any respect after we qualify? I don't. No, they won't, Maxon agreed. But at least we can shovel shit onto the new probationers. I know it'll make me feel better. We're not going to do that, Ediard said. We're going to talk to them, help them with problems, and make them feel appreciated. Why? Because that's what I would have liked to happen with us. That way, more people might be encouraged to join up. Haven't you counted the numbers? Not just at this station, but city-wide. There aren't enough constables in the city. People are starting to organise themselves into street associations to take on the gangs. That's going to undermine the rule of law. Great lady, you really mean it, don't you? Maxon said. Yes, Ediard said forcefully, and let them sense his mental tone so they knew he wasn't joking. I know what happens when civil government means nothing. I've seen the violence that the barbarians use when a society leaves itself open to any bastard who knows how weak it is, and that's not going to happen here. Macathran can't be allowed to tear itself apart from within. I don't know why you're worried about Dinley being squad leader. Maxon said, equally serious. You're the one, sir. Ediard was still slightly self-conscious about wearing the constable uniform in public. Only the white epaulets distinguished probationers from regular constables. The rest of it was actually real, as Maxon put it. A smart, dark blue tunic with silver buttons up the front, matching trousers, and a wide regulation leather belt containing a truncheon, two pepper gas files, a pair of iron handcuffs with a fiendishly tricky six-level lock that was just about impossible to pick with telekinesis, and a small first-aid pack. 
Under the tunic was a white shirt that Sergeant Che made very sure was indeed an unblemished white each morning. Boots were up to the individual, but they had to be black and at least ankle-high, though not over the knee. They also had to shine from polishing. The dome helmet was made from an epoxy dross silk mesh, with padding on the inside to protect the wearer's skull from a physical blow. Like the others, Ediard had bought his own dross silk waistcoat, which was supposedly tough enough to resist a bullet. Maxon had gone one step further and brought dross silk shorts. In theory, the cost was not too bad, but in practice, every constable needed two tunics and at least three shirts. Then there was a constant supply of flaked soap for the dormitory's G-chimps to wash everything. Ediard gained considerable kudos when the others found how good he was at instructing the G-chimps with laundry tasks. After the first week, Che stopped trying to find fault when they turned out in immaculate uniforms each morning. The daily routine hardly varied. In the morning they would have various physical and telepathic teamwork training sessions, followed by lectures. In the afternoon they would be taken out on patrol, under the alarmingly vigilant eye of Che. Sometimes their division captain, Ronark, would accompany them. Evenings were, theoretically, all their own. Study was advised, at least during the week. Ediard always hated it when Ronark did come out with them to check on progress. The man was in his eighties and was never going to rise any higher than his current position. His wife had left him decades before, and his children had disowned him. That left him only the constables, which he believed in with a religious fervour. Everything was done according to regulations. Variations were not permitted, and such infringements were subject to severe fines, restrictions, and demotions. Jeevan Station had one of the lowest recruitment rates in the city. Nobody paid any attention to them when Che led them out of the station at one o'clock precisely. Ronark was standing at his curving fisheye window above the big double gate, observing the shift change, clocking the patrols in and out on his ancient pocket watch. Out on the narrow pavement, a squad was double-timing back to the station, its corporal red-faced and panting as they tried to minimise their delay. Three G-dogs scampered along beside them, happy at the run. Probationary constables were not permitted Genistar support. Thankfully, Che kept a discreet silence about Ediard's G-eagle, which now lived with two others in the station's rooftop aviary. Jeevan's was a pleasant enough district, it even had a small park in the centre that a team of city G-monkeys kept in good horticultural order. There was a big freshwater pond in the middle, with exotic scarlet fish, measuring a good two feet long. They always seemed sinister to Ediard, who disliked their fangs and the way they looked up at everyone who stood by the rail watching them. But the park had a football pitch marked out, and he occasionally joined the games on weekends, when the local lads ran a small league. He enjoyed the fact that Jeevans did not house many grand families. Its buildings were on a relatively modest scale, though the mansions along Marble Canal were regal enough. The carpenters, jewelsmiths, and physicians all had their guild headquarters there. It was also the home of the Astronomical Association, which had been fighting for guild status for seven centuries, and was always blocked by the Pythia, who claimed the heavens were a supernatural realm, and astronomy verged on the heretical. Boyd, of course, was full of gossipy facts like that as they walked the winding streets. He probably knew the layout better than Che did. Che led them over a rival canal and into the smaller Silverham district. The buildings there were oddly curved, as if they used to be a cluster of bubbles that somehow had been compressed, squeezed up insect hives, Boyd called them. None of them were large enough to be palaces, but they all belonged to wealthy families, the smaller merchants and senior masters of professional guilds. The shops all sold goods far beyond Ediard's dwindling coinage. As they passed over the ornate wooden bridge, Ediard found himself walking with Cancine. So, you're not going out tonight? she inquired. Nah, I don't have much money left, and I really need to study. They were beautiful, especially those of the noble families, who seemed to use districts like Silverham to hunt in packs. They took a great deal of care about how they appeared in public, dresses that had plunging necklines, or skirts with surprising slits amid the ruffles, 
lace fabric that was translucent, hair styled to look carefree, makeup skillfully applied to emphasize smiles, cheekbones, huge innocent eyes, sparkling jewelry. He passed one gaggle of maidens in their mid-teens, who wore more wealth with the rings on one hand than he would earn in a month. They giggled coyly when they caught him staring. Then they taunted him. Can we help you, officer? Is that really your truncheon? It's a long truncheon, isn't it, Gillian? Will you use it to subdue bad people with? Emily is very bad, officer. Use it on her. Hannah, she's indecent. Officer, arrest her. Does he have a dungeon to throw her in, do you think? Third hands performed indecent tweaks and prods on private areas of his body. Edyard jumped in shock before hastily shielding himself and turning bright red. The girl shrieked amusement at his behaviour and scuttled off. Little trollops, Cansine muttered. Ah, oh, absolutely, Edyard said. He glanced back, just to make sure they were causing no trouble. Two of them were still checking him out. More wild giggles ran down the street. Edyard shuddered and faced front, hardening his expression. You weren't tempted, were you? Cansine asked. Certainly not. Edyard, you're really a great guy, and I'm glad to be in the same squad as you. But there's still a lot of the countryside in you, which is good, she hastened to add. But any family girl would eat you for breakfast and spit out the seeds before lunch. They're not nice, Edyard, not really. They have no substance. Then how come they look so gorgeous, he thought wistfully. Besides, Cansine said, they all want district master first sons for husbands, or guildsmen, or if they're desperate, militia officers. Constables don't come close, not in status or money. After the plaza, they made their way along to the markets. There were three of them just a couple of streets away from the great major canal that bordered Silverham's northern side. They were open areas, not quite as big as the plaza, packed full with stalls. The still air was heavy with scents. Edyard stared at the piles of fruits and vegetables with mild envy, as the stallholders called out their prices and promises of taste and quality. It had been a long time since he'd sat down to a truly decent meal like the kind he used to eat at the Guild compound back in Ashwell. Everything at the station hall came wrapped in pastry, and none of the G-chimps in the kitchen had been instructed in the art of making salad. Those are melancholy thoughts, Cansine said quietly. Sorry, he said, and made an effort to be alert. Che had said that markets were always rife with sneak thieves and pickpockets. He was probably right. Here, as always, the stallholders greeted them warmly with smiles and the odd gift. Apples, pears, a bottle or two. Pledges of a good deal, if they came back, off duty. They liked the constables to be visible. It discouraged pilfering. Edyard had been dismayed by the reception they had received in some districts and streets, as Che led them across the city. Sullen expressions and intimidating silences, unshielded emotions of enmity, people turning their backs on them, third hands jostling when they were close to canal banks. Che, of course, had walked on undaunted, but Edyard had been unnerved. He did not understand why whole communities would be repelled by law and order. They moved on to the second market, the one specialising in cloth and clothes. A dismaying number of young women strolled along, examining colourful fabrics and chattering happily among themselves. He kept a small shield up and did his best not to make eye contact, though there were some truly pretty girls that just begged for a second look. Maxon had no such inhibitions. He chatted happily to any girl who even glanced in his direction. You never said which district you come from, Edyard said. I didn't, did I? Cansine agreed. Sorry. You need to stop saying that as well, she said and smiled. Yes, I know. It's just that all of you are used to this. He gestured toward the crowd. I'm not. There are more people here in this market than ever lived in Ashwell. For a moment he was struck by real guilt. He thought about his home less and less these days. Some of the faces had faded from memory. Not Akim's. His never would. But Gonat now. Did he have red hair? Or was it dark brown? 
He frowned from the effort of remembering, but no clear image came. Bellis, Cansine said. My family lives in Bellis. Right, he said. Bellis was on the eastern side of the city, close to the port and directly over the great major canal from Sampaloc. They had not patrolled there yet. You've never been back to see them? No. Mother didn't approve of my becoming a constable. Oh, I'm sorry. Shame. I think she would have preferred me to take the ladies' vows. Nothing wrong with that. You really are from the countryside, aren't you? Is that bad? He said stiffly. No, I guess that's where the values this city used to have are kept alive, out there beyond the Donsori Mountains. It just gives me a shock to hear someone with convictions, that's all. You're rare in Macathran, Edyard, especially in the constables. That's why you make people uncomfortable. I do, he asked, genuinely surprised. Yeah, but you must believe in values. Why else did you join? Same as half of us. In a few years I'll shift over to bodyguard work for a district master family. They're always desperate for people with a constable's training and experience, particularly one like me. Female constables are very thin on the ground, and the noble ladies need protection as much as their husbands and sons. I can just about name my own price. Oh. The notion surprised him. He'd never considered the constables as a route to anything else, let alone something better. Who do I make uncomfortable? Well, Dinley, for a start. He believes in truth and beauty just like you, but he's a lot noisier about it. But you're stronger and smarter. Che's going to nominate you as squad leader. You don't know that. She smiled. It made him realize how attractive she actually was, something the uniform normally made him overlook. But that smile was a match for any of the silly family girls swanning around the market. Put money on it, she challenged. Of course not, he said with mock indignation. That's bound to be illegal. They both laughed. You two need a room, Maxen called over his shoulder. I know one that'll give you cheap rates. Cansine gave him a forceful hand gesture. He pulled a face. Why, it's tree. You can't take the girl out of Sampalock, but you can't take Sampalock out of the girl. Asshole, she growled. We're on patrol, Che snapped. What does that mean? Professionalism at all times, the squad muttered dutifully. Then kindly remember that and apply it. Maxon, Cansine, and Eddyard grinned at one another as they moved on to the third market, which featured crafts. Stalls displayed small items of furniture, ornaments, cheap jewellery, and alchemic potions. There was even a section selling rare animals as pets. The awnings were a uniform orange and white striped canvas arranged in hexagonal cones, with centre poles swamped by eagle vine. It was warm underneath, but the full power of the sun was held back. Edyard stretched his far sight out across the great major canal that ran the length of the city from the port district to the circle canals, where the orchard palace was situated. Isidro district was on the other side from Silverham, wedged between the back of Golden Park and the low moat. It was where the ladies' novice tree was sighted. This a good time? his mind inquired. Hello, Salrana replied with a burst of good cheer. Yes, I'm fine. We're in the garden, planting summer herbs. It's so lovely in here. A gentle image gift came with her happiness. He saw a walled garden with conical yews, marking out gravel paths. Vines and climbing roses painted the walls in bright colours. There was a broad lawn in the middle, which was unusual in Macathran. It was trimmed so neatly, Edyard wondered what kind of genistar they used to chew it down. A snow-white statue of the lady stood at one end, almost as high as the walls. She was smiling down on the novices in their white and blue robes as they skittered about with their wicker baskets full of plants. Nice. Why don't you use G-chimps to plant the herbs? Oh, Edyard, you have got to start reading more of the lady's teachings. The purpose of life is to achieve harmony with your environment. If you use genistars for everything, you establish a barrier between yourself and the world. Okay. He thought that was stupid, but clamped down tight on the emotion for fear that Salrana would sense it. She was developing quite an acute empathy these days. Where are you? 
she asked. I'm patrolling Silverham's markets. He let her see the bustle surrounding him through a group of people gathered around a couple of overturned stalls. A man lay on the floor, groaning and thrashing, blood pooling beside him. Lady! Che exclaimed. All right, stay back, give him air. He scrambled for his medical pack and knelt beside the fallen stallholder. A doctor! Che's long talk demanded. Rising over the general clamour, is there a doctor in the Silverham craft market? Wounded man! Ediard's farsight still was following the criminals. Come on! he yelled at Maxen and Cansine. Where? Maxen demanded. I've lost them. They've just reached the edge of the market, Albrick Street. I can still sense them. He ploughed through the clutter of bystanders. Ediard, no! Che yelled after them. Ediard almost stopped at the command, but he could not ignore the fleeing thieves. We can still catch them. It would be their first real arrest. So far all they had done in their four probationary months was clear drunks off the streets and break up fights. Never any real constable duty. He charged along a narrow passage between rows of stalls. Maxin and Cansin were racing after him. Come back, Che bellowed. Ignoring the sergeant sent a flash of wicked glee along Ediard's nerves. Stallholders were cheering the three probationary constables as they sped through the market. Ediard and Maxin were using their long talk to order people aside. By and large it was working. They were closing the gap on the fleeing thieves. Ediard's G-Eagle swooped low over the saff cherry trees of Albrick Street, its wings skimming inches above the waving blossoms. The four thieves were pounding along the pavement underneath the trees, heading straight for the great major canal. Their blades had been sheathed so as not to draw attention. Even so, the minds of people around them pulsed with curiosity and alarm. Where are they going? Cansine demanded. Got to be the canal, Maxen replied. There was a lot of exhilaration flooding along his long talk voice. Ediard finally saw the end of the market ahead. The striped canvas roof gave way to the hazy radiance of blossom-filtered sunlight. Can you locate any other constables? he demanded. Lady, it's all I can do to watch where I'm going, Maxen complained. What are you planning on doing? Cansine asked, all apprehension and doubts. Stopping them, Ediard said. Isn't that obvious? What is wrong with her? There's more of them, and they've got blades. I'll take them down, he growled. Her uncertainty flowed away from him, as if it were another landmark he had left behind. They were closing fast now. Albrick Street was almost deserted compared with the busy market, allowing the constables to race onward, weaving around the occasional recalcitrant pedestrian. The G-Eagle flashed over the last saff cherry tree. It showed Ediard the street, ending abruptly at the edge of the great major canal. The big waterway stretched away on both sides, cutting the city in half. Away to the west was Birmingham Pool, intersecting the outer circle canal. To the east, the high pool formed a junction with Flight Canal and Market Canal. There were only two bridges between Silverham and the Padua district on the other side, one beside each pool. Like every bridge over the Grand Major Canal, they were narrow and steep. Most people preferred to use a gondola to cross the 150-yard width of water. Several were bobbing at a mooring platform where the street ended. Got them, Ediard exclaimed. They just ran out of street. His jubilant mood suddenly dropped as the four criminals sped down the wooden steps to the platform and hopped onto a waiting gondola. It looked scruffy and badly maintained compared with the craft that normally slid along the city's waterways with dull scratched paint and a drab awning. There were two gondoliers standing at the back, each holding a pole. Oh, Honius! What? Cansine demanded. She was red-faced and breathing heavily, but keeping up. Boat, he gasped back at her. Come on, we can still catch them. Right in front of him, a very grand-looking old lady in a billowing black and white dress and her entourage of younger handmaids were leaving one of Albrick Street's high-class restaurants. His long talk demands to move did not seem to be registering with any of them. He dodged around the old lady, cursing. A third hand swatted at him, as one might strike at an annoying insect. He flashed her an exasperated look. The G-Eagle spiralled up, watching the shabby gondola ease out from the mooring platform and into the multitude of craft flocking along the big canal. 
Downmarket, the gondoliers might have been, but they knew their watercraft. With two punts available and working in harmony, they soon were moving a lot more quickly than anything else on the water. The four thieves flopped down on the benches and started laughing. Edyard, Maxin and Cancine hurtled up to the canal bank, coming dangerously close to toppling down into the water as they stopped at the top of the morning's wooden steps. Bastards! Maxin shouted at them. One of the gondoliers raised his green and blue ribboned boater in a mocking salute. They were already twenty yards downstream. Edyard knew with grim certainty that they would be going all the way down to Sampalok, and the wounded stall owner would be ruined. Help us, he called down to the gondolier who was moored below. Take us after them. This gondola was a fancy craft, its black paintwork shining in the afternoon sun, the awning embroidered with a scarlet bird crest. Somehow Ediard knew it belonged to the old woman behind them. Not a chance, pal, the gondolier called back. This is Mistress Florel's private gondola. For a moment Ediard considered shoving him into the canal and commandeering the craft to set off in pursuit, except he didn't have the first idea of how to use a punt pole. Somebody help, he called with his voice and long talk. That drew a few interested looks from the gondoliers out on the canal, but no one even asked what he wanted. A chorus of jeering carried over the water. Thirty yards away, the criminals were leaning over the gunnels to wave and gesture. Ediard stared at his tormentors with a rage that chilled his blood. He smiled back savagely. Some hint of his fury must have flashed out. Maxon and Cancine swayed back. The jeering stopped. Ediard reached out with his third hand and plucked the box from the man holding it. Hands grasped empty air in futility as he lifted it ten feet above the gondola. The thieves exerted their own third hands, trying to prise it back. Is that the best you can do? Ediard taunted. They never even managed to unsettle his grip. People on nearby gondolas watched in silence as the box drifted sedately through the air. Ediard's smile turned malicious as it landed softly at his feet. He crossed his arms and gloated. Don't come back to our district, he long talked to the departing gondola. Not ever. You're fucking dead, you little shit, came the answer. Ediard pressed his third hand down against the bow of the gondola, causing it to rock alarmingly. But it was too far away for him to capsize, and the six of them hurriedly erected a strong enough shield to deflect him. Maxon started laughing. His hand came down hard on Ediard's shoulder. Oh, lady, you are the greatest, Ediard, the absolute greatest. Did you see their faces? Yeah, Ediard admitted with a malign grin. They won't forget today, Cancine said. Heavens, Ediard, you must have frightened the life out of them. Let's hope, eh? He smiled at his friends, very content with the way they had bonded that little bit more from the shared event. A frilly parasol hit the side of his arm. Ow! It belonged to the old woman they had pushed past. In future, young man, you will display the correct courtesy due to your elders and betters, she snapped at him. You could have knocked me over the way you were charging about with complete disregard for anyone else. At my age, too. I would never have gotten up again. Ah, uh, yes, madam, sorry. Mistress Florel, she said her wavery voice rising an octave with indignation. Don't you pretend you don't know who I am? Ediard could hear Maxin chortling behind him. It was muffled as if a hand were over his mouth. Yes, Mistress Florel. Her eyes narrowed with suspicion. Ediard thought she looked at least as old as Master Solorin. I shall be reporting you to my nephew, she said. There was a time in this city when the constabulary had decent people in its ranks— that time is clearly over. Now get out of my way. He wasn't actually in her way, but he took a step back anyway. She brushed past with a swirl of her tent-like skirt to descend the steps to the mooring platform. Her entourage followed with immaculately shielded minds. A couple of the handmaids flashed him amused grins. They all settled in the gondola. See, Maxon said, sliding his arm around Ediard's shoulders. That's our true reward, the respect of a grateful populace. Who is that? Ediard whined. That set Maxon to laughing again. 
You really don't know, do you? Cansine said incredulously. No. Among other family connections, Mistress Florel is the mayor's aunt. Oh, I suppose that's not good then. No. Every mayor for the last century is some relative or other to her. She basically decides who the Grand Council will elect. Ediard shook his head and checked the gondola below. Mistress Florel had vanished under the awning. The gondolier gave him a wink and cast off. Let's get back, Ediard said. A cheerful Maxon bent over to pick up the box. He shot Ediard another look as he... He turned the lock dial with several precise twists, and the lid popped open. It's all here, he said with a smile. He showed the open box to the market. All of it. They brought it back. The constables brought it back. Someone started clapping, and soon was joined by the onlookers. Whistles of approval split the air, and then the three constables abruptly were surrounded by the men and woman in green aprons. Their hands were shaken, their backs were pummeled. A beaming monroll gave Maxen a hug, then moved on to Cansine. Ediard too was swept up in his embrace. Thank you. Thank you. Sergeant Che, a deep voice boomed. The stallholders fell quiet as Cetasis came forward. Ediard had seen him a couple of times before, normally when he was complaining to Che about the infrequency of constable patrols in the market. Cetasis was the head of the Silverum Stallholders Association, and through that had a seat on the City Traders' Council. He had almost as much political influence as a guild council master. Did I hear right? Cetasis asked. Did the constables finally come to our aid? For once, Che looked uncertain. We were able to assist. He stopped glaring at Ediard and produced an almost sympathetic expression. I was about to ask the more reckless members of my patrol to report what happened on the chase. Reckless members, eh? Cetasis grinned at the three probationary constables. Yes. You are young, aren't you? Good for you. If we had more constables with balls, we wouldn't be in the sorry state we are. Your pardon, my girl. Granted, Cansine said graciously. Come then, tell me what happened on the chase. Did you manage to accidentally drop the scum into the canal? No, sir, Ediard said. I'm afraid they got away on a gondola. They headed down toward the port. Something made him hold back from mentioning that his G-Eagle was showing him that the thieves already had passed through Forest Pool and were approaching Sampalock. None of the gondoliers would help us, Maxon blurted. We asked them. Ha! <laughs> Fill rats in human guise, Cetasis grunted. Still, you did a good job. I can't remember the last time a constable returned stolen goods. He gave Che a meaningful glance, and the sergeant's lips tightened. You have my thanks. I'm sure my fellow stallholders will show their appreciation next time your patrol ventures into the market. Ediard knew he was grinning like a fool. It didn't matter. So were Maxen and Cansine. Then he finally caught sight of Dinley, who looked like his closest family had just died. Once the doctor announced that Cavine would be all right, Che declared that the patrol was over and they were going back to Jeevan's station. He led them out of the market without another word. Ediard couldn't work out if they were in serious trouble. The sergeant's mind was perfectly shielded. Maxen shot Boyd a direct long-talk query, which he shared with Ediard and Cansine. What did Che say? Nothing much, Boyd replied, equally furtive. He was yelling for you to stop. When none of you came back, he just concentrated on helping the stallholder. I had to hold the flesh together to slow the bleeding. Lady, I thought I was going to faint. There was so much blood. Monroe said they hacked him a couple of times with those blades to make him let go of the box. I wish I'd gone with you instead, but I just hesitated for that first second. I'm sorry. Don't be, Ediard said. The more I think about it, the more stupid I was. Che was right. What? Maxon exclaimed out loud. He glanced at Che, but the sergeant did not seem to notice. There was four of them, and they had blades. Six, if you count the gondoliers. We could have been killed, and it would be my fault. We got the box back. Luck, that's all pure luck. The lady smiled on us today. She won't tomorrow. We have to act like proper constables. Stay together, work as a team. 
Maxon shook his head in dismay. Edyard gave Cansin an apologetic shrug. I went with you, she told him quietly. I got just as carried away. Don't try to claim this is all your fault. He nodded. Up ahead, Che was marching on, not looking around, his back rigid. Beside him, Dinlay was avoiding any communication with his friends. When they had walked back to the market from the Great Major Canal, the three of them had been triumphant. Now that whole mood was badly inverted. Right there, Edyard felt like turning around and heading out of the city. It was going to be awful back at the station. He just knew it. That's not the kind of attitude the returning hero is supposed to wear, Salrana told him. Her long talk conveyed a lot of concern. Ediard tipped his head up to give the sky a sheepish smile. I'm sorry. We did it, though. We actually chased off some thugs from a gang. I know. I far-sighted you the whole time. You were terrific, Ediard. I wish I'd chosen to be a constable. Our sergeant doesn't share your opinion. And what's worse, he's right. We didn't behave properly. Have you told the stallholder that? That's not the point. Yes, it is, Edyard. You did a good thing today. It doesn't matter how you did it. You helped someone. The lady saw that, and she'll be pleased. Sometimes you have to do the wrong thing, he mouthed silently. Some good cheer returned as he tried to imagine what Akim would have to say about all Che's rules and procedures. It would be short and very succinct, he knew. What? Salrana asked. Nothing. But thank you. I'm going to go back to the station now and do whatever it takes to put things right with my sergeant. I'm always so proud of you, Edyard. Talk to me tonight. Tell me what happens. I will. Promise. When they got back to the station, Che's temper seemed to have vanished. Edyard was expecting to be shouted at as soon as they passed through the big gates. Instead, Che stood there with a genuinely weary expression on his worn face. For once, his shielding had slipped enough for Edyard to sense just how tired his thoughts were. Small hall, he told the squad. The others dutifully trooped into the building. Edyard waited until they were through the doorway. It was my fault, he told Che. I encouraged the others to follow me. I didn't listen to you, and I ignored procedure. Che studied him, his mind becoming inscrutable again. I know. Now would you like to guess what will happen if flashing him a mock indignant smile? How does he do that? It's not what he says. It's his whole attitude. And why can't I do it? Edyard sat back to give his friend a critical examination. Maxon was sitting in the middle of a small couch with Evola on one side and Nicolard on the other. Both girls were leaning in toward him. They laughed at his jokes and gasped and giggled when he told them what had happened in the market, an extravagant tale of thrills and bravery Edyard didn't recognize. He supposed Maxon was quite handsome, with his light brown hair and flat jaw. His brown eyes were constantly filled with amusement that bordered on nefarious, which was an additional attraction. It helped that he always dressed well when they went out, this night he had pulled on fawn-coloured trousers cut from the softest suede, belted by woven black strands of leather. His sky-blue satin shirt just showed under a dark emerald frock coat. See, I'd never have the courage to wear a combination like that, but he carries it off perfectly, the epitome of a grand family's junior son. In fact, the rest of them looked quite drab in comparison, Ediard used to be quietly pleased with his own black jacket, tailored trousers, and knee-high boots. Now he had been relegated to the poor friend whom Maxon's girls felt sorry for and tried to pair up with their own charity case girlfriend. On which note, Ediard tried not to stare at Boyd, who was sitting on the opposite side of their table, his face bewitched. Clemenza was next to him, chattering away about her day. She was easily the same height as Boyd and must have been close in weight, too. Ediard could not help the way his eyes always slipped down to the front of her very low-cut dress every time she bent over, which was suspiciously frequent. The waitress brought over the tray of beer Maxen had ordered. Dinley immediately reached for his tankard. Ediard fumbled with the money pouch in his pocket. "'Oh, no, my round,' Maxen said. His third hand deposited some coins on the empty tray. "'Thank you,' he said sincerely. The waitress smiled. 
Evola and Nicola pressed in closer. Ediard sighed. He's always so polite as well. Is that what does it? Boyd, Maxon called out loudly. Close your mouth, man. You're drooling. Boyd snapped his jaw shut and glared at Maxon. A bright flush crept up his face. You pay him no heed, Clemenza said. She brought a hand up to Boyd's cheek, turned his head and kissed him. A girl likes it when a man pays attention. Edyard thought Boyd might faint with happiness. Got to go, Dinley muttered. Back in a minute. He stood up and swayed unsteadily, then headed for the archway at the back of the saloon where the washrooms were. The fact that there were toilets on an upper floor was one of the many revelations about city buildings that had taken Ediard time to get used to. But then, a tavern that sprawled over many floors was also a novelty, as was the pale orange light radiating out of the ceiling that was nearly as bright as daylight. The first night they had visited the Olivens Eagle, he had wondered why there was no straw on the floor. Life in the city was so civilized. Sitting there in the wall must have been why he had said it. Cancine said nothing for a while as they walked back along the long, nearly deserted street. I'm not looking for anyone right now, she said solemnly. I just broke up with a man. We were engaged. It ended badly. He wanted a nice traditional girl, one who knew her place. I'm sorry. But I have to say it's his loss. Thank you, Ediard. They walked on a while, shadows shifting as they passed under the bright orange light patches on the outside of the buildings. I don't know what it is about you, she said quietly. I'm not just talking about how strong your third hand is. You stand out. You're what I imagine the sons of noble families are supposed to be like, or were like, before they got so rich and fat. Nothing noble about me. Nobility doesn't come from a bloodline, Edyard. It comes from within. Where was your village? Ashwell, in the Rulan province. Doesn't mean anything, I'm afraid. I don't know any geography beyond the Aguru plain. Ashwell was a long way past there, right on the edge of the wild lands. I'll show you on a map if I can find one. It took a year for us to travel here. Gift me. What? Oh. Edyard concentrated trying to find a recollection that would do his home justice. Spring, he decided, when the trees were bursting into life, the sky was bright and the winds were warm. He and some other children had gone outside the rampart walls and taken the long route to the top of the cliffs, where they looked down on the cosy buildings sheltering below. He heard a soft pull of breath and realized how heavily involved in the memory he had become, lacing it with melancholy. Oh, Edyard, it's so beautiful. What happened? Why did you leave? It was attacked by bandits, he said stiffly. In all the time he had spent in the station dormitory, he never had told his new friends the truth about Ashwell. All they knew was that he'd lost his family to bandits. I'm sorry, she said. For once she dropped the veil around her thoughts, allowing him to sense the sympathy. Was it very bad? Selrana and I survived, and five others. Oh, lady, Ediard. Her hand held his arm. Don't worry, I've come to terms with it, except for losing my master, Akim. I still miss him. The emotional currents welling up in his thoughts were both unexpected and alarmingly strong. He truly thought he had put all the sentiment and mourning behind him. Now all he'd done was picture his old home, and the feelings were rushing back, as strong as the day it had happened. You should talk to one of the lady's mothers. They give excellent counsel. Yeah, maybe. He made his legs work again. Come on. I have a notion Che isn't going to be too gentle with us tomorrow. The G-monkeys laid Dinley out on his mattress and pulled a thin blanket over him. He never woke, just groaned and shuffled around a bit. Edyard could not be bothered to take his friend's boots off. He was suddenly incredibly tired himself. He barely managed to remove his own boots and trousers. The dormitory's G-chimps scampered about, collecting his clothes for the laundry. Of course, now that he actually got the starship's cabin had extruded, testing the flexibility and strength of his restored upper torso, pulling weight, pushing weight, bending, twisting, working up a sweat as endurance was evaluated, measuring the oxygen consumption of the new flesh, blood flow rate, nerve speed. 
You knew Katuks could do it, she whined, so you must know how long it'll take. Aaron gritted his teeth as gravity shifted off vertical and increased, forcing him to pull the handle he was gripping while stretching at the same time. Bionix reported that the tendons were approaching their tear limit. His patients also was undergoing a strenuous workout. They had been back in the artful dodger for fifteen hours, a time Corilin had devoted to drinking and moaning. She now considered handing over Inigo's memories to be a terrible betrayal, not to mention a bad idea, a really bad idea. Stupid, actually, as she kept saying. So it'll have, like, a mini Inigo hanging around inside its own brain. Aaron took a look at the oxygen usage in his shoulder muscles. The levels were only a couple of points off those of the original muscle. Not bad for a couple of days. Drugs and bionics had done what they could. The rest of it was the result of good old-fashioned exercise. A decent calisthenics program should see the levels equalize over the next week or so. He shut down the gym. Something like that, he said. Corilin blinked at the unexpected answer. She rolled over on the couch and reached for the pitcher of Tassimian Margarita. So you ask the mini Inigo a question, and Katux answers it for us. Yes. What a load of bullshit. We'll see. He slipped his T-shirt off and examined his torso. The membrane was starting to peel off. Underneath the new skin was tender, but at last the color was deepening to the same shade as the rest of him. I'm going to take a shower, he said. You're shaping up good, she giggled. Need a hand in there? Aaron rolled his eyes. No, thanks. He now had a strong theory of his own why Inigo had run away from Living Dream, and it wasn't anything to do with last dreams or the pressure of being idolized by billions. Maybe she only turned into this after he left. The gym sank into the wall, and there was a moment's pause before the shower cubicle extended out from the same section. He slipped his shorts off and stepped in as Corilin let out a wolf whistle. He must be recuperating. His cock was stirring. But if Cuttox did come up with a notion of where the reluctant messiah was hiding out, his shipmate would be more necessary than ever. He turned the spore temperature down as low as it would go and thought of other things. Unfortunately, with a memory that did not reach back past Ethan's appointment, he did not have much to mull over except his odd dreams. That horse ride. He'd been young, so it must have been his childhood. It seemed pleasant enough. This is the end of the CD. The program continues on the next CD. After he had showered, they carried on their research into the odd Rael who had agreed to help them. Clued in by what it had said, they had sent their U-shadows into the Unisphere to search for files on the history of Far Away during the Starflyer War. The first surprise was to find just over a million files on the period available. It took eight hours for them to filter it down to relevant and useful information. Even then, there was no direct evidence Katux had been there. There were endless documents on Bradley Johansson's team of guardians chasing the Starflyer back to its lair, and how they joined up with an odd security team that Nigel Sheldon assigned to help them. Admiral Kaim was one of them, of course. That was a common history text. His audacious hyperglider flight over Mount Herculaneum and subsequent rescue by Nigel himself, Anna, the Judas, Oscar the Martyr, Paula Mayo and the Navy Interdiction Squad, Cat's Claws. I didn't know it was Nigel who originally sent the cat to far away. Corilin exclaimed. What was he thinking of? She was sober again after a meal and a couple of alcohol binder aerosols. Aspects of the search seemed genuinely to interest her. Be fair, he couldn't see the future. There were some appendixes that claimed the pursuit had been aided by an alien, but the context was strange. The Bose Motile was known to be part of Nigel's secret clique at the time. There were no references to a Rael. One file said the Barsoomian group helped Johansson because he had brought their genetic holy grail to far away. Again, there was nothing about what that grail actually was. Let's try another angle, Aaron said. 
He told his youth shadow to find all files relating to a Commonwealth citizen called Tiger Pansy around the time of the Starflyer War. The cabin's portal projected a rather startling image. No way, Cory Lynn said. Aaron stared at the woman in equal disbelief. She was a complete mess. Terrible hair, bad facial reprofiling, ruining the symmetry of her eyes, nose and lips, with appalling cosmetics making them appear worse. Ridiculous breast enlargements, tight short clothes that no girl over twenty could get away with wearing, let alone this one, who must have been close to rejuvenation time again. Signed to the Wayside Production Company on Oak Tier. Cory Lynn read off her exovision, appeared in a large number of their, aha, uh -huh, productions, left them in the last year of the Starflyer War. No subsequent information. Nothing. No residency listing on any planetary cybersphere. No records of rejuvenation treatment. No body loss certificate. She simply dropped out of sight. Aaron shook himself and cancelled the projection. Easy enough at the time. There was a mass migration from the Lost Twenty-Three Worlds, which the Primes had invaded. After that, it got even more chaotic. Coincidence? The Rael are not known for their lies. Maybe Katuks did marry her. She certainly looks the emotional type. That's not quite how I'd describe her, Corilin muttered. And how did she get to far away? The planet was virtually cut off for decades until the Star Line started flying there. She must have been with the Johansson team. I don't think it's relevant. No, but it's interesting. Why would Ariel go there? You want to ask? She shook her head. No, too intimidated. I'll ask for you. No, let's just drop it. You're right, though. It is interesting. I was obviously given the correct information. Katux helps humans. He said he used to. Until Tiger Pansy was killed. By the cat, no less. That'd be enough to shock anyone out of their dependency routine, no matter how delightful and ingrained. Yes, well, thank Ozzy, Paul and Mayo finally caught her. Yeah, and in about another four thousand years we can all share the joy of her coming out of suspension. Oh, I won't be around for that, no matter what. Katux knew Paul and Mayo, Aaron said. I wonder if that's relevant. How could it be? He waited for a moment to see if his subconscious produced any clues. It didn't. No idea. The artful Dodger smart court told them the High Angel was calling. Please prepare for teleport, the alien starship told them. Oh, hell, Corilyn said as she clambered to her feet. I really don't like this. The cabin vanished. Once again they were standing in the large circular chamber, facing Cuttocks. Part, she wrinkled her nose in distaste. Aaron bowed to the Rael. Thank you for obliging us. You are welcome, the big alien whispered. Were you successful? I have lived through Inigo's early life. It was not that distinguished. Aaron looked straight at Katux, avoiding Corilin. His guillemots revealed the peak that the last remark had triggered in her mind. Nonetheless, it must have provided you with an understanding of his behavior patterns. Guilt drives him. Guilt? He spent his whole life hiding what he was from everyone, his family, those he loved, and his enemies. Are you talking about the Protectorate? Yes. He was aware of their constant surveillance. Toward the end, he took a perverse enjoyment in maintaining the illusion that he was an ordinary advancer, but such a lie weighed heavily on him. It was one of the main reasons he volunteered for duty at Centurion Station. All right. I can buy into that scenario. Given the circumstances of his later life, where do you think he might have gone? Hanko. Which wasn't the kind of answer Aaron was bracing himself for. Not even close. The second 47 world. Yes. I know that was where Anagaska's population originated from, but they were forced off because it became uninhabitable after the prime attack. There's nothing there. Not any more. Inigo was always fascinated by what he considered his true ancestral home. Katuk said, Remember, he did not belong in Anagaska's advancer culture. Hanko gave him a psychological ground point, amplified by an ancestor obsession rooted in his psyche due to the loss of his father so soon after his birth. Such a trauma affects any child, 
hired as much as advancer, especially when the event is regarded with such bitterness by his mother. A wound she kept open, unintentionally or otherwise. Correct. Hanko provided the perfect solution to someone as displaced as Inigo. A real place, yet at the same time unattainable. The illusion what she had been expecting, plenty of motivational talk, a few anecdotes, a load of financial services product placement, and an excess of toothy smiles during the pauses for applause and laughter. Araminta even clapped along with the rest of them. It was all standard stuff, but there were some nuggets among the debris. She was interested in his early years, how to make the jump from a small operation like hers up to a more corporate level. According to Lycan, advancement was all a matter of risk and how much of it one was prepared to take. He mentioned self-confidence a lot, along with determination and hard work. Araminta wondered if he'd ever met Laro. Now that would be an interesting conversation. Lycan finished and was provided with a standing ovation. Araminta got to her feet with the rest of them and applauded half-heartedly. She wished he had been more specific, maybe given some case study examples. The chairman of the Colwyn Small Business Association thanked their distinguished guest and announced that refreshments were available in the function room outside. By the time Araminta made it out of the auditorium, her fellow small business owners were forming tight little groups to chatter away to one another while they gulped down the free drinks and canapes. From the snippets she overheard on her way to the bar, the majority ran virtual companies, Talk was about expansion curves and cross-promotional market penetration and share options and when to merge. Men glanced at her as she walked past. They were welcoming smiles, even a few pings to her U-shadow, offering compliments and invitations. Her U-shadow did not respond. Pings were so adolescent. If you want to take me out to dinner, have the courage to ask me to my face. She had chosen a deep turquoise dress that complemented her hair colour. Strictly speaking, the neckline was low and the hem high for a business occasion, but she now had the confidence to buck convention, at least on a small level. Independence and all that exposure to Cressida had given her that. Pear water, she told the barman. Interesting choice. She turned to find Lycan standing behind her. For someone so rich, his appearance was puzzling. The skin on his face was slightly puffy with flushed cheeks, as if he were permanently out of breath. His biological age was higher than usual, fixed in his late thirties rather than the mid-twenties everyone else favoured. The clothes he wore were always expensive, but never quite gelled, as if he got his dress sense from advertisements. His jacket with a shark-skin shimmer was chic, but not with that purple shirt and green neck twister, and the brown shoes were best worn when gardening. "'I have to work later tonight.' she said, can't afford lack of judgment from alcohol. Good self-control. I like that. Thank you, she said levelly. I got the impression you weren't impressed tonight. People nearby were looking their way discreetly. Lycan's voice was as forceful as it had been on the podium. That at least gave the impression of a strong personality. Araminta sipped her pear water, wondering how to play this. I was hoping for more detail, she told him. What kind of detail? Come on. You paid for your ticket. You're entitled. Okay. Small company. Doing well. Needs to step up a level. Do you reinvest profits and ride a gradual expansion with each project slightly larger than the last? Or do you take a bank loan and jump ten levels? How small a company? One woman band? Supported by some bots? Company product? Property development? Good choice for a startup. High profitability relative to scale? There is a ceiling, though, especially with one person. After the first three properties, there should be enough profit to take on more staff. With that, you move on from one property at a time and start multiple developments. Timing for that has never been better. Property is the hot item here today, thanks to Living Dream. Everything is relative. With that demand, a developer has to buy high. Then this developer should buy a whole street that's in decline. It's a profit multiplier. The individual unit prices rise because you've taken the entire street up market and made it desirable. That's a big step. The level of risk you are prepared to undertake is proportional to your growth potential. 
If you don't take it, you are declaring this far and no further. That will define your life. I don't think you want that. Question. Would you advise the staff expansion be accomplished by becoming multiple? No. Why not? Going multiple only seems like a solution to a solo act. Ultimately, it's a lifestyle choice rather than a business one. Ask yourself what you can accomplish by being multiple that you can't by good aggressive management. You came to listen to me tonight, so I know you're already thinking ahead, thinking big. Property is a foundation stone for a corporate empire, a good one. I still have a vast property portfolio, but to achieve real market dominance you must diversify and interlock your interests. That's what Sheldon did. He used his interstellar transport monopoly as a cash source to fund industrial, commercial and financial enterprises on a hundred worlds. At the time of the Starflyer War, he was effectively emperor of the Commonwealth. Do you want to be our emperor? Yes. Araminta was slightly shaken by his bluntness. She thought he was somehow calling her bluff. Why? Because it's a position where you can do whatever you want. The ultimate freedom. Isn't that what we all strive for? With power comes responsibility. That's what politicians tell you when they want your vote. There's a difference between political power and financial power, especially out here in the external worlds. I'd like to demonstrate that to you. How would you do that? Come and stay with me at my home for a weekend. See firsthand what I've achieved. Decide if that's what you want for yourself. What about your wives? It was common knowledge how staunchly committed he was to replicating his idol's ideology and life, including, or perhaps especially, the harem. What about them? Won't they mind my visit? No. They'll be joining us in bed. That'll teach me. You can't be more direct to my face than that. She was pleased with the way she kept her reaction in check. No startled expression, no giveaway body language, squaring the shoulders, straightening the back. In effect, she was telling him she could hold her own against him any day. Not finish. Her gaze was drawn to the face suspended behind the wall. Tiger Pansy's silly, carefree grin looking hauntingly back at her, obviously captured at a moment when the woman had been blissfully happy. I know, the Rael whispered. It is not a return to my addiction, I assure you. There would be few Rael indeed who could refuse the opportunity of experiencing Inigo's mind. He dreams the void, Paula. The void. That evil enigma bedevils us to a degree which humans will never appreciate. All right. Paula ran her hand back through her hair, making an effort to ignore the uncomfortable personal side effects the case was kicking up. Inigo's memory cell was stolen from a clinic on Anagaska. Why did you help, Aaron? I did not know the memories were stolen. He arrived in an ultra-drive starship. It was intimated that he was a representative of ANA governance. In truth, he never confirmed that. I am sorry. I believe I was had. How stupid. Me of all Rael. The deception was quite simple. Don't beat yourself up over it. Happens to the best of us. So what did he want to know? He asked me to guess where Inigo might be. Clever man. Which is curious in itself. There aren't many humans who knew of your little problem. One of them must have joined up with the faction. So what did you tell him? I guessed Inigo might be on Hanko. Hanko? But it's just a radioactive ruin. She stopped, examining the idea. But, Earth aside, it is his ethnic birth world. Still, an odd choice. Are you aware he was born higher? No, I was not. That has never been on any file. Are you sure? Katux's biggest tentacles waved in agitation. I am forty years of his early life, Paula. Through me you are talking to the young Inigo. If ANA governance and I didn't know, then it's pretty certain very few other people did either. That changes his whole profile. No wonder nobody could ever find him. As a hire, he has much greater personal resources. Will you go after Aaron and Gorilin? I'm not sure. I hadn't envisaged Aaron being so close to finding Inigo. But even if he is on Hanko, it'll take Aaron a while to actually track him down. 
I need to consult with ANA governance on this. Thank you for helping, Kotux. You are welcome, Paula. Always. She was on the verge of asking to be teleported back to her ship, but she hesitated. What do the Rael think of the pilgrimage? That it is incredibly foolish. Opening the Dyson Alpha barrier was one thing, but this takes your obduracy to a whole new level. Why does a and governance allow it? Paula sighed. I have no idea. Humans always want to test their boundaries. It's an instinctive thing. It is a stupid thing. We're not as old as you. We don't have species-wide wisdom, let alone responsibility. Higher humans do. The tenet of universal responsibility is the root of their culture, but as individuals they have a long way to go. And as for ANA, it's like the intellectual equivalent of primordial ooze in there. Who knows what's going to come wiggling out triumphantly at the end of the day. I'm beginning to doubt ANA governance's ability to keep order. Are you serious? I don't know, she admitted. This whole event has me badly troubled. There are too many people playing with catastrophic unknowns. Part of me, the old part that worships order, wants to shut down the entire pilgrimage project. It's obviously a monstrous folly. Yet the liberal side of me agrees that these people have a right to seek happiness, especially when nothing in the Commonwealth appeals to them. It's indicative of our cultural heritage that we cannot provide a home for everyone. But Paula, their right to seek the solution of perfection in the void will endanger the rest of the galaxy. That right cannot be permitted. Quite. And yet we don't have conclusive proof that the void will respond the way you claim. Katux was silent, as if startled. You doubt us, Paula. Humans need to know things for themselves. It's our nature. Katux, I understand that. I am sorry for you. We're being too melancholy. I give you my word I'm working to try to sort out this mess. As always, you are honorable. I hope you succeed. I would not like to see our two species fall into conflict. We won't. The High Angel teleported Paula back into the cabin of the Alexis Denken. As in all modern starships... The cabin could provide her with every physical necessity, like a hotel room with a particularly bad view. She ordered a plane chair and took her guitar out of the storage locker. Music was something she had come to late in life. As her genetically ordained compulsions were erased slowly, she found her cultural horizons expanding. Art was a whole area she could never quite appreciate. She was always looking for rationalist explanation in every work. Literature was a lot more satisfactory. Stories had a point, a resolution. Not that there were many books released into the Unisphere these days. Current writers tended to produce outlines and scripts for sensory dramas, but the classics were enjoyable enough. The only genre she tended to shy away from was crime and thrillers. Poetry she ignored as an absurd irrelevance. Music, though, had something for every mood, every place. She took a great deal of pleasure from it, listening to everything from orchestral arrangements to singer-songwriters, jazz to Gaia Nature tonality, choral to star sphere dance. The Alexis Denkin often would streak between star systems, reverberating to the sounds of Rachmaninoff or Pink Floyd or Dealey KTC. Paula sat back and started to pluck a few chords at random, then gradually dropped into Johnny Cash's The Wanderer, she did not try to sing. There were some limits in life one just had to accept. Instead, the smart core projected the man in black into the cabin, and he started to croon along to her melody. The song helped her think. She knew she should be heading straight for Oracum, or even Hanko, but she was feeling a lot more troubled by Cuttox's last comment than she ought to have been. It seemed as though this whole pilgrimage situation was designed to disrupt her judgment and objectivity. That, or I'm just getting lonely and uncertain in my old age. Paula finished strumming. The man in black gave her a forlorn look, and she waved her hand dismissively. The smart core cancelled the projection. Her you shadow opened a link to Casimir, someone who did have empathy for her position. What can I do for you? he asked. I'm at the High Angel. 
Aaron gave Inigo's memory cell to Katox. Someone knew about our friend's predilection. Did Katox review it? Oh, yes. Katox told Aaron that Inigo was probably hiding out on Hanko. Interesting. Presumably that's where the artful dodger, a.k.a. the Alini, is heading? Yes. Another ultra-drive ship arrived in system just before the artful dodger departed. The Navy commander at High Angel said it stood off in the cometary belt and left in hot pursuit. Does every faction have ultra-drive ships? she asked indignantly. Justine caught the delivery man using a hawking M-sync on a Revelo. So she told me. I consider it significant that the factions are openly using such technology. This whole pilgrimage event could well be the trigger for an irreversible culture split within the human race. Whose side will you take? The Navy was created by ANA to protect humans from stronger, hostile aliens. That is what it will continue to do until I am removed from my position. If ANA chooses to leave the physical universe, I will stay behind and ensure that whatever sections of us remain continue to receive that protection. Is that a side, do you think? No, but it's certainly a plan. Are you going after Aaron? Not immediately. Can you provide some protection for Hanko and Inigo, if he's there? I will observe and advise you of developments. But you know the Navy cannot intervene directly in the internal affairs of Commonwealth citizens. Despite the scale of the problem, that's what this is. Paula was thrown by the answer. She was expecting Casimir to be a lot more helpful. A thousand years ago, I stuck to the rules, too. No good comes of it. You need to bend a little, Casimir. You and other representatives exist, so I don't have to. You handle the grey areas while I deal in black and white. There's no such thing. Nonetheless, I operate within a set of rules that I will not break. I understand. Just do what you can, please. Of course. The artful dodger dropped out of hyperspace 5,000 kilometers above Hanko's equator. Sensors examined the surrounding environment, bringing up several amber warning symbols and even a couple of red ones. The local star had an abnormally large number of sunspots chasing across its surface, producing a dangerously thick solar wind. Below the starship's metallic purple hull, a global cloud blanket reflected the star's sharp white glow back into space, its uniform glare broken only by the vast aural streamers that lashed across the stratosphere. Above the atmosphere, monstrous arches of violet fluorescence soared far beyond geosynchronous orbit, engorged Van Allen radiation belts that choked the planet with a hurricane of high-energy particles. The artful Dodger's hull sparked with a corpuscent discharge as it slid across into a high-inclination orbit. Welcome to hell, Aaron muttered as he monitored the images from outside. The ship began to probe through the clouds with high-resolution Heiss radar sweeps, standard radar, magnoscan, quantum signature receptors, and electromagnetic sensors, revealing the lay of the frozen land underneath. Several comm beacon signals appeared on the emerging cartography, the only indication of activity on this bygone world. They broadcast the official channels of the restoration team, asking all arriving ships to make contact. Corilin watched the images in the portal with a mournful face as the starship flew around and around the planet, building up a detailed survey of the surface. Twelve hundred years after the prime attack, glaciers still were advancing out of the polar regions. I can't believe Inigo was ever attracted to this place, she said. You heard Katox. He enjoyed the idea of an ancestral homeworld. Even if he came here, he'd take one look and leave. There's nothing here. There are restoration teams down there even today, Aaron said, waving at the little scarlet lights dotted across the map. The beacons acted as crude relays across continents, the only communication net on the planet. That's got to be the biggest lost cause in the galaxy, she said. You're probably right. Seventeen of the second 47 worlds have officially closed their restoration projects, and the remainder are winding down. Budgets get reduced every year. Nobody kicks up a fuss about it anymore, not like the first couple of centuries after the war. After ten orbits, the smart court had mapped all the exposed land lurking below the eternal cloud. 
Sensors had located 23 centers of dense electromagnetic activity. The largest was a force field dome in the center of Kajani, the old capital city. All the others were little more than clumps of machinery and buildings scattered across the dead tundra of three continents. No thermal sensor could begin to penetrate the cloud, so we had no way of telling if any of the outposts were occupied. There didn't seem to be any capsules in flight. Electrical activity in the air was strong, interfering with several sensor fields. No way of telling if he's down there, Aaron said. Not from up here. I can't even see what ships are parked under the force field. What were you expecting? Nothing more than this. I'm just scouting the territory before we go in to make sure there are no surprises. Corilin rubbed her arms, as if the cold from the planet was seeping into the cabin. So what's our cover story this time? No point in one. It's not like the teams are heavily armed. So you just shoot them one at a time until they give him up to us. He gave her an annoyed stare. We'll tell them that you're searching for a former lover. He changed his name and profile to forget you, but you've tracked him down here. All very romantic. That makes me look like a complete loser. Oh, dear. He sneered and told the smart corps to call the beacon at Kajani. It took several minutes to get a reply from the shielded base. Eventually, a very startled restoration project director called Ansan Purala came online to give them landing authority. The artful dodger sank deftly through the three kilometers of the upper cloud layer. Winds of two hundred kilometers per hour buffeted the hull with nearly solid clumps of grey mist, while lightning clawed furiously at the force field. Eventually, they cleared the base of the layer into a stratum of super-clear air, and the outside temperature plummeted. A gloomy panorama opened beneath them. Black, ice-locked land was smeared with long dunes of snow. Denuded of vegetation, every geographical feature was shaded in stark monochrome. Long braids of grubby cloud chased across the dead features. It must have been terrifying, Corrie Lynn said sadly. The Primes dropped two flare bombs into the star, Aaron told her. The only way the Navy could knock them out was by using quantum busters on the corona. Between them, they produced enough radiation to slaughter every living cell a million times over. Hanko's atmosphere absorbed the energy until it reached saturation point, which triggered a superstorm, which in turn threw up enough cloud to cover the planet and kick off an ice age. And the star still hasn't stabilized. Even if it did, it wouldn't matter. The radiation has completely destroyed the biosphere. According to the files, there's some marine life that's still alive in the deepest parts of the oceans, but that's all. The land is as sterile as a surgical chamber. Check out those radiation levels, and we're still five kilometers high. I didn't appreciate what a scale this war was fought on. They were going to genocide us. The words were almost painful to speak. It had been a fearful time. Aaron shuddered. How do I know what the war was like? A deeper instinct assured him he was not that old. The artful dodger continued its descent through the rampaging lower clouds, blazing with solar brilliance as it sloughed off whip-like tendrils of electrical energy. At this altitude, the wind speeds had dropped to 150 kilometers per hour but the air density meant the ship's ingrav units were straining to hold them stable against the pressure. Corrie Lynn tried not to look alarmed as the starship began to shake. High-velocity ice crystals shattered against the force field as an amuck cloud braid hurtled around them. The crunch of disintegrating ice could be heard inside the cabin. Okay, then. This is why there aren't any capsules flying down here, Aaron muttered. His exovision was showing him the force field dome below, altering its permeability index to allow them through. The wind speed was now less than a hundred kilometers. Outside the dome, there was very little evidence of the city remaining. In its time, Kajani had been home to three million people. Its force field had warded off the storms in the days following the prime attack, protecting the wormhole station so that the planet's population could be evacuated to Anagaska. The process had taken over a month, with government vehicles transporting refugees from outlying counties on every continent as the storms grew worse and vegetation withered and died. Seven weeks and three days after the planet's premier speaker led the way, CST closed the Hanko wormhole. 
If there were people left on the planet, they were beyond contact. Every effort had been made, every known habitation and isolated farmstead searched. With the people gone, the force fields protecting cities and towns failed one by one, allowing the winds to pound against the buildings and flood water to scour the ground around them. Not even modern super-strong materials could resist such pummeling forever. The structures began to crumple and collapse. Eventually, with the climate spiralling down into its ice age, the rains chilled to become snow and then ice. Mushy scree piled up against the frozen ruins, obliterating yet more evidence that this once had been an inhabited world. The artful dodger passed through the force field and into the calm bubble of warm air that was the restoration team's main base. It was centred on one of Kajani's old parks. Under the protective auspice of the force field, the ground had been decontaminated and replanted. Grass grew once again, as did a short avenue of trees. Clusters of airborne polyphotospheres shone an imitation sunlight onto the lush greenery. Irrigation pipes provided clean water. There were even native birds and insects humming about, oblivious to the dark sky with its sub-zero winds outside. They landed on a small patch of concrete on the edge of the park that held just one other starship, a thirty-year-old commercial combi freighter with a continuous wormhole drive that could carry a mix of cargo and passengers. The difference between the two ships was patent, with the artful Dodger's smooth chrome-purple hull seeming almost organic compared with the restoration team's workhorse, with its carbon-bonded titanium fuselage and fading paintwork. Aeron and Corilin floated gently down out of the airlock to touch down among the five bulbous landing legs. Ten people had turned out to greet them, quite a crowd by the base's standards. All were curious to see the unscheduled arrivals. Ansan Purala stood at the head of the delegation, a slightly rotund man with fair hair cut short, dressed in a simple dark blue tunic with a restoration logo on the arm. "'Greetings to both of you,' he said. "'I'd like to know why you're here. We're pleased to see you, of course, don't get me wrong. But we never have visitors. Ever.' His attitude was pleasant, but there was an underlying determination. Aaron's bionics performed a fast, low-level field scan. Director Purala was an ordinary advancer human, as were his co-workers. None were higher. It's rather awkward, he said with a twisted smile. Uh, Cory, I'm looking for someone, she said. It was a low voice, hauntingly mournful. Aaron was impressed. She'd backed it up with a soft ache in the base's tiny gyre field. The team was suddenly all attention and sympathy. A man. Yego, we were in love. Then it went bad. My fault. I was so stupid. I shouldn't have... I don't want to say. Aaron put his arm comfortingly around her shoulder as she sniffed convincingly, head bowed. There, there, he assured her. They don't want details. Corilin nodded bravely and continued. He left. It took me a long time before I realized what a mistake I'd made but I'd hurt him really badly. I've been looking for him for three years. He changed his name and his profile, but his sister let slip that he'd come here. Who is it? Director Purilar asked. I don't know. All I know was what his sister said, that he joined the restoration project. I just had to come, if there's any chance. Um, yes, sure. Purilar glanced at his colleagues, who were busy checking one another out to see if any of them was going to own up to being the one. He waved an arm about. Anyone look familiar? Corilin shook her head despondently. No, I probably won't recognize him. She faced her little audience. Yigo, please, if it's you, please just tell me. I just want to talk, that's all, please. Now nobody was meeting her gaze. You don't have to do it in front of your friends, she said. Come to me later. I really, really miss you. That was accompanied by a burst of sincere desperation into the Gaia field. All right, then, a thoroughly embarrassed Purala said to his team. I'll get this organized. We can meet up again at dinner. People broke away, heading back toward the main expanse of grass, 
keeping their smiles under tight control. As soon as they were a few paces away, couples went into deeply intense conversations, heads close together. Aaron watched them go, keeping his face impassive. The base would be talking about this for the next twenty years. Ansan Purava was left standing in front of his two uninvited guests, one hand scratching at his fuzzy hair in some perplexity. His guillemots were leaking an equal amount of disquiet. You're welcome to use the accommodation here. There are plenty of spare rooms, a legacy of when the project was conducted on a grander scale. But, quite frankly, I suspect your own ship would be more comfortable. He eyed the artful dodger jealously. Our living quarters haven't been updated in a century. That's very kind of you, and of course we'll use the ship, Aaron said. We have no intention of imposing. Quite the contrary, Purala said sheepishly. You are going to be excellent for morale. The only entertainment we get here is sensory dramas, and they tend to pall after a while. Whereas a quest like this, one of us dull old souls with a romantic past, well, how long have you been here? Aaron asked. Myself? I will have notched twenty-five years in the last hundred and thirty. Aaron whistled. That's devotion? Do you mind telling me why? Purala beckoned to them and set off across the grass. I'm nearly three hundred years old, so in fact it's a small portion of my life. I don't mind donating the time, because I can extend my life as long as I want to make up for it. That sounds almost like higher philosophy. I suppose it does. I'll probably migrate inward once the restoration project ends. Higher culture appeals to me. But why that first donation? Simple enough. I met one of the restored. She died just after the prime attack, caught outside a force field when the storm struck. Seven hundred years later, one of our teams found her corpse and extracted her memory cell. She was relifed in a clone and lived happily on Anagaska. It was her contentment which affected me. She had such a busy, fulfilling life. There was a huge family, her involvement with the local community. I was struck by how much poorer the world, my world, would have been without her. So I signed up for a tour. Then, when you're here, you get to see firsthand the people you find. Follow them from excavation through assessment and DNA extraction, memory cell rehabilitation, right up to real life. You understand? I meet the living individual after I dig up the corpse. Innocent people who were struck down. People who didn't deserve to die. Victims of a hideous war. Maybe it's self-serving. But do you have any idea how good that makes me feel? I can't even imagine. I can see I'm going to have to make a financial contribution when I get back to Anagaska. They crossed the big grass field to the low buildings on the other side. Housing for the team members consisted of small individual cottages arranged in five neat circles, each with a central clump of community buildings. As they approached, Aaron saw an open-air swimming pool and several barbecue areas. A sports field had been marked out. Only two of the circles were in use. It was impossible to see what the cottages were made of. They were all covered by thick creepers with long brown leaves that dangled golden flowers from their tips. It was a pleasant arboreal contrast to the icy desolation outside the force field. A deliberate one, he suspected. The vines were nicely shaggy but pruned so as not to obstruct windows. Behind the cottages were two modern, functional blocks. One contained the project laboratories, Purilar explained, while the other housed their maintenance shops and garaged their equipment. We're heavily cybernated, he told them, but even we need a few technicians to repair the bots now and again. Could he be working as a technician? Aaron asked Corilin. Who knows? She said lightly, I just know he's here. Probably. It is a long shot, after all. Aaron did not look at her. That hell-damned mouth of hers. He had managed to get into the starship's culinary unit program, altering her patches on his original blocks, so the drinks she ordered had only half the alcohol content she had designated. Her attitude hadn't made any miraculous changes. Can we meet everyone? Aaron asked. Sure, I suppose. This is a civil outpost, after all. I'm not exactly a police commissioner, you know. I can't compel anyone who doesn't want to be introduced. 
He gave Corilin an apologetic shrug. Anyone who refuses is pretty likely to be him, don't you think? Aaron said. Sounds about right, the director said. You do realize that everyone on the planet will now know you're here and why. This is a small operation. How many people is that exactly? 427 of us, of which 180 are here in the base. 500 years ago, there were 6,000 people involved. How many people have you restored? 2.1 million in total, Purila said proudly. Aaron whistled appreciatively. I had no idea. The bulk of them were in the early years, of course, but our techniques have improved dramatically since then, thankfully, because even with the cold helping preservation, entropy is our real enemy. Come on, I'll show you. He stepped through the door of the laboratory block. The assessment room was the first section they looked in, a big clean chamber with ten long medical tables, surrounded by ply plastic limbs, tipped with instruments and sensors. One of the tables had a recently discovered corpse on it, Aaron wrinkled his nose at the sight. It was hard to tell the thing had been human, a dark lump wrapped in shrunken cloth and smeared with grime. Its limbs were difficult to determine, showing as long ridges. Strings of hair at one end at least showed him where the head was. After a minute he realized the corpse was curled up in the fetal position. Two of the recovery team were standing beside the table in sealed white overalls, peering down through their bubble helmets, as they directed the wand-shaped sensors along various creases in the body's surface. Their movements dislodged grains of snow, which were vacuumed carefully from the tabletop. We keep the temperature in there the same as outside, Purila said. Any sudden change in environment could be catastrophic. As it is, we have to keep the assessment room sterile too. Why? Corilin asked. The radiation has killed off Hanko's microbial life. It's another factor which helps the preservation process. If any bugs got in there, they'd have a feast, and we'd be left with slush. They must be very delicate by now, Aaron said. Yes, this one is almost intact. We normally deal with broken segments. Don't you use a stabilizer field? Not if we can help it. We found the field actually has a detrimental effect on their memory cells. Don't forget... Back then, the Commonwealth was still using crystal matrices. In some early cases, we scrambled 10% of the information. Must be hard to remove the memory cell, then. We don't even try. Once we've extracted enough DNA samples to sequence a full genome, we deploy infiltrator filaments into the crystal. Even that can be hazardous. Powering up a memory cell after this long is fatal. It has to be red-cold which is done a molecular layer at a time. Each one takes about nine months. I'd have thought that crystal memory cells would last longer than this. They built them pretty robust even back then, but consider what they've endured for 1,200 years. It doesn't help. Who is he? Corilin asked. She, actually, we think. Ava Sondlin will know for certain when her genome has been read, but the location was right. Location? She was found four kilometres from her car. In itself, that was hard to find. Washed downstream in a flash flood. We know from records that she lived in the house above the valley's flood level. We think she was making a dash for the nearest town during a break in the storm. There was an official evacuation point set up there, and she informed the authorities she was coming. Never arrived. Must have gotten caught by the winds or the water. Maybe she'll be able to tell us. You knew she was missing? Yes. The records of the time aren't perfect, naturally, given the circumstances. But we have a full census, and of course everyone who arrived on Anagaska was fully documented. It's our job to try to determine what happened to those who got lost. We have to handle each case separately. In Ava's case, we've been searching possible locations for seventy years. You're bullshitting me, Aaron said. I assure you I'm not. Sorry, but seventy years. We start with the route she must have taken, pick the obvious danger points, and seed them with sensor bots. They spread out in a circle, trying to find some trace. Like all our equipment, the bots have improved considerably during the centuries we've been here. The majority are tunnelers, burrowing through the snow and surface soil layers. 
So much topsoil was displaced during the storms that the continent's whole topology shifted, and now it's all locked into place by the permafrost. Ninety-nine percent of the people we recover these days are buried. It means the bots operate in highly detrimental conditions, even for this world. In total, the restoration project has deployed 450 million since it began. There are still 11 million active and searching. They're not fast-moving, but they are thorough. How many people are you still looking for? A third of a million. I don't hold out much hope. Most of them will have been washed into the sea. He gestured at the wrinkled lump on the table. Dear Ava's car was 47 kilometres from the road she used, and that was the easy find. She was deep under sediment. Persistence pays off. We still find about 20 or so each year, even now. They moved on into DNA sequencing. To air on it was just an ordinary office with five large smart cores. Even in ordinary circumstances, human DNA decomposed quickly. After 1,200 years on Hanko, only the smallest fragments remained. But there were a lot of cells in a body, each with its own fragments. Piecing them together was possible with the right techniques and a vast amount of computing power. Once the main sequences had been established, the project could use family records to fill the gaps. In a lot of cases, there were full DNA records from clinics available. As soon as the body had been identified properly, a clone was grown for re-life. But not here, Purila said. Clinics back on Anagaska handle that part. After all, who would want to wake up here? People have enough trouble adjusting to the present, their future, as it is. Most need specialist counselling. Is life that different? Essentially, no. And most died hoping for rescue in the form of re-life. It is the amount of time involved which shocks them. None of their immediate family and friends remain. They are very much alone when they wake. After DNA, there was the memory rehabilitation section, where they tried to reassemble the information read from memory cells. It was a process orders of magnitude more complex than DNA sequencing. The history archives were for recovered people who could not be identified. It held all of Hanko's civic records and memoirs of families with lost relatives, the logs and recollections of the evacuation teams, lists of people who may have been visiting Hanko when the attack started, and the intersolar missing persons list of the time. There were laboratories specializing in analysis of molecular structures, identifying Baroque minute clues the bots had discovered as they wormed their way through Hanko's frozen earth, trying to place flakes of paint with individual car models, tying scraps of cloth to specific clothes, and from there to manufacturer, to retail outlet, to customer lists, to bank statements. There were items of jewellery and even pets. It was a long register of unknown artefacts, each one potentially leading to another lost corpse. The case room had files on everyone still known to be missing. The operations centre monitored the sensor bots and the outpost teams that were excavating in terrible conditions. After two hours, they had met everyone in the building. None reacted to Corilin, and nobody tried to avoid her. Aaron quietly scanned all of them. No one was enriched with bionics. There are a few other people around, Purila said, You'll probably meet them tonight at the canteen. We tend to eat together. And if he's not there? Aaron asked. Then I'm sorry, but there's not much I can do, the director said. He gave Corilin an uncomfortable glance. Can we visit the outposts? she asked. If he is here, he'll know about you by now. He would have used the beacon net to call in. I guess he doesn't want to get back with you. Seeing me in the flesh might be the one thing he can't resist, Corrie Lynn said. Please. Her outpouring of grief into the Gaia field was disturbing. The director looked deeply unhappy. If you want to venture outside, there's nothing I can do to stop you. Technically, this is still a free Commonwealth world. You can go wherever you want. I'd have to advise against it, though. Why? Aaron asked. You've got a good ship but even that would be hard-pressed to manoeuvre close to the ground. We can't use capsules here. The winds are too strong, and the atmospheric energy content too high. The two times we tried to use our ship for an emergency rescue nearly ended in disaster. 
We aborted both and wound up having to re-life the team members. My ship has an excellent force field. I'm sure it does. But expanding the force field doesn't help. You just give the wind a bigger surface area to push at. Down here it actually makes you more susceptible to the storm. The only stability you have in the air is what your drive units can provide. Aaron did not like it. The artful dodger was just about the best protection possible under normal circumstances. He could not forget the way the regrav units had approached their limits while bringing them down to the base's force field dome, and that had been a big target. How do your teams get about? he asked. Ground crawlers. They weigh three tons apiece and move on tracks. They're not fast, but they are dependable. Can we borrow one? There must be some you're not using. You said there used to be a lot more personnel here at one time. Just an old one will do. Look, really, he's not here. Whatever release document you want us to certify will do it, Corilin said. Please, give me this last chance. I've got over twenty teams out there. Half of them aren't even on this continent. We use the polar caps as a bridge to get to the other land masses. It would take you a year to get around them all. At least we can make a start. If ye go here to hack any files, they're all open to review. The team with the current highest recovery rate is working up at Olhava province. That's on this continent, 900 kilometers southwest. If we start first thing tomorrow morning, we'll be there in 48 hours. Oscar Munro had fallen in love with the house the first moment he saw it. It was a plain circle with a high glass wall separating floor and ceiling that stood five metres off the ground on a central pillar that contained a spiral staircase. Both the base and the roof were made of a smooth artificial rock similar to white granite, and it shone like mountaintop snow in Oricum's blue-tinged sunlight. The sprawling grounds outside resembled grand historical parkland that had fallen into disuse, with woolly grass, overgrowing paths, lines of ornamental trees, and a couple of lakes with a little waterfall between them. There were even some brick Hellenic structures resting in deep nooks, swamped by moss and flowering creepers, to add to the image of great age. That image was one that several dozen gardening pots worked hard at achieving. He had lived there for nineteen years now, it was a wonderful home to return to every time his pilot shift was over, devoid of stress and the kind of bullshit politics that went in tandem with any corporate job. Oscar flew commercial starships for Oricum's thriving national space line, which had routes to over twenty external planets. Piloting was the only job he had sought since he had been re-lifed. Waking up in the clinic had been one hell of a surprise. The last thing he remembered was crashing his hyperglider into an identical one piloted by Anna Keim, saving the Commonwealth. Good. Killing the wife of his best friend, not so hot. Without Anna to wreck their flight, Wilson Keim should have managed to fly unimpeded on a mission that was pivotal in the Starflyer War. Oscar could remember the instant before the collision, a moment of complete serenity. He had not expected anyone to recover his memory cell, not after his confession that in his youth he had been involved in an act of politically motivated terrorism that had killed 408 people, a third of them without memory cells, mostly children too young for the inserts. The fact that he'd never intended it, that the deaths had been a mistake, that they had missed their actual target, that should not have counted in his favour. But it seemed as though his service to the Commonwealth and his ultimate sacrifice had meant something to the judge. He wanted to think Wilson maybe had paid for a decent lawyer. They had been good friends. I guess that means we won then, were his first words. It even sounded like his own voice. Above him a youthful doctor's face smiled. Welcome back, Mr. Yao Hui, he said. Call me Oscar. I was that longer than I was ever Yao Hui. That was his new identity when he went on the run for over forty years. As you wish. Oscar managed to prop himself up on his elbows, a movement that surprised him. He had seen real-life clones several times, pitiful things with thin flesh stretched over bones and organs that had been force-grown to adolescence, unable to move for months while they painfully built up muscle mass. This body, though, seemed almost complete, 
which meant the technique had improved. There had been a lot of body loss in the war, tens of millions at least. He probably had been shoved down to the bottom of the list. How long? Please understand, uh, Oscar, you were put on trial for your uh, previous crime. It set quite a few legal precedents given your uh, state at the time. What trial? What do you mean, state? I was dead. You suffered body loss. Your memory cell survived the crash intact. Legally, that is recognized by the Commonwealth as being your true self. It was recovered by one Paula Mayo. Ah, oh, Oscar suddenly was getting a very bad feeling about this. Paula recovered me? Yes, you and Anna Kaim. She brought both of you back to Earth. But Anna was a Starflyer agent. Yes, under the terms of the Doi Amnesty, her Starflyer conditioning was edited out of her memories, and she was relifed as a normal human. Apparently, she went on to have a long life and a successful marriage to Wilson Keim. She was certainly on the discovery with him when it flew around the galaxy. Oscar's shoulders were not so strong after all. He sagged back onto the mattress. How long? he repeated. There was an urgency in his growl. You were found guilty at the trial. Your Navy service record was a mitigating factor in sentencing, of course, but it couldn't compensate for the number of people who were killed at Abaddon Station. The judge gave you suspension. But as the Commonwealth clinics were unable to cope with the sheer quantity of uh, non-criminals requiring relife at the time, he allowed you to remain as a stored memory rather than be relifed before the sentence began. How long? Oscar whispered. You were sentenced to 1,100 years. Fuck me! He was all alone. That was probably a worse punishment than suspension. After all, he was not aware of time passing during that millennium. He could not reflect and repent his wrongdoing. But in this present, life was different. Everyone he had known had either died or migrated inward. Ridiculous phrase a politically correct way of saying they had committed euthanasia with a safety net. Maybe that was the point of suspension, after all. It certainly hurt. So with no friends, no family, knowledge and skills that even museums would not be interested in, Oscar Munro had to start afresh. The Navy, understandably, did not want him. He explained that he didn't expect to be part of the deterrence fleet and offered to retrain as a pilot for their exploration crews. They declined again. Back before the Starflyer War, he had worked in the Exploration Division at CST. Opening new planets, giving people a fresh start, was like a self-imposed penance, except that he'd really enjoyed it. So he did train as a starship pilot. Fortunately, the modern continuous wormhole drive used principles and theories developed during his first life. He brought himself up to speed on its current technology applications quite rapidly. Oricum Solar Star was the third company he had worked for since his relife. It wasn't much different from any other external world starline. In fact, it was smaller than most. Oricum was on the edge of the greater Commonwealth, settled for a mere 200 years. But that location made it a chief candidate from which to mount new exploration flights, opening up yet more worlds. They were rare events. The Navy had charted every star system directly outside the external worlds, Expansion to new worlds was also at a historical low. The boundary between central and external worlds had not changed much for centuries. The old assumption that higher culture always would be extending outward and that ordinary humans would be an expanding wave in front of it was proving to be a fallacy. With inward migration, the number of higher humans remained about constant and the external worlds provided just about every kind of society in terms of ethnicity, ideology, technology, and religion. Should any citizen feel disenfranchised on their own planet, they just had to take a commercial flight to relocate. There was very little reason to found a new world these days. In the 19 years he had been on Oricum, Solar Star had launched only three planetary survey flights, Two of them had been closer than the distance the company's long-range commercial flights travelled, hardly breaking through to new frontiers. But he had seniority now. If another outward venture came along, he ought to be chosen. Like all pilots, he was an eternal optimist.
There was no hint of that elusive mission in the company offices when he filed his flight report. He'd just gotten back from a long-haul flight to Troyan, seventy light-years away, a fifteen-hour trip with nothing to do other than talk to the smart core and trawl the Unisphere for anything interesting. One day soon, he was sure, people finally would chuck the notion that they had to have a fellow human in charge. He was sitting in front of the starship only for public relations. In fact, there were probably people sitting in the passenger cabin who were better qualified than he if repairs were needed. Not that they ever were. But at least he got to visit new planets, the same ones, over and over again. His regrav capsule sank out of the wispy clouds to curve sedately around the house and land on the grass beside the spinny of lofty rancata trees, nearly twenty metres tall, with reddish-brown whip leaves that swayed in the mild breeze. He climbed out and took a deep breath of the warm, plain-scented air. Out beyond the horizon, Oricum's untamed countryside was carpeted by spiky wildflowers that budded most of the year. Another reason to choose Oricum was its benign climate. Jessoral was walking out from underneath the house. The splendidly handsome youth did not quite have a welcoming smile on his face, but definitely looked relieved to see Oscar. He was wearing only a pair of knee-length white trousers, showing off a tanned body that always got Oscar's blood pumping a little faster. Jessorel was the youngest of his three life partners, barely twenty. That, Oscar suspected, probably qualified him as the worst punk skunk in the galaxy. A thousand-year-plus age gap. It was delightfully naughty. The youth opened his arms wide and gave Oscar a big hug to accompany a long, sultry kiss. Enthusiasm sprayed out heedlessly into the Gaia field. "'What's the matter?' Oscar asked. "'Them,' Jezeral said, stabbing a thumb dismissively back at the house. Oscar refused to sigh. He and his other partners, Dushiku and Anja, had been a stable trio for over a decade. They were both over a hundred, and completely at ease with each other. At their age, they understood perfectly the little accommodations necessary to make any relationship work. It was taking everyone longer than expected to accommodate and adjust to the newcomer, who did not have anything like their experience and sophistication. That was what made him so exciting in and out of bed. What have they done? It's a surprise for you, and I know how you hate surprises. Not always, Oscar assured him. Depends if it's good or bad. What's this one? Oh, no, I'm just telling you there is a surprise for you. I don't want you to be upset that it's there, that's all. Oscar used a macrocellular cluster to connect to the house's net. Whatever was waiting inside had been blocked skillfully. That would be Anja, who developed commercial neural routines. She was one of the best on the planet. You have the strangest logic I've ever known, Oscar said. Jessoral smiled broadly. Come on. I can't wait. He tugged at Oscar's arm, his outpouring of enthusiasm shining like sunrise. This is the end of the CD. The program continues on the next CD. They hurried to the base of the pillar and climbed the wide spiral staircase. It brought them out into a small vestibule planted with colorful bushes from several worlds, their flowers reaching for the open sky above. Ten doors opened off it. Jessorel led the way into the main lounge. In contrast to the exterior, the lounge was clad in Karenwood, a local variety that was a rich gold-brown. The grain of the planks had been blended so skillfully, it looked as if they were inside a giant hollowed-out trunk. Its furniture was scarlet and gold, contributing to the sumptuous feel. Doshiko was waiting in the middle of the big room, holding out a tumbler of malt whiskey with three ice cubes. He had a mischievous smile on his broad face. Welcome home. Thanks. Oscar took the drink wearily. I see Jessorel's restraint is as strong as ever. I didn't tell him, Jessorel protested. So? Oscar inquired. Dushiku raised an eyebrow and half turned, indicating the balcony beyond the glass wall at the far end of the lounge. Anja was standing out there, leaning on the rail as she spoke about some aspect of the gardens below. Her laughter-filled voice was just audible through the open door. Oscar knew the tone well. She was playing the perfect hostess, 
marking her territory. Anja was astonishingly beautiful, a beauty that took a full third of her salary to maintain. Two visits to a clinic each year were considered an essential minimum, for beauty was fluid and fashions were treacherous ephemera, even on Oricum. She'd returned three weeks earlier from her last treatments, showing off her reduced height and dark satin texture skin. Her face was all gentle curves, veiled by a mane of thick chestnut hair swishing down past her shoulders. It shows. Self-determination can overcome artificial nature. I'm sure the old nature versus nurture philosophers would be delighted to hear it. Why don't you call them and let them know? Oh, yes, right. They're all dead for two thousand years. You're trying to avoid answering me. Trying to justify your fright to yourself. Wrong, lady. Utterly, totally wrong. The answer is no. No, I will not help you. Would you like that clarified? No. How bad do you think it is? that I'm here to ask you. Don't care. I won't help you. It's the pilgrimage. Oscar, I'm worried about it. Really worried. He stared up at her, not sure if he could take many more shocks. Look, I've followed the story closely enough. Who hasn't? The Navy will stop the Arkison Empire dead in its tracks. A&A will halt the pilgrimage ships. It's not stupid. The Void will eat up half the galaxy if Inigo's dumbass sheep ever get inside. And you think that's all there is to it? Oscar, you and I were there with Nigel before we travelled to far away. You know how complex that situation was, how many factors were in play. Well, this is worse. A lot worse. The Void is only a peripheral event. A convenient gadfly. This is the factions finally marching out to fight. This is a battle for the destiny of humanity. Our soul will be decided by the outcome. I can't help, he said, mortified by the way his voice was nearly a wail. I'm a pilot, for Christ's sake. Oh, Oscar. Her voice was rich with sympathy. She knelt down in front of him and grasped his hands. Her fingers were warm to the touch. Enough humility. It's your character I desperately need help from. I know that once you agree, I don't have to worry about the problem any more. You won't quit on me, and that's what's important. This is a nostalgia trip for you. I'm just a pilot. You were just a Navy captain, but you saved us from the Starflyer. I'm going to tell you what I'm asking you to do, and then I'm going to tell you why you'll do it. If you want to hate me for making you face reality, then that's fine by me, too. He shook his hands loose from her grip. Say your piece, then go. The factions know me. They watch me as I watch their agents, so I can't have them knowing that I am desperate to locate the second dreamer. Oscar laughed. It trailed off into a near whimper. Find the second dreamer? Me? Yes. And you know why that'll work? because no one will be expecting it. He made it sound like a school kid reciting a useless fact. Correct. And do you know why you'll do it for me? And please don't shoot the messenger. He braced himself. Surely there was nothing else in his life she could threaten him with. Did I erase a memory? My God, was there another Abaddon? What? Because you're bored shitless with this dreary, monotonous life you sleepwalk through. Oscar opened his mouth to shout at her, tell her that she'd finally flipped, that she was so fantastically wrong, that his life was rich, that he had people who loved him, that every day was a joy, that he never wanted to go back to the crazy days of the Starflyer War, that he'd already endured all the terror and wild exhilaration one life could possibly contain, that such things were best left to the new generation. But for some reason, his head had fallen into his hands, and he was sighing heavily. He could not look at her, and he certainly never could look at his life partners. I can't tell them that, he whispered painfully. How can I? They'll believe it's their fault. Paula stood up. A hand rested on his shoulder with gentle sympathy. You want me to do it? No. He shook his head and wiped the back of his hand across his eyes to remove the annoying smears of moisture. No. I'm not that much of a coward. Whatever cover story you need, you've got it. I can arrange anything, basically. 
Uh huh. There's a starship waiting for you at the local spaceport. She smiled mischievously. An ultra drive. Oscar smiled faintly, feeling the joy stirring deep inside him. Ultra drive. Well, at least you don't think I'm a cheap whore. This was not how Araminta had expected to be returning to the Suvorov continent, sitting in an aging carry capsule as it flew across the great cloud ocean, lower and slower than every other capsule on the planet. It didn't exactly smack of style. She'd always promised herself she'd return to her birth continent only when she could step out of a swanky luxury capsule and smile condescendingly around at Langham and the family's business. Not there just yet. Unfortunately, Lycan's estate was on Suvoro, understandably, as that was where Vyosha's capital, Ludor, was situated. Lycan was not a province's kind of person. He had to be near the action. So back across the ocean she went, with a baggage hold, packed with her best clothes and a deepening sense of anxiety. She was genuinely interested in the Sheldonite's abilities. To get to his level in under a hundred and fifty years illustrated a phenomenal achievement. There was a lot she could learn from him, providing she could get him talking. Then there was the whole Sheldonite culture thing, thousands of people on hundreds of external worlds trying to emulate their ancient hyper-capitalist idol. It was an emulation dangerously close to blind worship, she thought, but she was willing to suspend judgment until she experienced it firsthand. Maybe this was the route she should be taking. Even Bovey could not deny that Sheldonism was the pinnacle of business culture. Successful Sheldonism, that was. There were enough failed adherents littering the external worlds. And finally the harem. Typical male fantasy, a rich man making his dreams come true. Yet it was a lot more common than in Sheldon's day. Group life partner relationships were growing in popularity in the external worlds and she was hardly in any position to criticise. What she'd enjoyed with Bovey was essentially the same arrangement. So here she was, technically free and single, and still interested in experimenting sexually to see what suited her. She didn't think this was going to be her, but she had surprised herself before with Bovey. A last wild fling, then. So whatever I discover, this weekend will be win-win. With that delinquent thought warming her, the capsule finally made land and began to fly over Lycan's estate. He owned an area of a hundred thousand square miles, taking in a long stretch of coastline, developed with resort complexes. Massive tracts of farmland with square-mile fields were growing every imaginable luxury crop, the kind nobody produced in a culinary unit, tended by over a million agrobots, all processed in immaculately hygienic cybernated factories and sold under his own brands. Then there was Albany, his industrial complex. Set on a flat plain, it was eight miles to a side, with tall boxy buildings laid out in a perfect grid, every one a factory or processing plant. A spaceport spread out of one side, with long rows of landing pads stretching across the green meadows to a nearby river. Ocean barges clotted the water, and fat cargo starships formed nearly solid lines stretching up through the sky. No humans lived in Albany itself. The technicians who kept it running were housed in dormitory towns twenty miles away. She flew over one of them, surprised by how nice it looked, with large houses and plenty of green space, ornate civic buildings providing every amenity. He owns it all, and more, he created it. Now that is real vision. Her capsule's net was queried by local traffic control. She supplied her identity certificate and received a descent vector. Lycan's home was actually three separate buildings. Two of them were on the shore of a lake ten miles long. One was a giant chateau made of stone that must have had five hundred rooms. Araminta had seen smaller villages. The second, almost opposite the first, was an ultramodern ovoid of shimmering opalescence, that seemed to dip down into the water as it lay alongside it across the ground. The third was small by comparison, just a wooden lodge atop the cliffs of a rugged island. The capsule landed outside the ovoid. Araminta was quietly grateful. She wanted to see what it was like inside, 
if there were any design concepts she could use. Two of the harem women were waiting to greet her when she stepped out. Clemence, a slim teenager, dressed in a simple white shirt and blue cotton shorts, had a fresh face, freckles on her nose and brow, an eager smile, and fair hair that was barely styled. She was not quite what Araminta had expected. The other one, Maracata, was tall and classically beautiful, with ebony skin that gleamed in the sunlight. Her scarlet gown probably cost more than every item Araminta had brought put together, and that's what she wears in the middle of the afternoon. Subtle cosmetic scales highlighted jade eyes and a wide mouth. She did not smile. Her whole attitude was one of cool amusement. Clemence bounded forward, her smile growing even wider. She threw her arms around Araminta. Lycan has told us all about you. It's so great to finally get to meet you. A mildly startled Araminta gave the girl a tentative hug. What did he say? To be careful, Maracata said. She raised an elegant eyebrow, observing Araminta's response. He says you're really ambitious and smart and attractive, and your own boss. Clemence seemed to run out of breath. Just all around fabulous. Araminta finally managed to disentangle herself from the girl. I didn't realize I'd made such an impression. Lycan makes very fast assessments, Maracata said. Do you? Araminta asked as coolly as she could. It actually drew a small smile from the imposing woman. I take my time and get it absolutely right. Good to know. Clemence giggled. Come on, we'll show you your room. She grabbed Araminta's hand and pulled like a five-year-old hauling her parent to the Christmas tree. The staff will get your bags, Maracata said airily. Araminta frowned, then saw she wasn't joking. A couple of women in identical smart grey toga suits were heading for her capsule, followed by a regrav sled. You have human staff? Of course. So Nigel Sheldon must have had them. Hmm, you are quite quick, aren't you? Clemence laughed and pulled harder. Come on, I chose this one for you. They were right up against the scintillating surface. Araminta had not realized how big the ovoid was. It had to reach ten stories above her, though the curvature made it hard to tell. There were no discernible features, certainly no door. The entire base was surrounded by a broad marble path, as if it were resting on a plinth. A couple of thin gold lines had materialized underfoot, which Clemence had followed. She slipped through the torrent of multicolored light. Araminta followed. It was similar to walking through a pressure field or a spore shower, a slight tingle on the skin, a bright flash against the eye, and she was in a bubble chamber with transparent furniture delineated by glowing emerald lines like curving laser beams. Closets and drawers were all empty. Chairs and couches contained a more diffuse glow inside their cushions, looking like faulty portal projections. The floor and cupola walls were a duller version of the external scintillations. Only the cream and gold sheets on the bed were what she thought of as tangible. The house Smartnet is offering an operations program, her you shadow told her. Accept it. Her exovision showed her the file opening into a storage lacuna. Clemence already was sitting on the edge of the bed, bouncing up and down. Like it! The house's main entrance opens into a guest bedroom. Only when you need it to, the girl said sprightly. Tell your control program you want to see out. Araminta did, and the walls on one side lost their lustre to show the gardens outside, and her capsule with the regrav sled loading cases. Now, if you need the bathroom, Clemence said, the whole room started to slide upward, following the curvature of the external wall. There must have been excellent gravity compensators hidden somewhere below the floor, because Araminta did not feel any movement. Then they were sliding horizontally into the centre of the ovoid. Other bubble rooms flowed past them. Araminta imagined this was the perspective corpuscles had as they raced through a vein. She smiled in delight. How brilliant! The whole thing is protean. Her bedroom touched a bathroom, and the wall rolled apart to give her access. The design beyond the new door was more conventional, 
with a huge pool bath, showers and dryer chambers. It was bigger than the living rooms back in the apartments she was developing. You want to see someone, or go to the dining room for dinner, or just change the view? Tell the house, Maricata said. I will, Araminta said positively. A door opened opposite the bathroom, and Maricata stepped through. Araminta caught a glimpse of an all-white chamber with a long desk and gym apparatus. I'll see you later, Maricata said, and the door swept shut behind her. Was that a threat? Araminta muttered. Oh, ignore her, Clemence said. She's always shy around new people. She's a lot more fun in bed, honest. I'm sure. Araminta turned around, giving the room a more thorough inspection. The drawers began to fill up with her clothes. The process was like watching water bubble into a glass. Take me to Lycan, she told her you shadow. The room closed the door into the bathroom. Curving walls slipped past horizontally, then curved to vertical, and opaque the walls. Gravity might be perfectly stable, but the sight was strangely disorienting. Lycan's room was huge. Araminta suspected that it didn't move often because everything else in the house would be displaced. It was circular, with a polished oak floor that appeared to be a single giant segment. It had been vat-grown. She had read a file on the process in one of her design courses. The walls were pale pink and blue with a translucent eggshell texture. They slipped into transparency along a third of the length, providing a panorama across the lake. Lycan was walking toward her, dressed in a simple mauve sweatshirt and long green shorts. Small coloured symbols were shrinking around him and then vanishing. The walls had to be portals, she thought, which gave them a vast projection capacity. This was probably his office. He smiled warmly, paused in front of her and gave her a kiss, the kind of kiss that told her what he was expecting from her later. Great house, she said. I knew you'd like it. The concept is an old one, but we've just gotten the manufacturing process down to an affordable level. Not easy without higher replicators. I'd like to have the Colwyn City franchise. He responded with a warm, admiring smile. See, most developers would have made a crack about me putting them out of business, but you see how to adapt and move onward. That's what makes you stand out. Thank you. Clemence scampered over to a new door. Catch you later. Lycan waved dismissively as he led Araminta over to the transparent wall. Drink? Food? he asked. I'm good for a few hours. Good. The Prime Minister and two Cabinet Ministers are coming for dinner. Are you trying to impress me? They were coming anyway, but it gives you an idea of the life I lead. To get this big, you have to delve into politics. Colwyn City Hall can be a beast about issuing permits. Take the development officer for dinner. Loan your local councillor a high-end capsule. They're all in it for what they can get. Wouldn't be feeding from the public trough otherwise. Unless they're in it to clean up the corruption. Yeah, those ones are a problem. Fortunately, they don't tend to last long. You're a cynic. Pragmatist, if you don't mind. I'm also a lot more experienced than you in every field. So trust me when I say politicians all have their weaknesses. What's yours? She teased. One, I'm an easy lay, but you already know that. Two, risk. Risk is my weakness. The sensation when a risk pays off is like nothing else. I always take the risk. I enjoy the reward too much not to. So, what risk are you taking right now? You're smart. You've researched me. The finance files, at least. Tell me. I accessed some background on my way over. Opinion is you're dangerously overextended, and those loans have grown significantly in the last couple of years. So why do you think that is? You're going to wipe out property companies with houses like this one? Flood the market? He grinned. Small scale. I think big. Besides, it'll take a decade for something like this to become fashionable and then generally accepted. Think. What's the most pressing problem Vyosha has today? Living dream? Kind of. A Leslin is always looming over us, rightly so. The free trade zone is a massive market. It's not going away, and it's always growing. 
Anyone already operating in it has a huge financial and production capacity advantage over some poor little Viosha company. The worry is that when they eventually open a wormhole here, all our companies will lose out to cheap imports. Trade will be one way. Her mind went back to Albany, to the sheer scale of the place. You're going to undercut them. Albany is as automated as anyone can be without replicators. I've spent a decade investing in the most advanced cybernated systems we can have to drive production costs down. To do that, to push each unit cost as low as it can physically go, you have to have massive volume production. That's what's killing me at the moment. The factories are barely ticking over. But when that wormhole finally opens, it's not going to be the financial massacre they expect. They import... I export, but the quantity of those exports will be ten times greater than they assume. You need a distribution network. His smile was triumphant as he turned to face the lake. Certainly would. Wow, she said, and meant it. Lycan's ambition was so great, hers wouldn't even register on the same scale. Why tell me? You can't be trying to impress me into bed. You've already got that. Although I have an egotistical opinion of my own ability, I can't actually manage every aspect by myself, even with an augmented mentality. Too many details. For an expansion phase on this level, I need people I can trust in senior management positions, especially off-world. That's very flattering. Yes and no. You'd be capable management, I think. You have the right kind of drive and mindset. You don't have the experience to be top rank but that will come. She frowned. Why me? How much research did you really do? On Sheldon himself? None, she admitted. Just what I picked up in school. The old dynasties were just that. Family enterprises. The surest way humans have ever come up with to retain loyalty and control. Nigel used his own flesh and blood. Ah. It was as if the room suddenly was on the move. Downward. All the senior positions were held by his own children, Lycan said. That's also what I do. A memory abruptly rushed to the forefront of her mind. Debina, she said before she could stop it. Lycan actually winced. What did I ever do to you? No, okay. Not my beloved little girl. But a lot of my other children are running sections of my company. And how do I fit into this? How do you think? Spell it out for me. You become one of my wives. You have my children. They take their place in the company. You really know how to romance a girl. He flashed her a wry smile. Come on, we're grown-ups. Every marriage today is half business. We'll have a great time in bed. I can afford any lifestyle you want. Your children will grow up being part of the most dynamic company in this section of the Commonwealth. They'll never want for anything, and they'll be presented with virtually unlimited challenges. I know you well enough to know that appeals. Who wants trust fund brats, right? And the same goes for you. Stick with me for ten, fifteen years. Then you can either continue with a post in the company, or you cut loose with a huge chunk of money and enough insider knowledge to run circles around everyone else. Ozzy's mother. Are you serious? Perfectly. It's very flattering, but isn't it a bit sudden? You think Sheldon hesitated when he saw something he wanted? No way. He went out and got it. And this isn't quite that sudden now, is it? We had a connection back at my symposium. You're not going to deny that, are you? No, she admitted. So, there's physical attraction, which just leaves your abilities. I did some research. Your fifth assistant's coffee boy did some research. Indeed. He acknowledged wryly, you're the original kid from nowhere. Rejects the cosy family business route. Looking to get out. Failed marriage. Now on the bounce-back curve. You're hungry and capable. With the experience my organization can provide, you'll flourish. He sidled up close and put his arm around her, kissing her again, more gently this time. I don't want an answer this instant. This is why you're here. Experience everything you can and you want. Then take your time and decide. Araminta did not wear her own clothes to dinner. 
That was the first thing she learned about what membership in the harem would be like. A stylist called Helena was waiting in her bedroom when it collected her from Lycan's airy office. She was a jovial woman, close to rejuvenation, whose age meant she had piled on a lot of weight in recent years. Genuinely friendly, she was keen to confide household gossip, most of which made no sense to Araminta, although there was a lot of it. She had been with Lycan for fifty years. So I know it all, honey. Seen even more, her you shadow as she held his level gaze. It's clean. Load and run. Through her exovision, she watched the program expand into one of her lacunae. It had many similarities with a learning program, and she allowed it to mushroom into her grey matter. Instinctive knowledge bubbled away in her mind. Don't be afraid, Lycan said softly. I'll use it with you. It will make our first time spectacular. She nodded, not trusting herself to speak. Now that she considered it, Clearing her mind was a simple process, following the rising sleep cycles yet never accepting them. Her breathing steadied, and she grew aware of the body's rhythms, the flow of nervous energy, heartbeat. Peripheral thoughts fell away, allowing her to center herself in the boudoir, on the bed. Her awareness grew of the light touch of fabric against her skin. Tiny beads of perspiration clung to her. She heard the sound of bubbles fizzing in the crystal flutes, lichens breathing. She saw his arm move out, a finger beckon. Maracata answered the summons, sliding sinuously over the mattress. Her fingers stroked Araminta's skin. The sensations her nerves experienced flowed like a tidal wave into her brain. She gasped at the impact and pulled her attention to the sensations that were most pleasurable, wallowing in them. Under Lycan's direction, Maracata plucked the negligee straps off Araminta's shoulders. Air flowed over her exposed breasts, followed by warm fingers. Araminta shuddered fiercely at the touch, smiling as she centered her mind on the feeling. Blood was loud and hot as it rushed into her nipples, swelling the buds. There, she told the owner of the fingers. The caress was repeated, the ecstasy replicated. Then many hands were gliding over her. Warm, eager mouths kissed. She wailed with helpless delight at the symphony of sensation the harem kindled. The negligee was removed completely. Instinctively she arched her back. Lycan's cock slid inside her. The experience was close to unbearable. It was all there was. Still her mind remained steadfast on the torrent of physical joy. Araminta promised herself that no matter what, she would not faint away as she had with Bovey. This time there were no chemicals fogging her mind. This time she was free to experience its incredible conclusion. She laughed and wept simultaneously as Lycan started to move in a powerful rhythm. Then the harem recommenced its virtuoso performance. The Sky Lord glided across the outer atmosphere of the solid planet, its vacuum wings long since retracted, Thick, turbulent streams of the ionosphere swept across its forward section, creating lengthy vibrations across its giant bulk. Energy stirred in specific patterns within it, thoughts mingling with its body's elemental power, manipulating the fabric of the universe outside. Its speed began to slow as it imposed its wishes on reality. Gently it started to lower itself into the atmosphere. Far below, the minds of the sentient entities sang out in welcome. Now, cleric conservator Ethan commanded the obedient, waiting minds of the Dream Masters. Their thoughts flared out into the Gaia field in a single stream, pushing at the dream fabric, seeking entry. Tendrils of raw will prodded and poked at the stubbornly resistant image emanating from the second dreamer. As the Sky Lord began to focus its attention on the ancient coastal city below, they felt its perception turn outward, toward them. It felt them. It knew they were there. My lord, Ethan called with profound respect, we need your help. The Sky Lord's descent halted. Those dreaming the Sky Lord felt the mass of the planet press against the magnificent creature's perception. In that way, 
They knew the winds that blew across the Iguru Plain, experienced the waves rolling lazily over the Layat Sea toward the coast. And there, right underneath them, so tantalizingly close, the physical form of Makathran's buildings brushed against their consciousness, each one exactly as it was in Inigo's dreams. Adoration and gratitude swelled out into the Gaia field, buoying Ethan's thoughts. We seek to reach you. Show us the way to you, my lord. Receive us. The dream shattered into a glorious pinnacle of agony. The Sky Lord's magisterial thoughts were wrenched away by a terrible power. No, the second dreamer commanded amid the ruined bliss. I am me. An infinite black surface swelled with malignant anger, sealing the gulf between the Gaia field and the Sky Lord. Blinding pain seared deep into Ethan's mind as the blackness snapped at him. He screamed, every muscle contorting to fling him out of his chair to fall into merciful unconsciousness. Araminta woke with a gasp, shooting upright on the bed, heart racing and breath coming in shudders. She instinctively applied the program's knowledge again, settling her racing mind and quelling her body's distress. It worked perfectly. What the fuck is it with that dream? It had been quite pleasant to start with, drifting gently above a strange planet, warm sun on her back, mysterious continents rolling by underneath. Then something happened, a smothering sensation that triggered an adrenaline rush, and she had to thrash about, trying to wake herself, push herself clear from that oppressive constriction. It was as if someone were trying to steal her soul. She yelled defiance at the dark force and finally managed to wake up. She was kicking and writhing as she shouted, Surely, yet actually, all she seemed to have done was shuffle around a bit and sit up. She looked about in confusion. Lycan's boudoir was still illuminated by the same warm light. Nobody else was awake. Clemence was curled up beside her, one arm draped over her legs. The girl was stirring, blinking in confusion as Araminta moved. Araminta stroked her tangled hair and cheek, soothing her as she would a troubled child. A drowsy Clemence smiled worshipfully and then closed her eyes again. Araminta blew out an exasperated breath and slowly sank back down. Despite the supple mattress, her body was stressed tight, which no doubt would annoy Nifran. As she lay there rigid, she could hear two of the harem women whimpering softly in their sleep. So she wasn't the only one suffering a bad dream. She wondered if she should creep across the room to wake them, but eventually they subsided into a deeper sleep, yet she still could not relax and drop off. There was something scrabbling about in her subconscious that was unsettling her, an elusive memory she was trying to connect, not the dream, something before that. Once again the program came to her aid. She cleared her mind and concentrated on her memories of the orgy. Physically it had been hugely satisfying. No denying that. And the harem had delighted in teaching her a whole range of sensual acts that they and Lycan enjoyed. But it was that ritual thing again. True passion had been missing, and with it the heat that came from abandoning herself the way she did with Bovi. This had been a little too much like mechanics, with all of them busy doing as Lycan instructed. Araminta sat up on the bed again, her skin cooling with shock. The memory of Lycan and Maracata was perfectly clear in her mind, all thanks to his wonderful program. And how's that for irony? She thought it through again, then reviewed some other suspicious recollections before finally dropping her head into her hands and groaning in dismay, Oh, shit. True to her word, Helena did not judge. She made no comment as the house emptied the drawers and closets, the clothes slithering away through the interstices between the rooms to fill her cases in the butler's lodge. Araminta almost wanted to ask how many others she had seen leave abruptly after a night with Lycan, but that would have been unfair to both of them. Her bedroom wound through the ovoid house and opened a door onto the path that ran around the outside of the building. Dawn light was shining a murky grey off the placid lake. Two of the household's smartly suited staff were loading her cases back into her carry capsule. It's a shame, sweetie, Helena said. I had you down as one who'd fit in easily here. Me too, Araminta said. 
She gave the maid a quick hug. Thanks for everything. Hey, it was nice meeting you. Adam interturned and walked out of the bedroom. The door unrolled behind her. Wait, Clemence called out. You can't leave. She was hurrying out of a door ten meters away, trying to pull on a translucent wrap. Lycan walked behind her, considerably more composed in a thick, dark purple robe. Not even going to say goodbye, he asked. There was a nasty frown on his puggish face. The house's net is active. You knew I was leaving. If you wanted to say anything before I left, you could, Araminta told him. And here you are. Yes, here I am. I would like to know why you're running out. I think I'm entitled after the offer I made you. I know you enjoyed yourself last night. So, what is this? Adaminta glanced at the distraught girl who was hovering between them, uncertain who to go to. Are you sure? Lycan took a step forward and put his arm around Clemence's shoulder, helping to pull her wrap on. I don't keep anything from my wives, even that they're psychoneural profiled. His face remained impassive. It was helpful to begin with. Helpful, she cried. You had them bred to be your slaves. Profiling like that is illegal. It always has been. It's a vile, inhuman thing to do. They don't have a choice. They don't have free will. It's obscene. Why, for Ozzy's sake, you don't need to force people into your bed. I probably would have joined you. And I know there are thousands of others who'd love the chance. Why did you do it? Lycan glanced down at Clemence with an almost paternal expression. They were the first, he said simply. First, of my harem. I had to start it somewhere. It was the bootstrap principle. What are you talking about? To start with, when you have nothing, you begin by pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps. I needed to be him, to be Nigel Sheldon. He had a harem, therefore I had one. You don't understand what that man was. He ruled hundreds of worlds, billions of people. I wasn't joking when I called him an emperor. He was the greatest human who ever lived. I need to know how to think like he did. He almost ground the words out. So you created slaves to achieve that. They're not slaves. All of us are predisposed to various personality traits. The way they combine, that's what makes us individuals. I just amplified a few of the behavioural attributes in the girls. Yeah, submissiveness. I watched them last night, Lycan. They obeyed you like they were bots. The relationship is a lot more complex than that. That's what it boils down to. Why didn't you profile yourself to think like Sheldon? If you have to wreck somebody, why not yourself? I have incorporated his known neural characteristics into my DNA, but a neural structure is only a vessel for personality. You need the environment as well, as complete as you can make it. Oh, for Ozzy's sake, you have deliberately, maliciously bred slaves. And you think that's an acceptable way to achieve what you are? That makes me sick. I don't want any part of you or your perverted family. You won't even let them go. Why don't you remove their profiling when they go for a rejuvenation treatment? I created them because of my belief. Wrongly, in your opinion. Now you think they should be altered because of your belief. Does that strike you as slightly ironic? There's an old saying that two wrongs don't make a right. I take responsibility for my wives, especially the profiled ones, just as Sheldon would have done. Araminta glowered at him, then switched her attention to Clemence, softening her expression to plead. Come with me. Come away from here. It's reversible. I can show you what it's like to be free, to be truly human. I know you don't believe me, but just please try. Try, Clemence. You're such a fool, the girl said. She pressed harder into Lycan. I'm not profiled. I like this. I like being in the harem. I like the money. I like the life. I like that my children will rule whole planets. Without Lycan, what will yours ever be? Themselves, Araminta said weakly. Clemence gave her a genuinely pitying look. That's not good enough for me. Araminta raised an uncertain hand. Is she... There were only ever three, Lycan said. Clemence is not one of them. 
Would you like to guess again? Araminta shook her head. She didn't trust herself to speak. Maracata. Maracata is one, I know. Perhaps if I just... Goodbye, Lycan said. Araminta climbed into the carry capsule and told it to take her home. Oscar had never thought he would return to the very place where he had died. Of course, he had not expected to see Paula Mayo again either. To make matters worse, enterprising, faraway natives had turned his last desperate hyperglide flight into a tourist attraction. Worse still, it was a failing attraction. Still, at least Oscar had gotten to name the brand new starship ANA had delivered to Oricum for him, and without much thought went and called it the Elvin's Payback. There was a large briefing file sitting in its smart core, which he zipped through, and then sent a few queries to Paula, who by then was back in her own starship and en route to somewhere. She wouldn't say where. After he had finished the file, one thing became very clear to him. Paula had overestimated his abilities severely. There were a lot of very powerful, very determined groups searching for the second dreamer. Now, that might not have phased Paula, but... I'm only a pilot, he repeated to her, when she called him on a secure TD channel and asked him why he was flying too far away. She hadn't said she could track Elvin's payback, but somehow he wasn't surprised. I'm going to need help, and as you trust me, so I trust someone else. He got an evil little buzz out of not telling her who, though he suspected she would know. It was hardly hyperspace science. He landed at the Armstrong City starport, a huge field to the northeast of the city, with four big terminal buildings handling passenger flights and a grid of warehouses where freighters came and went. He picked out a parking pad near the fence, away from any real activity. As the starship descended, he swept its visual sensors across the ancient city that spread back from the shore of the North Sea. Inevitably, there was a dense congregation of tall towers and pyramids above the coast, while broad estates of big houses swamped the land behind. It was all a lot more chaotic than the layout of most Commonwealth cities, which he rather enjoyed. He was looking for a glimpse of Highway 1, the historic road where his friends had chased the Star Flyer to its doom. All that remained was a long, fat urban strip, following the old route, as it struck out for miles across the great Irrill steppes, as if city buildings were seeking to escape from their historical anchor at the centre. As in every Commonwealth world, Faraway's ground traffic was a shrinking minority. The sky above the city swarmed with regrav capsules. Oscar floated down out of the airlock underneath Alvin's payback and stood once more on the ground of far away. For some ridiculous reason he was trembling. He took a long moment, breathing in the air, then moved away from the starship. His feet pushed gently on the short grass, sending his body gliding in a short arc in the low gravity. He had forgotten how enjoyable that part of this world was. Those sore hop steps were a freedom like having teenage hormones again. Once he'd cleared the ship, he stopped and turned a full circle. There was the city skyline on one side, some distant mountains, nothing he recognized apart from the glorious sapphire sky. Thankfully, that remained the same as the planet's biosphere slowly regenerated with the new plants and creatures humans had brought to this world. Warm sea air gusted constantly from the passage of starships using the terminals, ruffling his hair. It was all very different from Oricum's main starport, which he had flown from, supporting barely fifty flights a day. But then, far away was the self-proclaimed capital of the external worlds, the planet that had refused political and economic integration with the greater Commonwealth. Even today it was technically only an affiliate member. Its staunch independence had inspired a whole generation of newly settled worlds after the Starflyer War. The political will, coupled with the end of CST's transport monopoly that the starships had brought, allowed the first cultural division to open within Commonwealth society as a whole. As the Sheldon dynasty had made Bionics available, starting higher culture, faraways Barsoomians had introduced genetic improvements that took the human body far beyond its natural meridian, developing into the Advancer movement. After that, 
far away with its fierce libertarianist tradition, declared itself the ideological counterweight to Earth and ANA. The Commonwealth senators might regard the notion with their ancient wise disdain, but faraway citizens believed in their own destiny. Oscar smiled at the busy city as he experienced the emotional tide of the local Gaia field. Even that had a stridency that celebrated the stubbornness of the inhabitants. His U shadow opened a channel to the planetary cybersphere and called a one time address code he had been given eighty six years earlier on the day he had emerged from the Relife Clinic. To his surprise, it was answered immediately. Yes? I need to see you, Oscar said. I have a problem, and I need help sorting it out. Who the fuck are you, and how did you steal this code? I am Oscar Munro, and this code was given to me some time ago. There was a long pause, though the channel remained open. If you are an imposter, you have one chance to walk away, and that chance is now. I know who I am, Oscar said. We'll know if you are. Good. Very well. Be at the Kaim Sanctuary on top of Mount Herculaneum in one hour. One of us will meet you. The channel went dead. Oscar grinned. He shouldn't be all fired up by this. He really shouldn't. His U Shadow contacted a local hire company, and he rented a high performance Ingrav capsule. Given who he was going to meet, he did not want to risk technology leakage by arriving in an ultra drive ship. The capsule bounced him over to Mount Herculaneum in a semi-ballistic lob that took twenty-eight minutes. The last time he'd seen the colossal volcano had been the day he had died by crashing into its lower slopes. This time his arrival was a lot more comfortable. The capsule shot out of the upper atmosphere and followed the planet's curvature southwest. He watched through the sensors as the Grand Triad rose up out of the horizon. They were still the biggest mountains to be found on an H-congruous world. On a planet with standard gravity, they would have collapsed under their own weight, but here they had kept on growing as the magma pushed farther and farther upward. Mount Herculaneum, the biggest, stood 32 kilometers high, its plateau summit rising high above faraway's troposphere. Northward, Mount Zeus topped out at 17 kilometers. South of Herculaneum, Mount Titan reached up 23 kilometers. It was the only one of the triad to remain active. Oscar's capsule rode a tight curve above the sea-like grasslands of the Aldrin Plains before it began to sink again. The view was magnificent, with the vast cone of Herculaneum spread out below him. Its plateau of grubby brown regolith was broken by twin calderas. Around that, naked rock dropped down to the glacier ring far below before the lower slopes finally were smothered in pine forests and low meadowland. Luckily for him, Titan was semi-active today. He looked down almost vertically into its glowing red crater, watching the slow-motion ripples spreading out across the huge lake of lava. Radiant white boulders spit upward out of the inferno to traverse lazy arcs through the vacuum, spitting orange sparks. Some of them were flung far enough to clear the crater wall and begin a long fall to oblivion. His sight inevitably was drawn to the long funnel canyon between Zeus and Titan that led to the base of Herculaneum. Stakeout Canyon was where the storm winds coming off the Hondu Ocean were funneled into a rampaging blast of air. The insane thrill-seekers of the early Commonwealth used to fly their hypergliders on wind so strong that they'd pushed them out of the atmosphere and over Herculaneum. He'd never gotten to attempt that last part, crashing his hyperglider into Anna so that Wilson might stand a chance to reach the summit. Even though he had braced himself for an emotional shockwave at seeing the sight of his death, he felt nothing more than mild curiosity. That must mean I'm perfectly adjusted to this new life, right? As he looked along the long rocky cleft in the ground, his exovision pulled up meteorological data and a file telling him that the winds now were never as strong as they had been a thousand years ago. Transforming had calmed far away's atmosphere. Hypergliding was just a legend now. The capsule took him down to a big dome situated right on the eastern edge of Mount Herculaneum's plateau, where the cliffs of Aphrodite's seat began their sheer eight-kilometer fall. There was a pressure field over the entrance to the dome's landing chamber, a big metal cave with enough room for twenty passenger capsules. It had only two resting inside, 
with another five ordinary capsules parked nearby. Oscar stepped through the airlock pressure curtains into the dome's main arena and paid his 20 F.A. dollar entrance fee from a credit coin Paula had given him. There were three low buildings inside, lined up behind Aphrodite's seat. He went over to the fur, he said as they walked back to Oscar's capsule. In full, Tomancio McFoster Stewart, it was my father who provided you with our code 86 years ago. I barely saw him. The government had a tight little cordon around my room. They were anxious that I should have my privacy. Yet he just walked right in, and out again, too. We thought you'd forgotten us, Tomancio said. Or worse. I'm not what I used to be, Oscar said. At least that's what I thought. And yet here you are. It's an interesting time to come and seek us out again, for both the greater Commonwealth and the galaxy at large. Not the kind of time a man chooses to indulge in nostalgia. No, this has nothing to do with nostalgia. They sat themselves in the capsule. Do you mind if I navigate? Tomancio asked. You would find it difficult to reach our lands unaided. Of course, Oscar said. His curiosity rose as they slid out of the dome's landing chamber. Where are your lands? Where they've always been. From the northeast corner of the Desalt Mountains all the way to the Oak Sea. The capsule began to accelerate, streaking northward over the mountains as it gained altitude. For the first time, Oscar saw the high desert around which the lofty peaks huddled protectively. And I couldn't find you. That peak is Mount St. Omer, isn't it? The Marie Celeste crashed close by. Knowing and reaching are two separate things. I didn't know you all turned Buddhist and spoke in fortune cookies. Demancio tilted his head to one side with avian precision. His attractive smile was poised. Ah, I see. I'm not being deliberately enigmatic, though perhaps I am guilty of over-dramatizing. But you are very precious to us, Oscar. I'm hoping to impress you. Just for a moment, Oscar felt as if he had lived through every one of those eleven hundred years. He had to history mine to understand me. Jesus fuck. He had been far too sheltered with his life partners. Small wonder he always felt as if the house put up a cosy barrier between his little family and the outside world. We protect our lands with a tea sphere, Tomancio said. Really? I thought only Earth had one. We don't advertise. It's actually quite an elegant defense on many levels, although it does require a colossal amount of energy to maintain. If you walk or drive or fly toward us, as you approach our border, you're simply teleported to the other side. You can't knock on a door, which you never face. You have to be invited in. Cool. The lands they fell toward seemed particularly lush, thick greenery split by meandering rivers, forest and meadowland squabbling to dominate valleys and rolling hills. Always to the east there was a glimpse of the Oak Sea. They re-entered the atmosphere. Strands of cloud rushed up past the capsule's transparent hull, thickening fast. Then they were through and a forest canopy unfolded below them, leaves of every colour, trees of immense size. Far away had always celebrated its unique genetic diversity. Starting with a nearly sterile landscape, the terraforming teams had brought the seeds of a hundred planets with them to create the ultimate contrasting florascape. Here we go, Tomancio said as their altitude approached three miles. The view outside suddenly switched. Oscar jumped in his seat. They were floating a hundred yards above the ground at the head of a long valley. Blue-green grass rippled away for miles on every side, lapping against woodlands that spilled out of the dips in the valley walls. There were houses all around them, built from wood and stone, blending nicely with the environment, like a medieval village back on earth, but on a much grander scale. You live here? Oscar asked. Yes. I'm envious. Appearances can be deceiving. This is the end of the CD. The program continues on the next CD. The capsule touched down outside one of the stone houses, a long building with age blackened wood beams protruding from beneath a slate roof. A balcony ran along one side. Big windows were open, showing a glimpse of a very modern interior. The grass swept right up to the walls, emphasizing the impression of natural harmony. Oscar stepped out wearily. The Gaia field was resonating with a warm, subtle joy, 
wrapping him in a daydream of a child being swept up in its mother's arms, the comfort and security of being home. It was a welcome emanating from the people hurrying across the land to greet him. They came out of nearby houses or simply teleported in, popping into existence to enlarge the crowd. Then the horses appeared, a whole cavalry squad riding up over a nearby ridge, dressed in dark uniforms that trailed gold and scarlet heraldic streamers behind their shoulders. The horses were clad in metal mesh, with hems of gold tassels brushing the tips of the grass. He stared at the giant, fearsome beasts with their metal-clad horns and sharp tusks, memories stirring. "'I've seen one of those before,' he exclaimed excitedly. "'On our drive to the mountains. A Charlemagne. Somebody guided us.' "'Yes,' Tamancio said. "'We still train to fight on them, but we've never actually ridden them into battle since the planet's revenge.' It's all ceremonial now, part of our skill set. The riders are here to honor your arrival, as do the King Eagles. He gestured upward. Oscar just managed not to flinch. He did gasp, though. A flock of giant avian creatures swirled overhead, resembling the petrosaurs of Earth's dinosaur era. They had been created by the Barsoomians as part of their quest for genetic expansion. Each one had a rider dressed in long, flowing robes that fluttered behind him. They waved as they passed overhead, turning and twisting with amazing finesse. Oscar grinned unashamedly at their acrobatic antics. Surely those riders had to be strapped on. Tomancio cleared his throat discreetly. Perhaps a few words, he whispered into Oscar's ear. Oscar had been so entranced by the King Eagles, he hadn't noticed how many people were gathered in front of him. He gazed across them, slightly unnerved by their appearance. It was as if some kind of athletic squad had turned out to see him. Without fail they were tall. The men were handsome, the women beautiful, and all of them hugely fit. Even the smiling, eager children were healthy specimens. He couldn't help thinking of H. G. Wells's particular vision of the future from the time machine. Here in their protected Edenistic garden, the knight's guardians were like the Eloi, but with muscles and attitude. Heaven help the Morlock who wandered into this valley. Oscar drew a breath, really trying not to think about the media briefings he had had to give while he was in the Navy. I haven't been too far away for a very long time. Too long, actually. You have made it a thrilling world, a world respected across the Commonwealth. For that I thank you, as I do for this welcome. The applause was heartfelt enough. Oscar bobbed his head, smiling at the earnest faces. He was hugely relieved when Tomancio ushered him into the house. The reception room was clad in what looked like translucent white fabric that emitted a mild glow. There were strange deep folds in the walls that hinted at parallel compartments. Aspects of the T-sphere, Oscar guessed. The furniture was solid enough, as was the little shrine that rested on a broad ancient wood table at the far end. Oscar slowed to a halt as he stared at the black, shrouded holographic portrait with its single candle burning underneath. The cat's prim face returned her best enigmatic smile. For every yin, a yang, Oscar murmured grimly. He should have known. The valley had been too idyllic. Tomancio came up to stand beside him. You knew her, didn't you? You actually spoke to her as you travelled to far away. We spent a day together on a carbon goose flying across halfway. I wouldn't say I knew her well. How I envy you that day. Did she frighten you? I was wary of her. We all were. Perhaps you should be. I would not be frightened. I would be honoured. She is evil. Of course she is, but she is also noble. She showed us the way. She gave the guardians of selfhood purpose once more. She was the one who brought us together with the Barsoomians. After the Starflyer was destroyed, after you helped kill it, Oscar, there was nothing left for our ancestors. Bradley Johansson originally built us out of the ruin of enslavement. He forged us into warrior tribes to fight the greatest battle humans had ever known, the battle to save our entire species. And when it was over, he was dead and we were lost doomed to wither away as a dwindling band of old soldiers without a cause, an anachronistic embarrassment as far away was civilized by the Commonwealth. Soldiers always have to hang up their weapons in the end. You don't understand. 
It was our ethos she rescued. She showed us that strength is a virtue, a blessing. It is our evolution and should not be denied the way the liberals of the Commonwealth do, treating it as if it were some ignominious part of us to be always denied. If we had not been strong, if Bradley had not remained steadfast, the Commonwealth would have died on the same day you did, Oscar. If the Barsoomians hadn't maintained their clarity, today's humans would be emaciated, short-lived creatures. He smiled at the portrait. One of us had strength, the other purpose. She saw them both and combined them into a single bold principle. She gave us a vision we can remain forever true to. There is no shame in strength, Oscar. I know, Oscar said reluctantly. That's why I'm here. I had hoped that. You said you needed help. I do. He paused. What if it goes against your ideology? Demancio laughed. We don't have one, Oscar. That's the point of the Knight's Guardian movement. We follow one creed. Strength. That is what we want to impart to humanity as it grows and diversifies. It is the most basic evolutionary tenet. Those sections of humanity that embrace it will survive. It's as simple as that. We are nature as raw as it can get. The fact that we are perceived as nothing other than mercenaries is not our problem. When we are hired to perform a job, we do it thoroughly. I need subtlety for this, at least to begin with. We can do subtle, Oscar. Covert operations are one of our specialties. We embrace all forms of human endeavor apart from the blatantly wicked or stupid. For instance, we won't perform a heist for you. The Knights Guardians take their oath of honor very seriously. Oscar almost started to ask about the cat and what she used to do, but decided against it. I have to find someone and then extend them an offer of protection. That sounds very worthy. Who is it? The second dreamer. For the first time since they had met, Oscar witnessed Tomancio losing his reserve. No shit. The night's guardian started to laugh. Twelve hundred years without you. And now you bring us this. Oscar, you were almost worth the wait. The second dreamer himself. He suddenly sobered. I won't ask why. But thank you, from the bottom of my simple heart, for coming to us. The why is actually very simple. There are too many people who wish to influence him. If he does choose to emerge from the shadows, he should be free to make his own choice. To go to the void or not. To possibly trigger the end of the galaxy in pursuit of our race's fate. Or not. What a grail to guard, Oscar. What a challenge. I take it that's a yes. My team will be ready to leave in less than an hour. Will you be leading them? What do you think? I was so sure, Araminta exclaimed. She was this mild, scatty little thing. She did everything he told her to, and I do mean everything. Face it, darling. At the time you weren't in any position to be the perfect observer, Cressida said archly. But it was the way she did it. You don't understand. She was eager, obedient, like the other ones, I think. Shit. Do you think he was lying to me? Maybe she is profiled, and he told her to always give that answer. Araminta made an effort to calm down. Alcohol was a good suppressant. She tipped the wine bottle over her glass. There was none left. Damn. Cressida signaled the smart-suited waiter. Quite an offer, though. Yeah. What is it about men? Why are they all complete shits? I mean, what kind of mentality does that? Those women are slaves. I know. The waiter brought another bottle over and flipped the seal. The gentleman over there has asked if he can pay for it. Araminta and Cressida looked across toward the giant floor-to-ceiling window, which gave them a stunning view out across the luminous glow of the nighttime city. The bar was on the 35th floor of the Salamartin Hotel Tower, and attracted a lot of tourist types who thought nothing of paying the absurd bar prices. Every room in the hotel was taken by living dream followers, which was why the lobby was besieged by protesters. Araminta had forced her way through the angry chanting mob to plead with the doorman to let her in. She had been frightened. There was a strong threat of violence building up on the street. Cressida, of course, had the authorization code to land her capsule on the executive rooftop pad. 
The man smiling at them from a table in front of the window was dressed in natural fabric clothes, styled as only a Macathrin resident would wear. No, Araminta and Cressida chorused. The waiter smiled, understanding, and started pouring. Araminta watched morosely as her glass was filled. Do you think I should go to the police? No, Cressida said emphatically. You do not go down that road, not ever. He sat you next to the Prime Minister at dinner for Ozzy's sake. You know how powerful he is. Besides which, no police force on the planet would investigate him. And even if they did, they'd never be able to prove anything. Those girls, if you were right, and I'm not saying you're not, wouldn't ever be found, let alone analysed to see if their brains were wired up illegally. Forget it. How about the Commonwealth Government? Don't they have some kind of crime agency? The Intersolar Serious Crimes Directorate. So you take a trip to their local office, which is probably on a Leslin, and you walk in and say you think some of his wives might be psychoneural profiled because of how they behaved while you were all having sex together, an orgy during which, incidentally, your macrocellular clusters were running a sexual narcotic program. It wasn't a narcotic, Araminta said automatically. Point in your favour, then. That should do it. All right. What if I told them about his commercial plans, the way he's built up Albany's capacity? Tell whom? Araminta pouted. For a friend, Cressida was not being very helpful. I'm not sure. The Industrial Association of Alezalin, or whatever it's called. Do you think they don't know? Albany isn't something you can hide. And exactly what has that got to do with psychoneural profiling? I don't know. Sounds more like vengeance than justice to me. He's a shit. He deserves it. Was he good in bed? Araminta hoped she wasn't blushing as she concentrated on pouring more wine. He was adequate. Listen, darling, I'm afraid this is one of those nasty times when you just have to forget him and move on. You learned a valuable lesson, just how ruthless you have to be to get on in this sad old universe of ours. Araminta's head collapsed down into her hands, sending her hair tumbling around her glass. Oh, great Ozzy, I went and had sex with him. How humiliating is that? She wished she could get rid of the memory, at least the bit about how much she had enjoyed herself. Actually, there were various commercially available routines and drugs capable of performing neat little memory edits. Oh, stop being so self-pitying, girl. There, there. Cressida reached over and patted Araminta's hand. By now he'll have had half a dozen more girls in his bed and won't even remember your name. It never meant as much to him as it does to you. And you're telling me this to cheer me up? That was his deal, wasn't it? You would be the second Friday on months with an R in them. Yeah, I know. Hell, I'm a big girl. I knew what I was doing. With hindsight, yes, the view is always clear. Araminta brought her head up and grinned. Thank you for not judging. You're still a work in progress, and I think you're improving under my tuition. This was a much smaller mistake than Laryl. When you want to cheer someone up, you really go for it, don't you? Cressida pushed her glass across the table and clinked it to the rim of Araminta's. You're starting to understand life. That's good. So what are you going to do about Mr. Bovey? Araminta grimaced. Mr. Bovey's proposal, actually. What? He didn't. He did. Marriage with me once I've gone multiple. And you think I'm pushy? Wait a minute. Did he ask you this before? You had your little visit to Lycan. Um, yes. You go, my girl. So what was the Lycan thing all about? Trying out options while I consider what to do? Wow. Have you ever considered going multiple? Lycan said it was purely a lifestyle choice, not a business one. I'm not so sure. Ten pairs of extra hands would be very useful in my line of work. I haven't considered it, no. It's still only one mind, which is all a lawyer needs. But if you're serious about property development, then I can see the practical advantages. It's self-limiting, though, isn't it? It's saying I'll always be somebody stuck doing some kind of manual job. Your pride seems to be a very fluid thing. I just want to... She didn't know how to finish that sentence, not at all. I don't know. I was just shaken up by what happened on the weekend, and I had this really awful dream, too. 
I was like this really big creature flying over a planet when someone tried to smother me. Been having a few of those lately. Do you suppose it's stress? Cressida gave her a puzzled look. Darling, everyone has had that dream. It was the second dreamer's dream of the Skylord over Querencia, and that wasn't someone trying to smother you. That was Ethan trying to talk to the Skylord direct. They say he's still in a coma in the hospital with his minions trying to repair his burnt-out brain. I couldn't have dreamed that. Why not? I don't have guillemots. It always seemed a bit silly to me, like a weak version of the Unisphere. Cressida became very still. She pushed her glass aside and took Araminta's hand. Are you being serious? Serious about what? Didn't your mother tell you? Tell me what? Araminta felt panicky. She wanted another drink, but Cressida's grasp was surprisingly strong. About our great-great-great-grandmother. What about her? It was Melanie Rescori. After all that build-up, Araminta felt badly disappointed. She'd at least been expecting some dynasty heir, maybe old earth royalty, not someone she'd never heard of. Oh, who is she? A friend of the Sylphan. She was named their friend. You know what that means? Not really, no. Araminta's knowledge of the Sylphan was a little vague, a weird humanoid race that everyone called elves. They sang gibberish and had a bizarre wormhole network. Our technology is just as good. Who wants to live like that? You seriously need to review Inigo's dreams before you make that sort of judgment. The water walker transforms an entire human society. So he's a talented politician. Oh no, darling. He's much more than that. He revealed the true nature of the void to us. He showed us what it can do. That kind of power scares me shitless, which is precisely what so many find so attractive. Cressida waved her elegant hand at the Living Dream supporters. Ozzy, help us if these dreadful little fools ever gain the same ability the Water Walker discovered. Eating up the galaxy would be the least of our worries. Inigo's Sixth Dream Nearly eighty probationary constables sat together in a block of seats on the ultra-black floor of Malfit Hall, as the vast arching ceiling above played images of wispy clouds traversing the beautiful gold and pink dawn sky. Ediard had one of the seats in the second row, and kept his head tipped back so he could watch the giant ceiling in astonishment. He was sure it must be the marvel of the world. His fellow squadmates were all amused by his reaction, not that they'd actually been in the Orchard Palace before, except for Dinley, but at least they'd known about the moving imagery, and they hadn't thought to warn him. Etyard gasped as Nikran rose up into the replica sky. The ruddy brown planet here was a lot larger than it ever appeared in Quarentia's skies. He could see tiny features etched on the world's eternal deserts. For some reason that made him think of it as an actual place rather than an element of the celestial panorama. Does anyone live there? He whispered to Cancine, who was in the chair next to him. She looked at him, frowning, then glanced up at the image of Nikran and giggled. What? Maxon hissed. Edyard wants to know if anyone lives on Nikran, Cassine announced solemnly. The whole squad snickered. Surrounding squads joined in. Edyard felt his face heating up. Why not? he protested. Ra's ship fell onto this world. Why not another ship to Nikran? Absolutely, Maxon said. Perfectly valid question. In fact, there's a whole other Makathran up there. Ediard ignored them and simply looked straight ahead in a dignified manner. He resolved never to tell his friends of his dreams and what they showed him. The block of probationary constables settled down. Ediard started to concentrate on what he was seeing. They were facing the grand curving staircase that dominated one side of the hall. Owen, the mayor of Macathran, had appeared at the top, followed by the guild masters and district masters who made up the upper council. They were all wearing their full ceremonial robes, producing a splendid blaze of colour as they filed down to the floor of the hall. Oh, lady, Dinley groaned. Ediard caught a sensation of queasiness emanating from his friend. Ten seconds maximum, he told Dinley, using a tiny directed long talk voice. Then it's all over. Just hold it together for ten seconds. You can do that. Dinley nodded while appearing completely unconvinced. 
Edyard resisted looking at the much bigger block of seats behind him, where the families and friends of the probationary constables were gathered to watch them receive their bronze epaulets. It was probably an exaggeration, but half of them were Dinley's family, and all of them were in uniform. "'I bet there's a crime wave going on in every district,' Maxon had muttered while they were taking their seats earlier. "'There aren't any constables left out there to patrol.' Owen reached the platform that had been set up at the bottom of the stairs. He smiled at the attentive audience. "'It is always an honour and a privilege for me to perform this ceremony,' he said. "'In my position I hear so many people complain, not just about the state which the city is in, but of the chaos which supposedly reigns in the lands outside our crystal walls. I wish they were standing here now to see so many young people coming forward to serve their city.' I am heartened by the sense of duty you are displaying in making this commitment to serve your fellow citizens. You give me confidence for the future. Now that's a real politician, Edyard thought uncharitably. The mayor of all people must have known how inadequate the number of constables was, known that the eighty of them there weren't enough, that at least an equal number of constables had left in the last few months to become private bodyguards, or for a better-paid and respected job as a sheriff in some provincial town. Why doesn't he do something about it? The mayor finished his inspirational speech. The probationary constables stood up as one, and then the first row trooped up to the platform to be greeted by the mayor. The chief constable read each probationer's name out to the hall, while an assistant handed a pair of epaulets to the mayor to be presented with a handshake and a smile. Eddyard's row started to move forward. He had thought that this would be boring at the least, that it was stupid, an irritation he could have done without, especially as the only person in the audience clapping for him was Salrana, who had been given a day off from her duties. But now he was here. Now he was walking up to the mayor of the entire city. He actually began to feel a sense of occasion. Behind him the audience was radiant with pride. They believed in the constables. In front... The upper council was registering its approval. None of the councillors had to be there. It was a ceremony repeated three times a year, every year. They had been to dozens and would have to come to dozens more. If they had wanted to cry off, they could have done that. But it was important enough for them to turn out every time. And here he was himself, coming forward to make a public pledge to the citizens of Macathran that he would do his best to protect them and implement the rule of law. That was why Ra and those who followed him into office had created this ceremony and others like it, to recognize and honor the commitment the constables made to their city and lives. It was neither silly nor a waste of time. It was a show of respect. Eddyard stood in front of the mayor, who smiled politely and shook his hand as the chief constable read out his name. A pair of bronze epaulets was pressed into his hand. Thank you, sir, Eddyard said. There was a lump in his throat. I won't let you down. Ashwell will never happen here. If the mayor was surprised, he did not show it. Eddyard caught sight of Finiton standing on the grand staircase, the master of the egg, and Imelan of the chemistry guild. This is Constable Eddyard from the Rulan province, a friend of my old master. Masters, Eddyard bowed formally. Then he saw Salrana pluck at her skirt and hold the fabric up daintily on one side as she performed a peculiar little bow that involved bending her knees and keeping her back straight. "'And novice Salrana,' Finiton said smoothly, "'also from Rulan.' "'A pleasure,' Imelan said. Edyard did not care for the way the master's eyes lingered on Salrana. "'You're a long way from home, novice,' the master said. "'No, sir.' she said in a polite tone. Macathron is my home now. Well said, novice, Finiton said. I wish all our citizens were as appreciative of the city as you are. Now, Finiton, grayly chided, this is not the day. Apologies. Finiton inclined his head at the youngsters. So, Edyard, have you had a run-in with our criminal element yet? A few, sir, yes. He's being very modest, sir, Salrana said. He led his squad after some thieves in the Silverham market. He recovered the stolen items as well. Eddyard shifted awkwardly under the scrutiny of all three masters. And are these miscreants now labouring away at the Trampello mine to pay for their crime? Imelan asked. No, sir, 
Ediard admitted. They got away. That time. They won't again. I imagine they won't, Finneton said with an edge of amusement. Come along, Ediard. Let me introduce you to the mayor. It's about time he saw an honourable man again. Sir? Old joke. We often clash in the council. He signalled them to follow him. Not over anything important to the lives of real people, of course. The mayor of Macathran was talking to the Pythia, just beside the little platform where he had handed out the epaulets. If he was bored or annoyed to be introduced to a new constable, he did not show it. Edyard had never encountered a mind so perfectly shielded, not that he paid much attention. He was entranced by the Pythia. He had been expecting some ancient woman full of grandmotherly warmth. Instead, he was disconcerted to find that the Pythia retained the beauty of a woman still awaiting her half-century, a beauty only emphasized by her gold-trimmed white robe, with its flowing hood that she wore forward, casting her face in a slight shadow. Salrana did her strange bow again to the Pythia. "'The lady's blessing upon you, my child,' the Pythia said. She sounded bored in that way Macathran's aristocrats always did when they had to deal with those they considered to be of a lower order. That wasn't what Ediard had expected from a Pythia. Then she turned her attention to him. Startlingly light blue eyes fixed on him, surrounded by a mass of thick bronze hair twined with gold and silver leaves. The eyes narrowed in judgment, which Ediard found heartbreaking. He felt like he had disappointed her, which was a terrible thing. Then she smiled, banishing his worry. Now you are interesting, constable, she said. My lady, he stammered. He somehow could feel the Pythia's farsight on him, as if she were picking through his mind. There was something disconcertingly intimate about the contact. Oh, this is your graduation day. Don't let that daft old bat spoil it for you. She's embarrassingly well connected, as you would be if you clung to life for so long. Wouldn't surprise me if she did drink the blood of virgins after all. Your pardon, novice. I've heard of Mistress Florel, sir. Salrana said. Everyone in the city has, Finneton said. That's why she thinks she's so important, instead of just old and obnoxious. He put his hand on Ediard's shoulder. And I say that as her great-great-nephew myself, twice removed, thankfully. Thank you, sir, Ediard said. Now off you go and enjoy yourselves. And, Ediard, when the time comes for you to apply for promotion to officer rank, come and see me again. I'll be happy to sign the letter. Sir? Ediard asked incredulously. You heard. Now be off with the pair of you. It's a bold, bad city out there. Have fun. Ediard did not need telling again. He and Salrana made for the hall's big archway, which led out to the antechambers. Hey, Ediard, Maxon called, hurrying to intercept him. Where are you off to? Just out, Ediard said. He didn't even want to glance over his shoulder in case Mistress Florel was looking his way. Maxon reached them and skidded to a halt. Mother and Dybal are taking me to the Rekas restaurant to celebrate. It's an open invitation to my squad mates as well. Maxon stopped and smiled at Salrana. Novice? I had no idea Ediard kept such pleasant company. He gave Ediard an expectant look, ever the injured party. This is novice Salrana from my home village, Ediard said sulkily. That is one village I'm definitely going to have to visit. Maxon bowed deeply. "'Why is that, Constable?' she asked. "'To see if all the girls there are as beautiful as yourself?' She laughed. Ediard groaned, glaring in warning at Maxon. "'The invitation to Rekas is, of course, extended to the friends of my squad mates, novice. "'The friends accept with thanks,' she said primly. "'But only if you stop calling me novice. "'It will be my delight, Salrana.' and I will also beg you to tell of Edyard's early life. It would seem he's been keeping secrets from us. Those who entrust our lives to him, no less. Shocking, she agreed. I will entertain such a request, if correctly made. Salrana, a horrified Edyard exclaimed. Excellent, Maxon said. I'll arrange another gondola for our party. Now, Edyard, where is Cansine? Ediard glowered at his so-called friend. Ediard? Salrana prompted with a jab to his ribs. Over there, Ediard said it without having to concentrate. Through his farsight he was automatically aware of all his squadmates, 
a trait Che always tried to emphasize. He pointed to where Cancine was chatting with a heavily pregnant woman and a man in a smart tunic with the crest of the shipwrights' guild. Her sister came to the ceremony. They're catching up. No sign of her mother, then, poor thing, Maxon said sadly. Ah, well, I'll go and ask her. Boyd's family are all here, Ediard said. And will yet sink under the weight of Dinley's relatives, Maxon concluded, direct lineage. She whispered about one red-tinged façade where Maxon's father had lived. When Ediard glanced at the gondola in front, both Maxon and Bidjuli were looking in the opposite direction. All the stately buildings had low water-level archways leading into the warren of cellars underneath, guarded by thick iron gates that the families maintained in excellent order. The walls of the Perdard family's palace were at an angle, actually overhanging the water. When Ediard looked up, he saw a glassed-in mirror door running the length of the upper story, with several youngsters standing there watching the gondolas. A fabulously rich trading family, Cancine said, with a fleet of thirty ships. They passed through the high pool, which provided a junction with flight canal and market canal. There was a bridge on either side of the pool. The first one was the cities, a simple high white arch to which carpenters had attached a broad rail along both sides. Famously, the apex was a ten-yard stretch of crystal, providing a view directly past any pedestrian's shoes down onto the water and the gondolas thirty yards below. Not everyone could walk across it. The sight was too much for some, as many as one in twenty, the doctor's guild claimed. At Che's insistence, Ediard and the rest of the squad had used it several times on patrol. Ediard had had to gird himself to walk those few invisible yards. The vertigo wasn't strong enough to stop him, though it was unpleasant. All the squad mates had forced themselves across it. Surprisingly, Dinley had been the least affected. The bridge on the other side of Highpool was constructed out of iron and wood, a bulky, creaking thing in comparison to its cousin, yet with far more traffic. Past the pool, the towers of Erie stabbed up into the clean azure sky, as if ready to impale any passing skylord. Fieca District's cliff-like frontage swarmed with vine plants, with long strands of flowers bubbling out of the emerald and russet leaves. Only the windows remained clear of foliage, producing deep-set black holes in the lush living carpet. The gondolas pulled up at a mooring just beyond Forest Pool, and everyone climbed out. Daibal paid the gondoliers, and they all set off to the round tower that housed the Rakers restaurant on its third floor. Hansalt, the owner and chief chef, had reserved for Daibal a table beside a long window overlooking one of the district's colourful plazas. An auspicious day for us! Daibal announced, as a waitress brought over a tray with chilled white wine. First, a toast to your squad, Maxon. May you rid the city of crime. They drank to that. Ediard gave the glass a suspicious glance. He'd never seen wine with bubbles in it before, but when he sipped it, the taste was surprisingly light and fruity. He rather liked it. Secondly, Daibal said, to Ediard, for being appointed squad leader. Ediard blushed. Speech? Maxen demanded. Not a chance, Ediard grunted. They laughed and drank to that. Thirdly, his voice softened, and he looked down at Bidjuli. I am very proud to announce that my beloved has agreed to marry me. The cheer that went out very pretty and slim. I've seen what your eye lingers on when we're out on patrol. She's far too young for a start. And she's getting pretty. Doctors in Macathran have better ointments than we had on the caravan. Edyard, Cancine gave a small, shocked laugh. I think that's the most evil thing I've ever heard you say about anyone, let alone your little sister. Lady, you're cruel. I don't answer a question to your satisfaction, and you say I'm in denial. Then I give an honest answer, and you brand me evil. She sucked contritely on her lower lip. Sorry. But you can understand why. Not really. Ediard was looking at her profile, in the coppery shimmer thrown off by the surface of the pool. In such a light she looked almost aristocratic, with her strong chin and slight nose, skin painted enticingly dark. She turned to face him, cocking her head slightly to one side in that questioning way he enjoyed. 
He leaned forward and kissed her. She pressed in against him, hands sliding over his back. For once he dropped his mental guard, showing her how much he delighted in the touch of her, the closeness. After a long time, they ended the kiss. Her nose rubbed against his cheek, and she let him sense how much that meant to her. Come to bed with me, he murmured. His tongue darted out to lick the lobe of her ear. She shivered from the contact. Hot lines of pleasure flickered across her mind. He was delightfully aware of her breasts against his chest and hugged her closer. This is going to be the best ever. No, she said. Her shoulders dropped, and she rested her hands against his shoulders, moving them apart to end the embrace. I'm sorry, Edyard. I feel a lot for you. I really do. You know that. That's the trouble. What do you mean? We could work, you and me. I really think we could. Lovers, then marriage, children, everything. I'm not afraid of that. It's just the timing. It's wrong. Timing. I don't think you're ready for a long-term commitment yet. And I certainly don't need another fling, not with someone I care about. It wouldn't have to be a fling. I'm ready to settle down with someone as important to me as you are. Oh, lady, you're sweet, she sighed. No, Ediard, I can't compete against the ideal of Salrana. You're closer to her than you know or will admit. How could you not be, after all the two of you shared? I'm not jealous, well, not exactly. But she's always going to be there between us until you sort your feelings out. She's just a kid from the same village, that's all. Open your feelings to me. Show me your naked mind and say you don't want to bed her. You don't want to know the feel of her against you. I... No, this is stupid. You're accusing me of... I don't know. Having dreams. This world is full of opportunities. Some we grasp, others we pass by. It's not me who's scared of what might be. You need to look at your own feelings. They were standing apart now, voices not raised but firm. I know my own feelings she said, and I want yours to match mine. That means I can wait. You're worth waiting for, Ediard, however long it takes. You mean that much to me? Well, that's got to be the craziest way of showing it, ever, he said, trying not to let the hurt affect his voice. His mind hardened against releasing any emotion, which was difficult given the turmoil she had kindled. Tell her, Cansine said simply. She reached out to stroke his cheek, but he dodged back. Be true to yourself, Ediard. That's the you I want. Good night, he said stiffly. Cansine nodded, then turned away. Ediard was sure he saw a tear on her cheek. He refused to use his farsight to check. Instead, he went into his maisonette and threw himself on the too high bed. Anger warred with frustration in his mind. He imagined Salrana and Cansine fighting, an image that quickly took on a life outside his control. His fist thumped the pillow. He turned over and sent his far sight swirling out across the city, observing the vast clutter of minds as they wrestled with their own demons. It felt good not to be suffering alone. He took a long time to fall asleep. Rumour has it the Pythia uses her concealment ability to twist her features. She is over a hundred and fifty, after all. She could give Mistress Florella run for her money in the withered crone stakes. There has to be some kind of devilment involved to make her look the way she does. Boyd put a lot of emphasis on that last sentence, dipping his head knowingly. Can you do that? A startled Ediard asked. I don't know. Boyd lowered his voice. They say the Grand Masters can completely conceal themselves from view. I've never seen it myself. Ediard paused on the threshold of pointing out the slight logical flaw in that admission. Right. They were on patrol in Jeevens, walking alongside the Brotherhood Canal, which bordered the southern side of the district. Beyond the water was Tycho, not strictly a district, but a wide strip of meadow between the canal and the crystal wall. Wooden stables used by the militia squatted on the grass, the only buildings permitted on the common land. He could see stable boys cantering horses and G-horses along sandy tracks, the morning exercise they and their predecessors had performed for centuries. Several horses had G-wolves running alongside. It was their sixth patrol since graduation, six days during which he and Cansine 
barely had exchanged a word. They'd been perfectly civil to each other, but that was all. He did not want that. He wanted them at least to go back to how it was before that messed-up evening. How they might arrive back at that comfortable old association was a complete mystery, one he definitely was not going to consult the others on. He got the impression they already guessed that something had happened. Knowing them, they'd royally screw up that speculation. For some reason, he'd also held off saying anything to Salrana. Grudgingly, he acknowledged that Cancine did have a small point there. He really was going to have to face up to the whole friends-become-lovers issue simmering between him and Salrana. It wasn't fair to her. She was growing up into a beautiful adolescent, so much more vivacious than any of the city girls he encountered. All he had to do was get over his notion of protectiveness. That was stupid, too. She was old enough to look out for herself and make her own choices. The only person who had appointed him her guardian was himself, something he had done out of obligation and friendship. To do anything different, especially now, could be considered taking advantage. Sometimes you have to do what's wrong to do what's right. And physically he knew they would be fantastic together, that body, and as for those legs... Altogether too much time of late was spent thinking about how her legs would feel wrapped around him, long athletic muscles flexing relentlessly. It would end with them both screaming in pleasure. We wouldn't even get out of bed for the first year. Then after that, after the passion, they'd still enjoy each other's company. Salrana was the only person he could ever really talk to. They understood each other. Two hick kids against the city. Future mayor. Future Pythia. He smiled warmly. Of course, I could just talk to myself instead, an irritated Maxon said. Sorry, what? Edyard asked, banishing the smile. Maxon glanced over at Cancine, who was standing beside Dinley, the pair of them looking down on a gondola full of crates, calling something to the gondolier. Boy, she really worked you over, didn't she? Who? Oh, no. There's nothing wrong. Cancine and I are fine. I'd hate to see you unfine. Really, I'm good. What did you want? The shopkeepers in Bolton Street keep seeing strangers are walking along, checking out the buildings with strong farsight. They're obviously a gang taking a scouting trip. So if we go up there in these uniforms, we'll scare them off, and they'll just come back in a week or a month, whenever we move on. But if we were to loiter around in ordinary clothes... They wouldn't know we were there, and then we could catch them at it red-handed. I don't know. You know what Ronark is like about wearing the uniform on duty. As they were starting their third patrol, the captain had appeared unexpectedly and performed a snap inspection. Ediard almost had been demoted for the disgraceful lack of standards. Since then, he had made sure his squadmates were properly dressed before leaving the station. Exactly, Maxon said, if you're a constable in Jeevens, you have to be in a uniform. Everyone knows that. So they won't be expecting us out of uniform. Hmm, maybe. Let me talk to Che first. See what he thinks. He'll say no, Boyd told him. You know procedure. If a crime is suspected, then you use G-Eagles to observe the area while the squad waits out of farsight range. We don't know how long we'll have to wait, Maxon said. And Edyard has only one G-Eagle. You can scalp more, can't you? Boyd said. You told us you used to be an egg-shaped apprentice. He can't scalp without a guild license. Not in Macathron, Maxon said. It's the law. We'd wind up having to arrest him. You know how keen they are on maintaining their monopoly. In any case, this is going to happen soon. We don't have time to scalp G-Eagles. That's why we have to go patrolling in disguise. Ordinary clothes aren't a disguise, Boyd protested. It doesn't matter what clothes we wear as long as it's not the uniform, Maxon said, his temper rising. Dress how you want, maybe in a dress. You're certainly acting like an old woman. Good one, smart ass. If this gang's as clever as you say, they'll know all our faces anyway. Enough, Ediard said, holding up his hands. I will speak to Che as soon as we get in. Until then I'll keep my G-Eagle close to Bolton Street. I can't do anything more in the middle of a patrol, so drop it for now, please. Just a suggestion. 
Maxon grumbled as he started to walk away. Are you deliberately bugging him? Ediard asked Boyd. The lanky boy gave a sly grin. I don't have to answer that. I'm not under oath. Ediard laughed. The Boyd of six months ago would never have dared any mischief at another's expense, let alone a friend. This is the end of the CD. The program continues on the next CD. The squad set off along the canal again, following the gentle curve northward. Ediard's plan was to stay on the side path until they reached its junction with the outer circle canal, then turn back into Jeevan's. He sent his G-Eagle swooping low over the roof and towers of the district, guiding it toward Bolton Street. It was a damp grey morning, with the last of the night's rain clouds still clotting the sky as they slid slowly westward. Every surface was slick with rain. However, the indomitable citizens of Macathran were out in force as usual, thronging the streets and narrow alleyways. Ediard's G-Eagle flashed silently above them, ignored by most. Then he caught a movement that was out of kilter. Halfway along Sunral Street, someone in a hooded jacket turned away from the eagle and adjusted his hood, pulling it fully over his head. It could have been nothing. The G Eagle was still over fifty yards away, and it was damp, the air chilly. It was perfectly legitimate for someone to pull his hood up in such circumstances. A lot of people in the same zigzagging street were sporting hats that morning, the man wasn't even alone in wearing a hooded jacket. It's wrong, though. I know it. Wait, he told the squad. He swept the street with his farsight, searching for the one suspicious figure. The man's mind was shielded, though the tinge of uncertainty seeped out. Again, perfectly legitimate. He could be worrying about anything from a bad quarrel with his wife to debts. Ediard observed the direction he was taking and ordered the G-Eagle around in a long curve. It settled on the eaves of a three-story house at the end of Sonral Street, out of sight of its target. As he waited, Ediard realized the man in the hooded jacket was not alone. He was walking with two others. Then the G-Eagle caught sight of him on the street as he came around one of the shallow turns. By then the hood had slipped back slightly. "'Oh, yes, lady, thank you,' Ediard said. "'What's happening?' Dinlay demanded. He's back, Ediard growled, the thief from the Silver Market, the one who was holding the box. Where? Cansine demanded. Sonral Street, top third. The squad registered annoyance. We can't far sight that far, Boyd complained. OK, here you go. Ediard gifted them the G-Eagle's sight. Are you sure? Maxon said. He's right. Cansine said, it's him, the bastard. I can just farsight him. There are two others with him, Ediard told them, and he's nervous about the G-Eagle, so they're not here for anything legitimate. Let's spread out and surround them. Keep a street between yourself and them the whole time. I'll track them with farsight. I don't want to risk him seeing the G-Eagle again. That'll scare them off. They all smiled at one another, edgy with nerves and excitement. Go! Maxon cried. After five minutes of steady jogging, Ediard wished he had paid more attention to keeping fit. As before, Macathran citizens were reluctant to give ground to anyone in a hurry, least of all a red-faced, sweating, panting young constable. He dodged and shoved and wiggled his way along streets and through alleys, glaring at anyone who voiced a complaint. His uniform made it worse, with its hot, heavy fabric restricting his movements. Eventually he got into position, a street to the west of the trio. His farsight showed him his squadmates taking up positions all around them. Got them, Dinlay's long talk announced as he slowed to a walk. Me too, Boyd reported. What do you think they're here to steal? Maxon asked. Small enough to carry easily, valuable enough to be worth the risk, Dinlay replied. Another one been paying attention during our lectures, but unfortunately that covers about 90% of the shops around here. Could be something in one of the storerooms, too, Boyd suggested. Or a house, Cansine added. Let's just keep watch on them, Ediard told them. When they go into a building, we close in. Remember to wait until the crime has been committed before arresting them. Hey, never thought of that, Maxon said. 
Ediard let his far sight sweep through the buildings around the trio, trying to guess what they might be interested in. Hopeless task. The suspects turned off Sonral Street into an alley so narrow that one person could barely fit. Ediard hesitated. They were heading towards his street, but it was a blind alley, blocked by a house wall twenty feet high. His farsight probed, revealing a series of underground storerooms beneath one of the jewellery shops on Sonral Street. There was a passage leading up to a thick metal door in the alley. At least they're consistent, he remarked. That's a jeweller's shop on top. On top of what? Boyd asked. There's some kind of passage leading off the alley, Cansine told him. It leads downward somewhere, Edyard. Can you actually sense what's there? A little bit, he admitted reluctantly. Just some kind of open chamber, I think. For a moment he wished everyone had his ability. Life would be a lot easier. So now what do we do? Maxon said. We can't rush them. Not down that alley. Wait at the end, Dinley said. They can hardly escape. Ediard's farsight was showing him a whole network of interconnecting passages and rooms running under the row of shops. The passages all had locked doors, but once the thieves were inside, there was a chance they could elude his squad within the little underground maze. The rest of you get into Sonral Street, he ordered. I'm going around the back to see if I can find another way down there. You're going in alone? Cansine asked. Ediard, there's three of them, and we know they carry blades. I'm just going to make sure they don't have an escape route, that's all. Come on, move. He was faintly aware of his squadmates hurrying to the broad street beyond the alley. One of the thieves had bent down beside the small door, doing something to the first of its five locks. From what he could sense of the locks, Ediard knew he would not like to try to pick them open. He concentrated hard, pushing his farsight through the city's fabric to map the buried labyrinth of rooms and passages. In truth, there were only three exits in addition to the one the trio currently was trying to break through. Below that level, though, Ediard sensed the web of fissures that wove the city structures together. Several twisted their way up past the storerooms, branching into smaller clefts that laced the walls of the buildings above. He tracked back, finding a convoluted route that led to the street in which he was standing. His third hand reached out, probing the fabric of the wall at the back of a tapering alcove between two shops. Nothing. It was as solid as granite. Please, his long talk whispered to the mind of the slumbering city, let me in. Something intangible stirred beneath him. A flock of rugals took flight from the roofs above. Here. His mind pressed into the rear of the alcove. Something pushed back. Colourful shapes rose into his thoughts, swelling much faster than the birds overhead. In his dazed state, he thought they resembled numbers and mathematical symbols, but much larger and more complex than any of the arithmetic Akim had taught him. With these equations, the universe surely could be explained. They danced like sprites, rearranging themselves into a new order before twirling away. Ediard gasped struggling to stand up as his legs shook weakly. His heart was pounding far harder than it had been from his earlier run through the streets. He felt the structure of the wall change. When he peered forward, it looked exactly the same as before, a dark purple surface with flecks of grey stretching all the way up to where the curving roofs intersected, three stories above him. But it gave when his third hand touched it. There were people on the street around him, strolling along. Ediard waited until a relatively clear moment and stepped into the little alcove. Nobody could see him now. His hand touched the section of wall at the back and slipped right through. The skin on his finger tingled, as if he were immersing them in fine sand. He walked into the wall. It was a sensation his brain interpreted as a wave of dry water washing across him. Then he was inside. He opened his eyes to complete darkness. His farsight cast around and showed him that he was suspended in a vertical tube. Even without visual sight, Ediard instinctively looked down. Farsight confirmed that his feet were standing on nothing. Oh, lady! He started to descend. It was as though a very powerful third hand were lowering him gently to the bottom of the fissure that snaked away horizontally under the buildings. Yet he was convinced it wasn't a telekinetic hold. He could not sense anything like that. Some other force was manipulating him. Oddly, 
His stomach felt as though he were plummeting, even though he was moving relatively slowly. His feet touched the ground. That was when whatever force had gripped him withdrew, leaving him free to sink into a crouch. When he touched the wall of the fissure, he felt a slick of water coating it. A rivulet was trickling over the toe of his boots. He could hear it gurgling softly. It's a drain, he said out loud, astonished that anything so fantastical could exist to serve such a mundane purpose. Despite perfectly clear farsight, he patted around with his hands. The drain fissure was slightly too small for him to walk along it upright. Its side walls were about five feet apart. He took a breath, none too happy at the claustrophobic feeling niggling at the back of his mind, and started to move forward in a stoop. The thieves had gotten through the locked door at the top of the passage, an impressive feat in such a short space of time. Two of them were descending the curving stairs to the door that sealed off the bottom, while the third stood guard outside. Ediard moved faster, navigating several forks along the drain fissure. He observed the thieves manipulate the locks on the second door and go through. Then he was directly underneath the storeroom they were ransacking. The layout was distinct. The wooden racks laid out in parallel. Small boxes were piled on the shelves. A large iron box stood in one corner with a very complicated locking mechanism. They were ignoring that. Ediard looked up as his far sight pervaded the city's substance above him, a solid mass of rock-like material five yards thick. He concentrated, closed his eyes, stupid, but, well, and applied his mind. Again the equations rose from nowhere to pirouette breezily around his thoughts. He began to rise, slipping through the once solid substance, like some piece of cork bobbing to the surface of the sea. Once again his stomach was convinced he was falling, to a degree that brought on a lot of queasiness. He had almost reached the floor when he realized the thieves would sense him the second he popped up. Quickly, he threw a concealment around himself. Then he was emerging into the storeroom with a weak orange light shining all around. The floor hardened beneath his boots. What was that? a voice asked. Ediard was standing behind the rack at the back of the storeroom, out of direct sight. He held his breath. Nothing. Fucking stop panicking, will you? There are only two doors, and the other one is locked. Now help me find the crap we came here for before someone senses us down here. Ediard slowly walked around the end of the rack. He could see the pair of them moving along a rack, taking boxes off the shelf and prizing them open with some kind of tool. A quick look inside, and the box would be tossed aside. Most of them seemed to contain little boxes. Dozens of them were clinking as they rolled about on the floor. Here we go, the one in the hooded jacket announced. He just forced open a box full of tiny packets. One was opened to reveal a coil of metal thread. Ediard wasn't sure in the storeroom's low orange light, but it might be gold. I'll check out the rest, the other one said. The one with the hooded jacket began stuffing the packets into an inside pocket. Ediard dropped his concealment. What the fuck? Both thieves swung around to face him. Hello again, Ediard said. Remember me? Ediard! Cansine's panicky long talk reverberated in his skull. Sweet lady, where have you been? We've been going frantic. How did you get in there? It's the little shit from the market. The thief in the hooded jacket spit. I fucking knew that jiggle was on the prowl. He reached inside his jacket and pulled out a long blade. At the same time, his third hand tried to push into Ediard's chest for a heart squeeze. Ediard laughed as he deflected the attack. Died underground, it was rumoured, were the treasury vaults, containing mountains of gold and silver, where the coins were minted. The chief constable also was based in one of the five conical towers, along with a modest staff. For centuries, the outermost tower, closest to the city gate, used to house the militia barracks, but they had long departed, the serving soldiers to several barracks within the city, while the general and senior officers had taken up residence in the orchard palace next door. The vacated barracks had been taken over eagerly by the ever-expanding Lawyers' Guild. Although it was democratically open to anyone, it was the interconnecting domes that ran alongside the centre circle canal with which the average Macathran citizen was most likely to be familiar. They housed the courts of justice, as well as the constabulary's main holding cells. Ediard and the rest of the squad had been shown around by Master Solorin, 
who had explained the history of every corridor and room at inordinate and boring length. Part of their training was to attend trials, so they could accustom themselves to the procedures and listen to the verbal sparring of the lawyers. Eddyard had been looking forward to that part, but in all the trials they had watched, the lawyers had confined themselves to simple questions to those in the witness stand. There had been an obscure argument about interpreting a precedent established four hundred years earlier to settle a dispute between two fishmongers and their supplier about who got priority on the catch based on the length of the contract. Eddyard barely understood the words they used, let alone followed the logic involved. The only criminal trial they'd seen had been one in which the constables had arrested a bunch of minor family sons during an altercation in a theatre late one night. The young men had all been sheepish, never challenged the senior squad sergeant's account, pleaded guilty to all charges, and accepted the fine without question. As far as preparation and experience went, Eddyard was beginning to realise how useless it had all been. Two middle court judges and a mayor's council judge had been appointed to preside over the case against the trio of thieves they had arrested. They sat together behind a raised wooden podium that ran along the back of the oval courtroom, clad in flowing scarlet and black robes, with fur-lined hoods hanging over their right shoulders. The mayor's council also wore a golden chain, signifying his high status. Arrayed in the dock on their left, the thieves stood with two court constables in dress uniform standing guard. They finally had given their names. Arminel was what the hooded leader called himself. He was no more than forty, with a drawn pale face and thick sandy hair that he wore long to cover large ears. At no time did he look worried. If anything, his expression indicated ennui. His accomplices were Omasis and Hari. Hari, still in his teens, was the one they had told to stand guard in the alley. He'd been charged only with complicity to steal. Arminel and Domasis both were charged with theft and aggravated trespass, while Arminel had to face the additional charge of assaulting a constable. The jewellery shop owner had swiftly identified the contents of the two bottles Arminel had smashed together as a highly volatile spirit-based cleaning fluid and acid. Ediard had shivered at the thought of what could have happened if his shield had not been strong enough to ward off the fireball. He had wanted Arminel to be charged with the attack on Cavine in the Silverham market, but Master Vospor, the lawyer Captain Ronark had retained to prosecute the case, had said no. It was too long ago for witnesses to be considered reliable. But I recognised him immediately, Ediard had cried. You saw someone behaving suspiciously, Master Vospol had said. You believed him to be the participant in the previous crime. Cavine will identify him. Cavine was stabbed, quite badly. The defence will argue that that makes him unreliable. Let's just go with these charges, shall we? Ediard had sighed and shook his head. It really should have served a warning about the methodology of Macathran's legal affairs. Instead, the first inkling that their case was not as watertight as they imagined came when the defendants all entered a plea of not guilty. They can't be serious, Ediard hissed as Master Cherix, the defence lawyer, stood before the judges and entered the plea. The squad was sitting along the rear wall, all in their dress uniforms, waiting to be called by the prosecution. Captain Ronark sat on one side of them, with Sergeant Che on the other. Almost all of the seats were empty. Edyar didn't know if he was pleased about that. He wanted the city's citizens to see that his squad had helped bring a small part of their troubles to justice, show them that the law had not deserted them. Master Cherix raised a surprised eyebrow at Ediard's exclamation and turned to look at the squad. Master Vospol shot them a furious look. Be silent, his long talk ordered. It was, Master Cherix explained, a terrible misunderstanding. His clients were honest citizens going about their business when they perceived the blast in the alley. It had blown open a small door, and, full of concern for human life, they had ventured into a storeroom filled with smoke and flames, at great personal risk, to make sure there were no injured people inside. At that point, the constable had stumbled upon them and received a totally false impression. One by one, the three accused took the stand and swore under oath that they had been acting selflessly. As they did so, their unshielded minds radiated sincerity, 
along with a modicum of injured innocence that their good deed had been misinterpreted. Master Cherix shook his head in sympathy. Woe begone that the constables had acted so wrongly. A sign of the times, he told the judges. These constables are well-meaning young folk, rushed through their training by a city desperate to reach staffing targets for the sake of politics, but in truth, they were far out of their depth on that sad day. They, too, need to make arrests to prove themselves to their notoriously harsh station captain. In such circumstances, it is only understandable why they chose to interpret events in the way they did. Ediard met Arminel Stair. He tried to kill me, and his lawyers making out it was all a misunderstanding. That we're in the wrong. It was so outrageous he almost laughed. Then Arminel's expression twitched just for an instant. The condescending sneer burned itself into Ediard's memory. He knew then that this was not the end, nowhere near. After two hours of listening to the defendants, Ediard finally was called to the stand. About time. I can soon set this straight. Constable Ediard. Cherrick smiled warmly. He was nothing like Master Solorin, but a young man dressed like the son of a trading family. You're not from the city, are you? What's that got to do with this? Master Cherix put on a pained expression and turned to the judges. My lords, answer the questions directly, the mayor's counsel instructed. Sir, Ediard reddened. No, I was born in the Rulan province. And you've been here for what? Half a year? A little over that, yes. So it would be fair to say that you're not entirely familiar with the city. I know my way around. I was thinking more in terms of the way our citizens behave. So why don't you tell me what you believe happened? Ediard launched into his rehearsed explanation, how Arminel tried to avoid the G-Eagle, the squad tracking them along Sonral Street, arranging themselves in an encircling formation while standing back and observing through Farsight, sensing Arminel picking the locks. At which point we closed in, and I witnessed the accused stealing gold wire from the storeroom. I'm curious about this aspect, Master Cherrick said. You told your squad to wait in Sonral Street by the entrance to the alley, yet you went down into the storeroom. But I thought you said Harry had been left on guard duty in the alley. How did you get past him? I was lucky. I found another entrance through the shop, which backed onto the jewellers. Master Cherrick nodded in admiration. So it was hardly a secure storeroom, then, if you could just walk in. It was difficult, Ediard admitted, praying to the lady to help him rein in his guilt. But this was not a lie, just a slight rearrangement of his true route into the storeroom. I just managed to get there in time. In time for what? To see Arminel stealing the gold wire. He was doing that before he flung flaming acid at me. Indeed, I'd like you to clarify another point, Constable. When you emerged after this alleged event to join up with your squad, did Arminel have any of this supposed gold wire on him? Well, no. He dumped it when I challenged him. I see. And your squad mates can confirm that, can they? They know, yes. Yes, what, Constable? We caught them doing it. I saw him. By your own statement, you were deep underground in the poorly illuminated storeroom at the time of the alleged theft— which of your squadmates can farsight through fifteen yards of solid city fabric? Can see. She knew I was there. Thank you, Constable. Defense would like to call Constable Cancine. Cancine passed Ediard on her way to the stand. They both had meticulously blank expressions, but he could tell how worried she was. When he sat down next to Dinley, the others all smiled sympathetically. Good job, Che whispered, but Ediard was not convinced. You have a far sight almost as good as your squad leaders? Master Cherix asked. We came out about equal in our tests. So you could sense what went on in the storeroom from your position in Sonral Street? Yes. Ediard winced. She sounded so uncertain. How much gold wire was in there? I, um, I'm not sure. An ounce? A ton? A few boxes. Constable Cancine. Master Cherix smiled winningly. Was that a guess? Not enough gold to be obvious to a casual farsight sweep. I'll let that go for the moment. Constable Ediard claims you perceived him. Drink, Che said. I know how bad this hurts, believe me. I've had smart-ass lawyers get scum off on worse charges than this. 
a double of something illegally strong, Maxon said. The others nodded in grudging agreement. They looked at Eddyard. Sure, he said. Arminel saluted him with two fingers to his forehead. His smile was gloating. Eddyard quashed his impulse to dive across the court and smash his fist into the man's face. Instead, he winked back. Be seeing you, he whispered. Chapter 7 The Unisphere had never been a homogeneous system, nor was it designed in accordance with logical principles. That was quite ironic, considering the purely digital medium it dealt with. Instead, it had grown and expanded in irregular spurts to accommodate the commercial and civil demands placed on it by a proliferating interstellar civilization. By definition, the Unisphere was nothing more than the interface protocols between all the planetary cyberspheres, and they were incredibly diverse. Almost every hardware technology the human race had developed was still in operation across the greater Commonwealth worlds, from old-fashioned macro-arrays running restricted intelligence, RI programs, to semi-organic cubes, quantum wire blocks, smart neural webs, and photonic crystals, all the way up to ANA, which technically was just another routing junction. The interstellar linkages were equally varied, with the central Commonwealth worlds still using their original zero-width wormholes, whereas the external worlds used a combination of zero-width and hyperspace modulation. Transdimensional channels were becoming more common, especially among the latest generation of external worlds. Starships also were able to link in, provided that they were in range of a star system's space watch network. The massive gulf between technologies and capacities within the Unisphere meant that the management software had swollen over the centuries to accommodate every new advance and application. With effectively infinite storage capacity, the upgrades, adapters, retrocryptors and interpreters had accumulated like binary onion layers around each node. They had the ability to communicate with every other chunk of hardware to come online since the end of the 21st century, but with such a complex procedure dealing with every interface, the problem of security increased proportionally. It was relatively easy for a specialist e-head to incorporate siphoning and eco-clone routines quietly amid centuries' worth of augmentation files. The problem was one that all the users got around by using their own encryption. However, to decrypt a secure message, the receiver had to be in possession of the appropriate key. Ultra-secure keys never were sent via the Unisphere. They were exchanged physically in advance, a common method for financial transactions. A less secure method was for a user's U-shadow to dispatch a key by using one route and then call on another. Given the phenomenal number of randomly designated routes available within the Unisphere, most of the people who even considered it regarded that as sufficient. It would, after all, require a colossal amount of computing power to monitor every route established to a specific address code for a key and then follow up by intercepting the message it had to make to get the same intelligence. And as they had gotten there first, they also had observed the advances and other factions spread their monitors into the Unisphere nodes as their campaigns and reach grew. They knew which messages the advancer intercepted. Ilanthi is going to go apeshit over that kind of betrayal, Gore said. At least we know Troblem is still alive, Nelson replied. Yeah, for the next five seconds. Until he gets to Sholapur, at the very least. And never underestimate Paula. I don't. If anyone can collect him in one piece, she can. So we might just be able to sit back and relax, if Paula does bring back information on what the advances are up to. Hardware, Troblem said. That has to be the planet-shifting FTL engine. Maybe so, Gore said. But he was offering that as a bribe to make sure Paula listened to something else. Something big and scary enough to get him really worried. Now what the fuck could that be? Marius sprinted down the corridor. It was not something the universe got to see very often. With his higher field functions reinforcing his body, the speed was phenomenal. Malmetal doors had to roll aside very quickly or face complete disintegration. His dark toga suit flapped about in the slipstream, for once ruining the eerie gliding effect he always portrayed. Marius did not care about appearance right now. He was furious. Alanthe's brief call had been very unsettling, 
He'd never failed her before. The implications were terrible, as she had managed to explain in remarkably few words. He only wished he had time to make Troblem suffer for his crime. He streaked through the three-way junction that put him in Sector 7B5. Some idiot technician was walking down the middle of the corridor, going back to her suite after a long shift. Marius charged past her, clipping her arm, which broke instantly from the impact. She was spun around, slamming into the wall. She screamed as she crumpled to the floor. The door to Troblum's suite was dead ahead, locked, as of two minutes ago, with Marius's own nine-level certificate to prevent the little shit from leaving. The suite's internal sensors showed Troblum sitting at a table, slurping his way disgustingly through a late-night snack. Marius began to slow as his U-shadow unlocked the door. It expanded as he arrived, and he coasted through. Troblum's head lifted, crumbs of a burger dropping from the corner of his mouth. Despite bulging cheeks, he still managed a startled expression. A disruptor pulse slammed into him, producing a ghost-green phosphorescent flare in the sweet's air. Marius followed it up immediately with a jelly-gun shot. He would obliterate the memory cell in a few seconds. That would leave just Troblum's secure store back on Arevalo. Instead of disintegrating into a collapsing globule of gore, Troblum simply popped like a soap bubble. A rivulet of metal dust spewed out from the wall behind the table where the jelly gun shot had hit. Marius froze in shock, his field scan function sweeping the room. It had not been Troblum. No biological matter was in the room. His eyes found a half-melted electronic module on the seat, ruined by the disruptor blast. A solido projector. Marius was perfectly still as he stared at it. What happened? Neskia asked as she strode into the suite, her long neck curved so that her head could see around Marius. It would appear Troblum isn't quite the fat fool I'd taken him for. We'll find him. It won't take long. This station isn't that big. Marius whipped around, the wide irises in his green eyes narrowing to minute, intimidating slits. Where's his ship? he demanded. Sitting in the airlock, she replied calmly. Nobody enters or leaves without my authorization. It better be, Marius spit. Every centimeter of this station is covered by some sensor or other. We'll find him. Marius's you shadow ordered the smart core to show him the airlock. The Melanie's redemption was sitting passively at the center of the large white chamber. Visually it was there. The airlock radar produced a return from the hull. The umbilical management programs reported a steady drain of housekeeping power through the cables plugged into its base. He queried the ship's smart core. There was no response. Marius and Neskia stared at each other. Shit! Four minutes later, they walked into the airlock. Marius glowered at the long, cone-shaped ship with its stupid, curving tail fins. His field scan swept out. It was an illusion produced by a small module on the airlock floor. He smashed a disruptor pulse into the solido projector, and the starship image shivered, shrinking down to a beautiful naked young girl with blonde hair that hung halfway down her back. Oh, Howard, she moaned sensually, running her hands up her body. Do that again. Marius let out an incoherent cry and shot the projector again. It burst into smouldering fragments, and the girl vanished. How in Ozzy's name did he do that? Neskia asked. There was a hint of admiration in her voice. He must have flown right past the defence cruisers as well. They never even saw him. Marius took a moment to compose himself. Troblum helped design and build the defence cruisers. Either he infiltrated their smart cores back then, or he knows a method of circumventing their sensor systems. He compromised the station smart core too. It should never have let Melanie's redemption out. Indeed. Marius said. You will find the corruption and purge it. This operation must not suffer any further compromise. It was not me who compromised this station, she said with equal chill. You brought him here. You had twenty years to discover the bugs he planted. That you failed is unforgivable. Don't try to play the blame game with me. This is your foul-up, and I will make that very clear to Ilanthi. Marius turned on a heel and walked back to the airlock chamber's entrance, his dark toga suit adjusted itself around him, once more giving off a narrow black shimmer that concealed his feet. 
He glided with serpentine poise down the corridor toward the airlock chamber that contained his own starship. His yew shadow opened a secure link to the cat's ship. It's so nice to be popular again, she said. We have a problem. I want you to find Troblem. Eliminate that shit from this universe. In fact, I want him erased from all of history. That sounds personal, Marius, dear. Always a bad thing. Messes with your judgment. He's heading for Sholopor. In five days' time, he will meet with an ANA representative there and explain what we have been doing. His ship has some kind of advanced stealth ability we didn't know about. Gave you the slip, huh? I'm sure you'll be more capable of rectifying our mistake. What do you want me to do about Aaron? He's still down on the planet's surface. Is there any sign of Inigo? Darling, the sensors can barely make out continents. I've no idea what's going on down there. Do as you see fit. I thought this was all critical to your plans. If Troblem exposes us to A and A, there will be no plans. There probably won't be an advance of faction any more. The strong always survive. That's evolution. Paula Mayo is the representative A and A is sending to collect Troblem. Oh, Marius, you're too kind to me. Really. It should have been tempting. He was alone in a small starship with three amazingly fit men who probably would have been honoured to go to bed with him. Oscar had been delighted when Tomancio had introduced his team. Leatris MacPeel was his lieutenant, a lot quieter than Tomancio, with a broad mouth that could flash a smile that was wickedly attractive. He would handle the technical aspects of the mission, Tomancio had said, including their armaments. Gazing at the pile of big cases on the regraph sled that followed Leatris about, Oscar had his first moment of doubt. He did not want to resort to violence, though he was realistic enough to know that it wasn't his decision. Cheriton McConnor had been brought in to help because of his experience with the Gaia field. There was nothing about confluence nest operations that he didn't know, Tomancio had claimed. Oscar was slightly surprised by Cheriton's characteristics. They were almost higher. He had altered his ears to simple circle craters. His nose was wide and flat, and his eyes were sparkling purple globes like multifaceted insect lenses. His bald skull had two low ridges reaching back from his eyebrows over his cranium to merge together at the nape of his neck. Multi-macrocellular enrichment, he explained, and a hell of a lot of customized Gaia motes. To prove it, he spun out a vision of some concert. For a moment, Oscar was transported to a natural amphitheater, lost in a sea of people under a wild, starry sky. On the stage far away, a pianist performed by himself, his soulful tune making Oscar sway in sympathy. Wow! Oscar blinked, taking half a step back as the vision cleared. He'd almost been about to sing along. The song was familiar somehow, just not quite right. I composed it in your honor. Cheriton said. I remember you told Wilson Kime you liked old movies. Now Oscar remembered. That's right. Somewhere over the rainbow, yeah? He took care to reduce his Gaimote's reception level. Cheriton had produced a very strong emission. It made Oscar wonder if the Gaia field actually could be used in a harmful way. Yes. The last member of the team was Beckia McCratz, whose Gaia field giveaway made it very clear that she would like to bed him, she was equal to Anja in the beauty stakes, minus all the neurotic hang-ups. Oscar wasn't interested, not even on that first morning when he had stumbled out of his tiny sleep cabin to find all four of them in the main lounge, stripped to the waist and performing some strenuous knee-ting exercise. They moved in perfect synchronization, arms and legs rising gracefully to stick out in odd directions, limbs flexing, eyes closed, breathing deeply, from their Gaia-field emanations, their minds seemed to be hibernating. Aliens teleported into human bodies, carefully examining what they could do. It was all very different from Oscar's wake-up routine, which normally involved a lot of coffee and accessing the most trashy Unisphere gossip shows he could find. That was the whole non-attraction problem. All that devotion to perfection and strength did not seem to leave them much time to be actually human. It was a big turn-off. So he crept around the edge of the lounge to the culinary unit, 
snagged a large cup of coffee and a plate of buttered croissants, and sat quietly in a corner munching away as he watched the strange slow-motion ballet. They came to rest position, and took one last breath in unison before opening their eyes and smiling. "'Good morning, Oscar,' Tamancio said. Oscar slurped down some more coffee. That morning routine also included no conversation until his third cup. The culinary unit was suddenly busy churning out plates with large portions of bacon and eggs with toast. "'Something wrong?' Leatris asked. Oscar realized he was staring at the man as he ate. "'Sorry. I assumed you'd all be vegetarians.' They all exchanged an amused glance. "'Why? When we were flying the carbon goose cross halfway, I remember the cat kicking up a big fuss about the onboard food. She refused to eat anything produced and processed on a big fifteen planet. His companion's amusement evaporated. To Oscar it was as though he had been transformed into some kind of guru, steeped in wisdom. "'You did talk to her, then?' Becky asked. "'Not much. It was almost as if she was bored with us. And I still don't know why you idolize her the way you do.' We're realistic about her, Cheriton said, but she accomplished so much. She killed a lot of people. As did you, Oscar, Tamancio chided. Not deliberately, not for enjoyment. The whole Starflyer War happened because humanity was weak. Our strength had been sapped away by centuries of liberalism. Not any more. The external worlds have the self-belief to strike out for themselves against the central worlds. That's thanks to Faraway's leadership by example, and the Knight's Guardian are the political force behind Far Away. Politicians don't ignore strength any more. It is celebrated on hundreds of worlds in a myriad of forms. That was the trouble with history, Oscar thought. Once the distance had grown long enough, any event could be seen favourably. The true horror faded with time, and ignorance replaced it. I lived through those times. The Commonwealth was strong enough to prevail. Without the strength we showed then... You wouldn't be alive today to complain about us and debate what might have been. We don't want to offend you, Oscar. Oscar downed the last of his coffee and told the culinary unit to produce more. So sensibilities aren't a weakness, then. Leatrice laughed. No, respect and civility are high points of civilization. As much as personal independence and kindness, strength comes in many guises including laying down your life to give the human race a chance to survive. If the Knight's Guardian have one regret, it is that your name is not as famous and revered as the others from your era. Holy crap, Oscar muttered, and collected his coffee. He knew his face was red. My era. All right, he said as he sank back onto the chair that the lounge extruded for him. I can see we're going to have fun times debating history and politics for the rest of the mission. In the meantime, we do have a very clear objective. My plan is quite a simple one, and I'd like some input from you as we shake it down into something workable. You guys are the experts in this field and this era. So for what it's worth, there are several ANA factions extremely keen to find this poor old second dreamer, not to mention living dream, which has a very clear-cut agenda for him. Between them they have colossal resources which we can't hope to equal. So what I propose is that we jump on their bandwagon and let them do the hard work. We should position ourselves to snatch him as soon as they locate him. I like it, Tamancio said. The simpler it is, the better. Which just leaves us with mere details, Oscar said. Everyone seems to think the second dreamer is on Viosha. We'll be there in another seven hours. Impressive flight time. Cheriton said dryly. I've never been in an ultra-drive ship before. Oscar ignored the jibe. Tamancio had never asked who was employing Oscar, but the ship was a huge giveaway. Tamancio, how do we go about infiltrating the living dream operation there? Direct insertion. We'll hack their smart cores personnel files and assign Cheriton to the search operation. He's savvy enough to pass as a dream master, right? No problem, Cheriton said. He sighed. Reprofiling for me, then. He ran a hand along one of his skull ridges. I'll make you look almost human, Beckia assured him. Cheriton blew her a kiss. Living Dream has been altering confluence nests all across the General Commonwealth to try and get a fix on his location, he said. 
It must be costing them a fortune, which is a good indicator of how desperate they are. It's not a terribly accurate method, but once they narrow it down to a single nest, they'll know the district at least. How does that help? Bakia said. A nest skyfield can cover a big area. If it's in a city, it can include millions. If it were me, I'd surround the area with specialist nests and dream masters and try and triangulate the dream's origin. So we can be in the general area just like them, Oscar said. Then it's all a matter of speed. The factions will be running similar snatch operations, Tomancio said. We'll be up against their agents as well as living dream. Oscar picked up on how enthused the Knight's Guardian were by that prospect. The faction agents will have bionic weapon enrichments, won't they? I hope so, Tomancio said. You can match that? Oscar asked nervously. Only one way to find out. It was a gentle valley carpeted by long, dark grass that rippled in giant waves as the breeze from the mountains gusted down. There was a house nestled in a shallow dip in the ground, a lovely old place whose walls were all crumbling stone quarried out of the nearby hills. An overhanging thatch roof gave it a delightful unity with nature. Its interior was a technology completely at odds with its outward appearance, with replicators providing him with any physical requirement. T-sphere interstices provided his family with an interesting internal topology and any extra space they might want. He stood facing it, holding his bamboo staff vertically in front of him, torso bare to the air and legs clad in simple black cotton diruku pants. He was shutting down bionic field functions. Attuning his perception to sight, sound and sensation alone, feeling his surroundings. Nesting cobra, the foundation of self. He moved into sharp eagle and then twisted fast, assuming jumping cheetah, a breath, opponent moving behind. Bring the bamboo down and sweep, the tiger's claw. Spin jump as a coiled dragon, one arm bent into Spartan shield, lunge, striking angel. Drop the staff and pull both curving daggers from their sheaths, bend at the knees into woken phoenix. A vibration in the air, heavy feet crushing tender stalks of grass. He raised his head to see a line of black armoured figures marching toward him. Long flames billowed from vents in their helmets as they roared their battle call. His breathing quickened as he tightened his grip on the daggers. The smell of charred meat rolled across the grassland. Aaron gagged on the terrible stench. Coughing violently, he sat up on the couch in the ground crawler's cabin. Shit, he sputtered, then coughed again, fighting for breath and doubling up. Exovision medical displays showed him his bionics, assuming command of his lungs and airway, overriding his body's struggling autonomic functions. He wheezed down a long breath and shook his head as the artificial organelles stabilized him. Corilyn was gazing at him from her couch on the other side of the cabin. She had drawn her knees up under her chin and had a blanket wrapped around her shoulders. For some reason she made him feel guilty. What? he snapped or caffeine-deprived bad temper. I don't know, she said. Those warriors represent being trapped, I think. But they came to you outside your home. You were unable to escape what you are, what you had grown into. Oh, give me a break, he growled, and tried to swing his feet off the couch. His blanket was wrapped around his legs. He pulled it off in an angry jerk. Corilin responded with a hurt scowl. They could also be a representation of paranoia, she said with brittle dignity. Fuck off, he told the culinary unit to brew some herbal tea, to purge the soul. Look, he said with a sigh, someone has seriously screwed with my brain. I'm bound to have nightmares. Just leave it, okay? Doesn't that bother you? I am what I am, and I like it. But you don't know who you are. I told you, drop this. He settled into one of the two forward seats and stared out of the thick windscreen slit. The ground crawler was lumbering forward, rocking about as if they were riding an ocean swell. Outside, the weather had not changed for the whole trip. A thin drizzle of ice particles, blown along at high speed. High overhead, the dark underbelly of the cloud blanket seethed relentlessly, flickering with sheer lightning. They were traversing a drab landscape where flood streams had gouged out deep, sharp gullies, Broad headlight beams slithered over the dunes of filthy snow that migrated across the permafrost. Occasionally, 
The surface of iron-hard soil was distended by some ruins or stumps. Otherwise, there was nothing to break the monotony. Corylin climbed off the couch without a word and went back to the little washroom compartment at the rear of the oblong cabin. She managed to slam the worn aluminum door. Aaron rubbed his face, dismayed by how he had handled the situation. Something in his dreams was eating away at his composure. He hated to think that she was right, that his subconscious somehow had squiddled away a few precious true memories. The personality he had now was simple and straightforward, uncluttered by extraneous attachments or sentimentality. He didn't want to lose that. Not ever. By way of apology, he started entering a whole load of instructions into the culinary unit. Thirty minutes later, when Corellin emerged, her breakfast was waiting for her on a small table. She pouted at it. The crawler's net reckons we're about ninety minutes from the camp, he said. I thought you'd want to fortify yourself before we reach them. Corellin was silent for a moment then nodded in acknowledgment at the peace offering and sat at the table. Has anyone been in contact? From the camp? No. They'd talked to someone called Erisilla the previous night, telling her their estimated arrival time. She had seemed interested, though she had laughed at the idea of any of her colleagues being an abandoned lover. If you knew any of my teammates, you'd know you're wasting your time. Romantic, they're not. We're still connected to the Beacon Network, Aaron said. "'sipping another herbal tea. "'Nobody is owning up yet. "'What do we do if he's not there?' "'Aaron resisted the impulse to look her up and down again. "'When she came out of the washroom, "'she changed into a pair of black trousers "'and a light green sweater with a v-neck. "'Her hair was washed and springy. "'No cosmetic scales were on her face, "'but her complexion glowed. "'Clearly she was ready for her chance "'to reignite some of the old passion should he be there.' She had kept her guyamotes closed fairly tight since leaving Kajani, but the occasional lapse had allowed Aaron to sense a lot of anticipation fermenting in her mind. I'm not sure, he admitted. Time isn't in our favour. And if he is there, what if he doesn't want to be hauled back to a Leslin? Just for an instant, something stirred Aaron's mind. Certainty. He did know what was going to happen afterward. The knowledge was all there waiting for him, ready for the moment. I'll just tell him what I have to do. After that, it'll be up to him. Corylin gave him a mildly doubtful stare before tucking into her first bacon sandwich. Camp, Aaron decided, was a rather grand description for the place where the team working in the Olhava province had set themselves up. A couple of ground crawlers were parked next to each other in the lee of some rugged foothills. Malmetal shelters had expanded out of their rear sections to provide the team with larger accommodation. But that was all. Aaron parked a few metres away, and they pulled on their bulky surface suits. Once his bubble helmet had sealed, Aaron went into the tiny airlock and waited for the outside door to slide aside. He was hit immediately by the wind. Ice fragments swirled around him. He walked carefully down the ramp, holding the handrail tight. The wind was squally, but he could stand upright. There were enhancer systems built into the suit for when the storms really hit. The suit's main purpose was to protect him from the radiation. Although there wasn't too much physical effort involved, he wished he had nudged their ground crawler closer to those of the team. It took nearly three minutes to cover the small gap and clamber into a decontamination airlock on the side of one of the shelters. Corylin was grunting and cursing her way along behind him. Ericilla, a short woman with a fringe of brown hair flecked with grey was waiting for them in the closet-sized suit room. She smirked as Corylin wriggled out of her surface suit, licking her lips in merriment. No man is worth this, she announced. He is, Corylin assured her. Aaron already had extended his field scan function, probing the whole camp. He had detected four people, including Erisilla. None of them was higher. Erisilla beckoned. Come and meet the boys. Viltar and Cytus were waiting for them, standing in the middle of the shelter's cluttered lounge like an army of two on detention parade. Nerina, Viltar's husband, gave Corylin a wary look. Oh, shit, Corylin said despondently. Nerina poked Viltar in the chest. Well, that lets you off. The two men relaxed, grinning sheepishly. Aaron sensed the tension drain away. 
Suddenly everyone was smiling and happy to see them. I thought there were five in your team, Aaron said. Earl is down in the dig, Erisilla said. The sensor bots picked up a promising signal last night. He said that was more important than, well, the way she left it hanging told them she was on Earl's side. I'd like to see him, please, Corrie Lynn said. Why not, Erisilla said. You've come this far. It was another trip outside. The entrance to the dig was on the other side of the shelters, a simple metal cube housing a small fusion generator and several power cells. An angled force field protected it from Hanko's venomous elements. There was a decontamination airlock to keep the radioactive air out so that the team's equipment could work without suffering contamination and degradation. Big filter units filled the rest of the entrance cube, maintaining the clean atmosphere. The temperature inside was still cold enough to keep the permafrost frozen. Aaron and Corilin kept their helmets on. Excavation bots had dug a passage down at 45 degrees, hacking crude steps into the rocky ground. Thick blue air hoses were strung along the roof, clustered around a half-metre extraction tube that buzzed as it propelled grains of frozen mud along to be dumped on a pile half a kilometre away. Polyphoto strips hanging off the cables cast a slightly greenish glow. Aaron trod carefully as they went down. The solid ground around him blocked any detailed field scan. The bottom of the crude stairs must have been seven metres below ground level. Erisilla explained that they'd cut into a lake bed that had filled with sediment during the post-attack monsoons. There were several people from the surrounding area who had never made it to Anagaska. The passage opened out into a chamber ten metres wide and three high, supported by force fields. Discarded arm-length bots were strewn over the floor with power cables snaking around them. A couple of hologram projectors filled it with a pervasive, sparky monochrome light. Ice crystals glinted in the sediment contained behind the force field. There was an opening on the far side. Aaron's field scan showed him another cavern with a great deal of electronic activity inside. Someone was in there. Someone who could shield his body from the scan. Holy Aussie, Aaron breathed. Corilin gave him a curious look and strode into the second chamber. It was larger than the first. A third of its wall surface was covered with excavator bots that looked like a mass of giant maggots slowly wriggling their way forward into the gelid sediment. A huge lacework of tiny pipes emerging from their tails led back to the start of the extraction tube. Silver sensor disks floated through the air, bobbing about to take readings. Silhouetted by the retinue of cybernetic activity was a lone figure wearing a dark green surface suit. Corilin took a couple of hesitant steps forward. The man turned, lifting off his bubble helmet. His face had a Latin shading rather than Inigo's northern European pallor, and the hair was dark brown rather than ginger. But apart from that, the features had not been altered much. Aaron thought it a particularly inferior disguise, as if he were wearing makeup and a bad wig. Inigo, Corilin whispered. Of all the restoration projects on all the dead worlds in the galaxy, you had to walk into mine. Corilin sank to her knees, sobbing helplessly. Hey, girl, Inigo said sympathetically. He knelt down beside her and flipped the outer seals on her helmet. Where have you been, you bastard? She screamed. Her fist smacked into his chest. Why did you leave me? Why did you leave us? He wiped some of the tears from her cheeks then leaned forward and kissed her. Corilin almost fought against it. Then she suddenly was wrapping her arms around him, kissing furiously. The fabric of their suits made scratching noises as they rubbed together. Aaron waited a diplomatic minute, then unsealed his own helmet. The air was bitingly cold and held the strangest smell of rancid mint. His breath emerged in grey streamers. You're a hard man to find. Inigo and Corilin broke apart. Don't listen to him, Corilin said urgently. Whatever he wants, refuse. He's insane. He's killed hundreds of people to find you. Slight exaggeration, Aaron said. No more than twenty, surely. Inigo's steel grey eyes narrowed. I can sense what you are. Who do you represent? Ah, Aaron gave a weak smile. I'm not sure. But we're about to find out. 
He could feel the knowledge stirring in his mind again. He was about to know what to do next. I won't go back, Inigo said simply. What happened? Corilin pleaded. Aaron's U Shadow reported that a call was coming in from Director Ansan Purila. It had been transferred across the hundreds of desolate kilometers from Kajani by the small sturdy beacons to enter the camp, where it finally had trickled down into the excavation through a single strand of fiber optic cable. Yes, Director, Aaron said. Inigo and Corilin gave each other a puzzled glance, then looked at Aaron. Do you have some colleagues following you? Anson Purila asked. No. Well, there's a ship coming through the atmosphere above us, and it won't respond to any of our signals. Aaron felt his blood chill. His combat routines came online, as he instinctively shielded himself with the strongest force field his bionics could produce. Get out. What? Get out of the base. Everyone out. Now! I think you'd better explain exactly what is going on. Shit! His U-Shadow used the tenuous link to the base to establish a tiny channel to the artful Dodger smart core. Tell them, he yelled at Corrie Lynn. She flinched. Director, please leave. We haven't been honest with you. She turned to Winnego. Please, she hissed. He gave a reluctant sigh. Anson, this is Earl. Do as Aaron says. Get as many as you can into the starship. Everyone else will have to use the ground cruisers. But the artful Dodger smart core scanned the sky above Kajani. Its sweep was hampered considerably by the protective force field over the base, but it showed air on a small mass thirty kilometers high, holding its position above the thick outer cloud blanket. Come and get us, he told the smart core, fast. His exovision showed him the starship powering up. Flight systems took barely a second to come online. Its force field hardened. Directly overhead, an enormously powerful gamma-ray laser struck the base's force field. A scarlet corona flared around the puncture point, and the beam sliced into the generator building. Complete force field failure was an emergency situation that had been incorporated into the base's design. Secondary force fields snapped on over the cottages and science blocks, almost in time to protect them from the first awesome pressure surge. Several sheets of ice crystals hammered against the walls, drilling holes in the grass. Staff members who were caught outside screamed and flung themselves down as the impacts battered them. It was over in seconds as the re-trapped air stilled. When they looked up, they could see the parkland being scoured of grass and bushes by the victorious wind. Their starship had been cut into by the gamma laser strike. Uneven sections lay twisted on the pad, as the cold storm buffeted it about. Beside it, the artful Dodger rose into the maelstrom of radioactive destruction that cascaded across the base the instant the main force field vanished. Sensors showed it a pinprick of dazzling white light searing its way downward, accelerating at 50 Gs. The ship's smart core blasted away at the weapon with neutron lasers and quantum distortion pulses. Nothing happened. The smart core started to change course, but it wasn't fast enough. The light point struck the artful Dodger amidships, unaffected by the force field. Enormous tidal forces tore at the ship's structure, destroying its integrity. Even spars reinforced by bonding fields were ripped out of alignment. Ordinary components were mangled beyond recognition. The entire hull buckled and imploded to a third of its original size. Then the hawking M-Sync punched through the other side of the ship and streaked onward into the ground. Its intense spark of light vanished. The surrounding ground heaved as if Kajani had been hit by a massive earthquake, annihilating the remaining buildings and structures. All the secondary force fields died, leaving the collapsing cottages and science blocks exposed to the planet's malignant atmosphere. The wreckage of the artful Dodger tumbled out of the hurricane to smash into the ruins of the base. Aaron's contact with the starship was lost as soon as the Hawking M-Sync had penetrated the hull, when every microcircuit and cube was physically distorted and ruptured. A couple of Kajani sensors had caught the last moments of the star that had bolted out of the churning, naked sky. Its speed was such that human eyes registered it as a single line of light, like a perfectly straight lightning bolt. Radiation monitor records showed a swift peak that went off the scale. What the hell just happened? Corilin demanded. 
Aaron was too stunned to reply immediately. His U shadow confirmed that the beacon relay now ended two kilometers short of the base's perimeter. They fired on the base. Inigo said quietly, Lady, they were completely unarmed. He glared at Aaron. Was that one of the factions? Could be. It might even have been the cleric conservator making sure of his tenure. There's a place in the depths of Honius reserved for your kind. I hope you reach it quickly. Where? Aaron said. Inigo and Corilin gave him an identical snort of disgust. We'd better get back up to the shelter, Inigo said. I expect they'll want to get to Kajani right away. We are one of the closest camps. This is the end of the CD. The program continues on the next CD. As soon as they came through the cramped suit room, Aracilla pointed an accusing finger at Aaron. That was you! She yelled in fury. You're responsible. You told them to get clear. You knew who that was. You brought them here. I didn't bring them here. Those people were going to catch up with us eventually. The location was unfortunate. Unfucking fortunate Villatar spit. There were nearly 200 people there. We don't know how many of them are still alive, but even if some of them survive the attack, they'll be dying from the radiation. My friends. Slaughtered. They'll be relifed, Aaron said impassively. You bastard, Saitas stepped forward, his fist raised. Enough, Inigo said. This won't help. Saitas paused for a moment, then turned away, his face contorted with disgust and anger. You knew, Earl, Narina said. You warned Anson as well. What the hell is going on? Do you know these people? I'm the one they're looking for. I didn't know about the attack. The rest of the team started at one another in mute bewilderment. We're going to Kajani, Aracilla said. We can help recover the bodies before the winds blow them too far. How long before your organization sends another ship? Aaron asked. Like you care. How long, please? Too long, Nerina said. Hanko isn't part of the Unisphere. We can't just yell for help. Our only link to the Commonwealth was the hyperspace link in the starship, which was connected to our headquarters back on Anagaska. Without that, we're completely cut off. Anagaska will assume there was some kind of equipment failure. Then, after we haven't repaired it in a week, they'll probably investigate. If I remember right, we're due a scheduled flight in two weeks anyway. They'll probably wait until then. Budget considerations. She snapped it out with contempt. By which time, radiation poisoning will have killed everyone exposed to the atmosphere, Villatar said. We don't have enough medical facilities to help them all. Congratulations. He stared challengingly at Aaron. We need to get moving, Aracilla said. The medical systems on our ground crawlers can help a couple of them, maybe more. She pushed her way past Aaron, not looking at him. Cytus managed to knock Aaron's elbow as he went into the suit room. You coming, Earl? Nerina asked. Yeah. You've done enough already, Bilitar said. Whoever the fuck you really are, I thought. He snarled incoherently and hurried into the suit room. We'll come with you, Corilin said. We can help. The Asiatic glacier is half a day from here, Nerina said. The far end has mile-high cliffs. Why don't you help by driving off them? She went into the suit room and closed the door. Then there were three, Aaron said. We'd better get going, Inigo said. He faced Aaron. You know they'll probably close the restoration project down because of this. Do you think the next galaxy along will mount a restoration project? for all the species which the void devourment phase exterminates. For a moment, Aaron thought Inigo might activate his bionics in an aggressor mode. You know nothing, the lost messiah whispered. I hope something, though. What? That you have a starship stashed away, preferably close by. I don't. Really? I find that mighty curious. You took all this trouble to stay lost, yet you have no escape route if someone came along to expose you. Obviously not. Otherwise I wouldn't have been here waiting for you. You wouldn't have been waiting around here if it had just been me, Aaron said. He gestured at Cory Lynn. But her? That's different. Seventy years is a long time to be alone. She stayed in love for that long. Did you? Cory Lynn moved close to Winnego. Did you? She asked in a quiet voice. A mournful smile flickered over his lips. I'm glad it was you. 
Is that enough? Yeah. She rested her head on his shoulder. No ship, Inigo told Aaron, and the only way I go anywhere with you is in a bag as small lumps of charcoal. That's a shame, because I know what weapon they used to take out my starship and the base. Is that supposed to impress me? I expect you know a great deal about weapons and violence. Men like you always do. It was a hawking M-sink, Aaron said. Do you know what that is? No. They're new and highly dangerous. Even A&A gets nervous around them. Basically, it's a very small black hole, but cranked up with an outsize event horizon to help absorption. It starts off as a little core of neutronium about the size of an atomic nucleus. Corrie Lynn caught the emphasis. Starts off? Yes. Its gravity field is strong enough to pull in any atoms it comes into contact with. They're then also compressed into neutronium and merge with its core. With each atom it gets a little bit bigger. Not by much, admittedly. Not to begin with. But the larger the surface area, the more matter it can absorb. And after it tore through the artful dodger, it hit the planet. Right now it is sinking through the mantle, eating every atom it encounters. It'll stop at the centre of the planet. Then to have huge breasts. More than one. She slapped at him, feigning shocked dismay. You're appalling. I'm not doing anything like that. That's not what you usually say in bed. Araminta laughed. She really had missed this. I made the right decision. Araminta lay on the big bed, listening to three of him's sleeping. Two on the bed with her and one on the couch, curled up in a quilt, all breathing softly, not quite in sync. This time she had refused any aerosols, wanting to try out Lycan's program to make sure it worked with other people, that he hadn't loaded in a hidden expiry key. It worked. And how? Mr. Bovey had been surprised, and then very appreciative, at how much more responsive her body had become. As she had suspected, a night in bed with hymns had been a lot better than it had been with Lycan and the harem. Always nice to have confirmation. Now she could not sleep. Not that she wasn't tired, she grinned to herself, but she couldn't stop thinking about the engagement and embracing a multiple lifestyle. It was such an upheaval. Everything was going to change for her, so much so that she was more than a little apprehensive. Her mind was churning over the same questions again and again, unable to find answers because she didn't actually know about being multiple. The only way to find out was to become one. She turned her head to look at the young red-haired him who was nestled cosily beside her. He'd help her through the transition, she knew. Mr. Bovey loved her. That was enough to take her through the next few months. They hadn't set a date. He had said he would like at least two hers to register the marriage with him, which was fair enough. She really needed to finish the apartments. This day's events had made that even more urgent. Araminta settled back onto the soft mattress and closed her eyes. She used the program to still her whirling thoughts, emptying her mind. Her body started to calm as she found and slowed its natural rhythms, cycling down. Instead of sleep, the emptiness opening within made her aware of the images that lurked just below conscious thought. There was not just one, but a whole range, all tasting and feeling very different. They twisted out of the infinite distance, a connection she now finally understood belonged to her. Instinctively, she knew how to focus on whichever images she wanted. Some were Mr. Bovey's dreams. She was familiar enough with him to recognize his mental scent. She sighed fondly as she experienced his presence. Part of his mind was so wound up, the poor man. She also felt his happiness. Her own face slithered in and out of his thoughts. One of the connections was completely alien, yet comfortably warm in the way a parent was with a child. Her lips lifted in a serene smile. The sylphan mother home. So Cressida had been telling the truth, in which case that oh-so-busy chorus of multicoloured shadows must be the Gaia field. Araminta embraced the quiet one, the most tenuous connection of all, and found herself gliding through space, far from any star. The void's nebulae, glimmered lush and glorious behind her as she rose to the darkness of the outer regions. Hello, she said. And the station staff are living dream followers, the director said. 
I reviewed personnel files before I came. As long as you know. Is it a problem? Hopefully not. But as you implied, it's a volatile situation right now. Don't worry. I can do diplomatic when I have to. Her suite was equal to any luxury hotel she had stayed in. The only thing missing was human staff, but the number of modern bots more than made up for it. The Navy clearly had spared no effort in making the station as cosy as possible for the scientists. The main room even had a long window looking out over the alien sections of the station. Justine stared at them for a while, then opaqued the glass. Her U-shadow established itself in the room's net. No visitors or calls, she told it. Justine settled back onto the bed and opened her mind to the local Gaia field. The darkened room filled with phantoms, with their colours glinting amid the deeper shadows. Voices whispered. There was laughter. She felt drawn to various emotional states that promised to immerse her in their enticing, soulful sensations. Resisting temptation, she focused her attention on the source of the whimsy, the confluence nest itself, a quasi-biological neural module that simultaneously stored and emitted every thought released into its field. It had memories like a human brain, only with a much, much larger capacity. Justine formed her own images, offering them up to the nest. It responded with association. Naturally, it contained every one of Inigo's dreams. Living Dream had made sure of that. She ignored the vivid spectacle of the water walker's life, brushing those memories aside as she refined her own fancy for a different recollection of life inside the void. The nest was full of enigmas, the mental poetry left behind by observers, baffled by the terrible dark heart of the galaxy. There were compositions of how a life might be lived for anyone fortunate to pass inside, wish fulfilment, easy to differentiate from the real thing. They were the promise prayers that Living Dreams followers made every night to their mystic goal. All were imprinted on the nest, but nothing else. No other glimpse into another life lived on Quarencia. No grand mellow thoughts originating from a sky lord. The garden dome at the middle of the human section boasted trees over 250 years old. Oaks with thick trunks sent out thick crinkled boughs, acting as lush canopies above the tables where the station staff was gathering. Up on a rustic treehouse platform, an enthusiastic amateur band was playing songs from different eras, stretching back across several centuries, and was keen for requests. It was dusk inside, allowing the sharp violet light of the wall stars to dominate the sky overhead. Justine admired the broad patch of ice-searing scintillations, with the kind of wariness she reserved for dangerous animals, her arrival in the Garden Dome had created quite a ripple of interest. She liked to think that was due at least partly to the little black cocktail dress she had chosen. It certainly seemed to have the required effect on Director Trachtenberg, who was becoming quite flirtatious as he fussed around, offering her various drinks and selections of the finger food. Everyone she was introduced to was keen to know exactly what ANA's interest was in them at this time. She repeated the official line a dozen times, she was visiting just to ascertain the current status of the observation. Unchanged, complained Grafal Ehaz, the observation department chief. We don't learn anything these days apart from ion storm patterns in the gulf on the other side of the wall stars. That tells us nothing about the nature of the beast. We should be trying to send probes inside. I thought nothing could get through the barrier, she said. Which is why we need a much more detailed study. You can't do that with remote probes, fifty light-years away. The Rael don't like us getting closer, Trachtenberg said. When you get home, you might ask ANA why we still need their permission just to fart around here, Ehas said. It's fucking insulting. I'll remember, Justine said. The party was only twenty minutes old. She wondered how many aerosols Ehas had inhaled. The director took her by the arm and politely guided her away. Sorry about that, he said. There's not a lot of opportunity to blow off steam around here. I run a pretty tight schedule. This is an expensive installation and phenomenally important. We need to extract the best information we can with what we've got. I understand. It's Ahaz's third stint out here. He tends to get frustrated by the lack of progress. I've seen it before. First time you're all swept along by the wonder of it all. Then, when that fades away, you begin to realize how passive the observation actually is. 
How many times have you been here? He grinned. This is my seventh. But then I'm a lot older and wiser than Ehas. So would you like to join the pilgrimage? Not really. As far as three hundred years of direct observation has shown us, you touch the barrier, you die. Actually, you die a long time before you reach the barrier. I just don't see how they hope to get through. Somebody did, once. Yeah, that's the really annoying part. So what do... Justine stopped as the ground heaved, almost knocking her feet out from under her. She tensed, dropping to a crouch like just about everyone else. Her integral force field came on. The local net was shrieking out all sorts of alarms. The huge oak boughs creaked dangerously, their leaves rustling as if tickled by a gust of wind. Oh, shit! Trachtenberg yelped. Justine's yew shadow established a link to the Silverbird smart core. Stand by, she told it. Keep a fix on my position. When she scanned the dome, it was still intact. Then she looked at the horizon, which appeared to be perfectly level. She had been expecting big cracks to be splitting the lava plain open at the very least. The ground tilted again. Nothing moved. What is happening? she demanded aloud. Some kind of quake? But this planet was a dead husk, completely inactive in any respect. I'm not sure. The director waved an annoyed hand to shush her. The members of the band were clambering down out of the treehouse as fast as they could go, jumping the last meter off the wooden steps. They had abandoned their instruments. Justine stared at the drink in her hand as the ground shifted again. The wine sloshed from one side of the glass to the other, yet she was holding it perfectly still. Holy Aussie, Trachtenberg exclaimed. It's gravity. What? Gravity waves. Fucking colossal ones. Ehas hurried over to them, swaying badly as the ground seemed to tilt again. Are you at the apex of the central segment? A fuzzy copper star shone brightly, its light shimmering off a slowly rotating accretion disk. Moon-sized fireball comets circled the outer band in high-inclination orbits. None of Macathran's enthusiastic astronomers had ever spied its location in the void. The cleric council waited for him in their scarlet and black robes, standing silently at the long table that ran across the middle of the chamber. Phelim stayed by Ethan's side until they reached the dais and then Ethan insisted on walking to his gold-embossed throne by himself. He eased himself onto the thin cushions with a grimace. The pain in his head nearly made him cry out as he sank down. He took a moment to recover as his body shuddered. Ever since he had regained consciousness, any sudden movement was agony. The councillors sat, trying to avert their eyes from the liver-like semi-organic nodules affixed to his skull which were only half hidden by his white robe's voluminous hood. Thank you for attending, Ethan said to them. We are relieved to see you recovered, cleric conservator, Rincenzo said formally. Ethan knew the contempt of the other councillors toward his supporter without needing the Gaia field. He felt it himself. Not quite recovered yet, he said, and tapped one of the glistening nodules, but my neural structure should be fully re-established in another week. Until then, the auxiliaries will suffice. How could such a thing happen? Councillor de Louis asked. Gaia moats have been perfectly safe for centuries. It wasn't the Gaia moats, Philim said. The dream masters who set up the interception believed the second dreamer's panic triggered a neural spasm within the cleric conservator's brain. They were attuned to a degree rarely achieved outside a couple's most intimate dream sharing. The circumstances will not arise again. The Gaia field and the Unisphere are rife with rumours that the second dreamer is a genuine telepath, that he can kill with a single thought. Rubbish, Phelim said, his skeletal face turned to de Louis. For an instant a dangerous anger could be glimpsed in his mind. De Louis could not meet his stare. In any case, it is irrelevant, Ethan said. The dream masters assure me that such a backlash can be nullified now that they understand its nature. Any future contact with the second dreamer will be conducted with. Uh, he smiled grimly. A safety cutout, as they call it. You're going to talk to him again? Councillor Falvin asked. I believe the situation requires it, Ethan said. Don't you? Well, yes, but I received his latest dream along with the rest of you. It was strong, at least as clear as those of the dreamer Inigo himself. However, 
The crucial change within this dream was the conversation the second dreamer had with the Skylord. The communication had shocked Ethan more than the pristine clarity of the new dream had. I came to find you, the Skylord had replied to the second dreamer's greetings. We are far beyond the edge of your universe, yet I felt your longing. You wish to join with us? Not I, but others do, yes. All are welcome. We can't get in. It's very dangerous. I can greet you. I can guide you. It's my purpose. No. And with that finality, the dream had ended. Before it had faded completely, there was a hint of agitation from the Sky Lord's mind. It clearly had not expected rejection. And it's hardly alone in that. The Sky Lord believes it can bring us to Quarencia, Ethan said. That is the final testimony we have been waiting and praying for. Our pilgrimage will be blessed with success. Not without the second dreamer, Councillor Tosine said. Your pardon, Conservator, but he is not willing to lead us into the void. Without him there can be no pilgrimage. He is distressed, Ethan replied. Until now he didn't even know he was the second dreamer. To discover you are the hope of billions is not an easy thing. Ultimately, Inigo himself found it too great to bear. So we can forgive the second dreamer his frailty and offer support and guidance. He might realize who and what he is now, Councillor Tosain said, but we don't even know where he is. Actually, we do, Phelim announced, Colwyn City on Viosha. Excellent news, Ethan said in a predatory fashion. He watched in amusement as the protests in Tosain's mind withered away. We should welcome him and thank Viosha for the gift it has brought us. His gaze turned expectantly on Rincenzo. I would like to propose bringing Viosha fully into the free trade zone, Rincenzo said, and promote it to core planet status. Seconded, Falvin said. The rest of the cleric council responded with bemusement. You can't do that, Tosine said. They'll resist. The Commonwealth Senate will move to censure us. We'll lose every diplomatic advantage we have. He glanced around the table, seeking support. It's not just our ambition, Phelim said. He gestured at the empty end of the table opposite Ethan's dais. His yew shadow established the ultra-secure link, and a portal projected an image of Lycan standing just beyond the table. Lycan bowed politely. Conservator, I am honoured. Thank you, Ethan said. I believe you are acting as an unofficial emissary for your government. Yes, sir. I have just finished talking with our Prime Minister. It is her wish to accept Elezalin's generous offer to elevate us to core world status within the free trade zone. That's wonderful news. I will inform Elezalin's cabinet of your decision. The acceptance comes with the understanding that a zero-tariff regime will be part of the accord, Lycan said. Of course. Full trade will commence as soon as the second dreamer joins us here in Makathran too. Understood. The Prime Minister will award the treaty her certificate of office as soon as it is sent. Lycan's image vanished. I believe, Ethan said into the startled silence, that we were about to take a vote. Those in favour. He watched the hands being raised. It was unanimous. In moments such as this he almost missed Corilin's presence on the council. She never would have let such a Soviet-style outcome go unchallenged. Thank you. I find your support of my policies to be humbling. There is no further business. Phelim remained seated as the others filed out. Flecks of light slid across his expressionless face as the comets orbited ceaselessly overhead. That was easy, Ethan remarked. They don't know what to do, Phelim said. They're just the same as the devout gathering outside, bewildered and hurt that the second dreamer would reject the Sky Lord. By every Makathran household had gone, replaced by a simple hollow pedestal that the room had grown for him. It was so much easier to sit on. Various other little modifications had turned the maisonette into quite a cosy home. The standard too-high cube-shaped bed was now a lot lower, its spongy upper surface softer and more accommodating. Alcoves had shelves in them. One deep nook in the kitchen area was permanently chilly, allowing him to keep food fresh for days, just like the larger city palaces did, that was the greatest blessing of being in the constable's tenement rather than the station dormitory. Eddyard finally could choose what he ate again. 
Half of his first month's pay had gone on a new iron stove. He had installed it himself, adapting the hole the previous tenant had hacked into the wall for the flue. It had pride of place in the kitchen, along with a growing collection of pans. There was even a small basin that could be used for washing up, rather than dumping everything into the bath pool, as most people did. He liked that innovation enough to consider sculpting another one in the bathroom, just for his hands and face, although that really would let everyone know he had the ability to rearrange the city's fabric, sculpting it as easily as he once had made Genistar eggs. Everyone who visited the Maisonette. So, no one, then. Maxin had brought a girl back from the theatre the previous night, one of the dancers. She was as pretty as any of the grand family girls, but with an incredibly strong, supple body. He knew that because of the revealing clothes she wore when she danced on stage. Ediard gritted his teeth and tried not to be jealous. He and Boyd had struck out again, though overall it had been a pleasant evening. Ediard enjoyed going to the theatre a lot more than sitting in taverns getting drunk. There were often several musicians up on the stage, always guild apprentices, young and with passion, just listening to some of their songs, so full of contempt for the city authorities, made him feel wickedly disloyal to the Grand Council. But he knew the words to many of the popular ones, of which several were Dybol's compositions. It was loud in the theatres, some of which were no more than underground storerooms. He had been startled the first time he heard drums being played. It was as if the musicians somehow had tamed thunder. One day they would go and see Dybol playing, so Maxen promised. Ediard hoped it would be soon. The bubble started to disappear from the pool as the water cycled through the narrow slits around the bottom. Ediard groaned and climbed out. A G-chimp had a robe waiting for him. He pulled it on as he walked through into the kitchen area and then sat at the small table. It was right next to a sink-foil window, giving him a view over the rooftops toward the centre of the city. A G-chimp placed a glass of apple and mango juice on the table along with a bowl of mixed oats, nuts, and dried fruit. The juice was nicely chilled. The G-chimps knew to leave it in the cold nook for an hour before serving it. He poured cold milk into the bowl and started to eat, looking out across the city as it came to life under the rising sun. It would have been a fine life indeed if he could just stop brooding about all the lawlessness haunting the streets and canals he could see. The squad had finally managed to get some convictions in the courts over the last few weeks, but nothing important. Some shop thieves in their early teens. A mugger who was drunk most of the time. One time the Guild of Clerks sent them out to arrest a landlord for defaulting on taxes. They had no impact whatsoever on the gangs that were at the heart of Macathran's problems. You ready? Cansin long talked as Ediard buttoned up his tunic. He pulled his boots on. They were new, costing over three days' pay, but well worth it. Coming. She was waiting on the walkway outside, an oilskin cloak slung over her arm. Going to rain today, she announced. He eyed the wide, clear sky. If you say so. She grinned as they started down the awkward stairs. Every morning he was so tempted to sculpt them into something less dangerous, writing the miracle off to the lady. This'll be your first winter in the city, won't it? she asked. Yes. Ediard couldn't quite imagine Macathran being cold and ice-bound. The long summer had been gloriously hot. He had become what he considered to be a good football player, with his team finishing third in Jeevens's Little Park League. Most taverns had seats and tables outside, where many pleasant evenings had been spent. There had even been a few days when he had started sketching again, not that he showed anyone the results. After saving up some coinage, he and Salrana finally had taken a gondola ride around the city. It'll be fun, Cansin said. There's loads of parties leading up to the new year. Then the mayor throws a huge free ox roast in Golden Park for lunch on the New Year's Day, except everyone is normally so hungover that they're late, and the parks and plazas all look so clean and fresh when they're covered in snow. Sounds good. You'll need a thick coat and a hat. On our pay... I know some shops that sell quality clothes for reasonable prices. Thanks. And don't forget to get in an early supply of coal for your stove. The buildings are never quite warm enough in midwinter, and the price always goes through the roof after the first snowfall. The lady will damn those merchants. It's criminal what they get away with charging. You're happy this morning. 
My sister's having her boy's naming ceremony this Saturday. She's asked me to be a nominee for the lady. Nice. What's she going to call him? Dayum, after the third mayor. Ah, right. And you haven't got a clue who that is, do you? He grinned broadly. Nope. She laughed. That was the way it was between them these days. Best friends. Any discomfiture left over from that night after graduation had long faded, which he was sort of pleased about. He did not want them to be awkward around each other, but still he couldn't quite forget that kiss, or the way both of them had felt. He'd never had the courage to bring up what they'd said. Neither had she. That had left him wrestling with his thoughts about Salrana, who was always so sunny and generally lovely. It was now incredibly hard to ignore how feminine she had become, and he suspected that she knew that. Of late, her teasing had taken on quite an edge. The rest of the squad was waiting in the main hall at the Jeevan's constable station, sitting around a table and finishing breakfast. Unlike Ediard, few of them cooked for themselves. Maxon had on a pair of glasses with very dark lenses, not too dissimilar to those Dybal wore. Cancine took one look at him and burst out laughing. Were you boys out in the theatres again last night? Maxon grunted and scowled at Isowix. Boyd had returned home for the day and was helping out in the bakery, dressing for the part in a white apron and a green cap. Ediard was uncertain if he should use the G-Eagle. In the end he settled for having it perch in a deep guttering furrow on the bakery's tower, almost invisible from ground level. It scared the Rugals away, but no one else noticed it. At least we won't have to escort them far to the courts of injustice, Maxon pointed out as they started their vigil. Ediard actually could see one of the conical towers of Parliament House through the living room's balcony window. They waited for two hours. Among them they raised the alarm five times, only to be proved wrong on each occasion. So many citizens look so disreputable, Cancine declared after a couple of adolescents ran down the street after their third hands had snatched oranges from a grocery shop display, and acted. We're all paranoid today, that's all, Max and Long talked back. We see the bad in everyone. Is that a song title? Dinley asked. Ediard smiled at the banter. There was a lot to be said for being squad leader. He was sitting in a comfortable armchair, drinking tea that the wife of the shop owner kept bringing up for him, she brought a nice plate of biscuits each time, too. His good humour faded as the young hooligans turned a corner out of sight. Foreboding rose into his mind, strong enough to make his skin tingle. He knew that awful sensation from before. Oh, shit, he whimpered. Ediard? Cancine queried. It's happening. What is? Maxon said. They're here. It's about to start. Where are they? Boyd asked. Which ones? I don't know, Edyard said. Look, just trust me. Please be careful. I know we have to be. He could sense the uncertainty in their minds. They were not used to hearing him say such things. It was difficult to get to his feet. His body was reacting so badly. When he did press up against the balcony window, he found it hard to concentrate on the street below. I think I see them, Boyd said. Two youngish men were walking up the steps into the shop while a third stood outside. Through Boyd's eyes, Ediard and the rest of the squad watched them swagger into the shop. Isowix straightened up behind the counter. I told you before, he said, I don't have that kind of money. Yes, you do, the first man said. His gaze kept darting nervously to Boyd, who was standing at the other end of the counter from Isowix. Wrong, Ediard knew. Why would a gang member be worried about a shop assistant? Boyd. He knows what you are, Ediard sent in the most direct long talk he could manage, praying the gang members would not pick it out of the general background of Macathran's telepathic babble. Huh? Boyd grunted. The gang member glanced at him again, then turned back to Isowix. Give me twenty pounds or we'll torch this place, he said loudly. No, Ediard said. The hairs on his neck were standing proud. No, no, no. Wrong. You... Boyd said. He pulled his apron aside to reveal a constable's badge pinned on his waistcoat. The two gang members turned to face him. I am a city constable, and I am placing you under arrest for threatening behaviour with intent to extort. 
How do you like that, you bastards? A gloating Isowick shouted. Everyone close in, Ediard ordered. He pushed through the narrow door onto the balcony. The gang members left on the street glanced up and smiled. Oh, shit, Ediard growled. It's him, the gang member declared in powerful long talk. Then he started running. Inside the bakery, the first gang member pulled out a small knife. He flung it at Boyd, who swayed backward. His third hand just managed to push the blade aside. Isowick snatched a much larger knife and threw it at the gang members as they fled through the doorway. It whirled into the street, narrowly missing a woman who was walking by. She screamed. Ediard vaulted over the balcony rail and dropped to the street below. He landed badly, rolling as his ankle gave way. His shoulders smacked into one of the steps leading up to the clothing shop's door. He yelled at the bright pulse of pain, tears squeezing out of his eyes. His farsight caught Boyd, leaping over the bakery counter. Cancine was sprinting up Macoon Street, her cloak abandoned on the ground by the stalls. Maxin and Dinley were moving out of their shop, confident and eager. Their shields combined as they stood in the middle of the street, blocking the way. All three gang members were racing toward them. Let them go, Ediard ordered. Maxon's face registered bewilderment that came close to anger. What? Ediard had regained his feet and started to totter down the street. Leave them. You can't be serious. The three gang members were barely twenty yards from Maxon and Dinley. It's a setup. They knew we were here. Crap, Dinley sent. I can scan them completely. They've got a couple of small blades between them. That's all. There will be more, somewhere, waiting for us. Please, just let them go. I'll track them with the G-Eagle. Maxon hesitated. He took a step toward the side of the street. No! Dinley hissed fiercely. He opened his arms wide as the three gang members charged toward them. Dinley, stop it! Ediard yelled. He was running now, ignoring the pain in his ankle. Cancine was not far behind, charging like a warhorse, her teeth gritting in determination. Boyd came skidding down the steps from the bakery and took off after them. Stop! Dinley proclaimed loudly, holding out a hand as if that alone would bring the whole city to a halt. You are under arrest! Oh, crap! Maxon growled under his breath and instinctively started to move back toward Dinley. They came together as the three gang members ran into them. Fists were swung, legs kicked out. Third hand scrabbled and pushed. Maxon went down with one of the gang members sprawling on top of him, his head cracked against the pavement. Dinley was shoved hard against the wall of the hat shop, flailing wildly to regain his balance. Then the gang member on top of Maxon scrabbled to his feet and fled with his companions. Dinley started to chase after them. Come back! Ediard howled in frustration. He reached Maxon, who was struggling to get upright, hand clamped on the back of his head. A trickle of blood was running down his fingers. What do we do? Maxon demanded, wincing from the pain. Ediard's farsight could follow Dinley easily enough as he ran toward the northern end of Macoon Street. The three gang members were ten yards ahead of him. Save him, he growled, furious with Dinley. He sent a single clear thought to his G-Eagle, who immediately took flight. Cancine was slowing as she approached Ediard and Maxon, her face red. Boyd was charging behind her. Come on! Ediard said, and took off again. Cancine flashed a look of exasperation and hurried along. You okay? Boyd shouted as he ran past Maxen. Yeah. Maxen took a breath and started running. The G Eagle streaked along Macoon Street, swiftly overtaking Ediard and Cancine. It shot forward, rising high above the roofs, looking down to see Dinley racing on, his glasses askew. The three gang members almost had reached the end of the street which came out just below Birmingham Pool, where a silver-blue bridge connected Jeevens with the lower point of Golden Park. As always, Birmingham Pool was thick with gondolas. A half-dozen moorings lined the edge beside the junction with the Outer Circle Canal, all hosting several waiting gondolas. The G-Eagle dipped down to the moorings, as Ediard tried to work out which of the glossy black craft belonged to the gang. If this was a trap, they would have their escape well planned. Just before it happened, the G-Eagle was aware of two other birds, close and closing. It pivoted on a wing, looking up in time to see its attacker plummeting toward it. Another G-Eagle, bigger, with talons clad in sharpened iron spikes. 
The impact punched it savagely. Gold and emerald feathers burst out of the collision point. Spikes sank into its front shoulder, slicing through skin and muscle, severing veins. Then the bigger G-Eagle twisted to try to snap the central wing bone. Ediard's G-Eagle fought back, writhing to clamp its jaws on its attacker's rear wing. The two of them tumbled, falling fast. Then the second attacker hit, iron blade talons ripping into flesh. Ediard and his G-Eagle screamed as one as its wing broke. Ediard saw talons rake toward his face and ducked. His G-Eagle's mind abruptly vanished from perception. All that was left was a falling mass. The other two G-Eagles hurtled away over Birmingham Pool. Ediard was sure he heard the splash as his bird's body hit the water. What happened? Cancine cried. Dear lady, they are waiting for us. Ediard pulled his perception down to find Dinley emerging from the end of Macoon Street. Stop, Dinley, for the lady's sake, I'm begging you. He pushed his tired legs harder, sprinting for the end of the street. Thirty yards. I see them, Dinley replied gleefully. He gifted the squad, who saw the three gang members clustered above one of the moorings. They grinned barbarously. For the first time, there was a pulse of uncertainty in Dinley's mind. He slowed to a halt, ten yards away on the edge of the pool. Still, the gang members did nothing but wait. Stop! Stay there, Dinley told them, taking big gulps of air after his helter-skelter dash and waving a finger like an ancient schoolmaster dealing with a naughty class. They laughed at him. Ediard burst out of Macoon Street. Directly to his left was the outer circle canal with the silver-blue bridge ahead, arching over the side of the pool directly into Golden Park. On his right, the buildings ended to provide a curving Alameda around the side of Birmingham Pool. Neat stacks of crates were piled above the various moorings, with shopkeepers and G-monkeys sorting out their goods with the gondoliers. Tall, weeping, hasfall gifting allowed Macathran's citizens to experience Edyard, shaping his third hand into a fist. He slammed it forward into Arminel's face. Bone went crunch as the man's nose broke. Blood spurted out. His feet left the bench as he was thrown backward. He landed with a mighty splash in the water which closed over him. You're all under arrest, Ediard announced. It was pandemonium on the side of Birmingham Pool as the gondola made its steady way to the mooring platform where Cancine, Boyd and Maxen waited. On the Jeevan side, they were crammed fifteen deep around the edge. Frenzied kids were running over the blue and silver bridge from Golden Park, hanging over the railings, cheering and waving. Over a hundred constables stood behind the mooring platform waiting. Half of them were Dinley's family. People still were pouring out of the surrounding districts into the Alameda to see history as it unfolded. Boulder lads were shinnying to the top of the Hasfold trees to get a better view. Edyard walked slowly behind the gondola, praying to the lady that he wouldn't screw up now, that his telekinetic strength would hold out and he would not fall ignominiously back into the water. Out there in the crowd surrounding the pool, he saw Cetasis and Cavine standing in front of a big contingent of silver and market stallholders, leading the applause. A huge array of well-groomed family girls greeted him with shrill, saucy laughter as they flashed their petticoats and bloomers. Isawix and his family were there. Evola, Nicolard and all the girls from the dressmakers were waving frantically and screaming to attract his attention. He even thought he saw Dybol and Bijuli laughing excitedly among the crowd, but by then he definitely was feeling tired. The gondola's prow touched the mooring platform. Constables steadied it. Captain Ronark quickly took charge. Che and several of the largest constables from Jeevan Station handcuffed Arminel and his accomplices. A path was cleared across the Alameda, and the prisoners were marched back to the station. Ediard finally stepped up onto the platform. His legs nearly gave out. He was trembling from exertion. Captain Ronark snapped to attention and saluted him. Cancine gave him a huge kiss to the delight of the crowd. You lady damned idiot, she whispered into his ear. I'm so proud of you. Maxen pounded his back. Boyd gave him a fierce hug. Dinley, Ediard said. The doctors have him, Maxen yelled above the thunderous sound of the crowd. He'll be okay. The bullet didn't hit anything vital. 
Not that he's got anything vital in that area. You scared the living crap out of us, Boyd said, wiping the tears from his eyes. What a stunt, you madman. Look around you, Edyard, Cancine said. Make sure you see it all. This will be the day you tell your great, great grandchildren about. Weave to them, you dick, Maxen ordered. He grabbed Edyard's hand and held it high, waving and shouting wordlessly. The cheer that erupted as Edyard grinned sheepishly up at the worshipful horde was scary in its power. The mental strength of so many people, united in veneration, was overwhelming, verging on a physical force. His grin broadened as Maxon swung him around, so that those on the other side of the Alameda could see him. If there was an election today, you'd be mayor, Boyd said. Listen to them, Maxon said. They love you. They want you. You! He laughed uproariously. Ediard stared over at the blue and silver bridge, convinced the kids hanging over the railing would fall. They were leaning out so far. They were chanting something. At each call, their fists punched the air in unison. What's that? Ediard asked. What are they saying? You! Kansin shouted back. They're calling for you! Then Ediard heard the cry in full and laughed. Water! Walker! The crowd chanted in adoration. Water! Walker! Water! Walker! Water! Walker! This concludes The Dreaming Void, Book One of the Void Trilogy. The story will continue in Book Two. Please visit our website, www tantor.com for more information on our growing library of unabridged audiobooks and to take advantage of special offers or call toll-free 877-7-TANTOR to request a catalogue.